preface of the tragic muse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the tragic muse by henry james preface i profess a certain vagueness of remembrance in respect to the origin and growth of the tragic muse which appeared in the atlantic monthly again beginning january eighteen eighty nine and running on inordinately several months beyond its proper twelfth if it be ever of interest and profit to put one's finger on the productive germ of a work of art and if in fact a lucid account of any such work involves that prime identification i can but look on the present fiction as a poor fatherless and motherless a sort of unregistered and unacknowledged birth i fail to recover my precious first moment of consciousness of the idea to which it was to give form to recognize in it as i like to do in general the effect of some particular sharp impression or concussion i call such remembered glimmers always precious because without them comes no clear vision of what one may have intended and without that vision no straight measure of what one may have succeeded in doing what i make out from further back is that i must have had from still further back must in fact practically have always had the happy thought of some dramatic picture of the artist's life and of the difficult terms on which it is at the best secured and enjoyed the general question of its having to be not altogether easily paid for to do something about art art that is as a human complication and a social stumbling block must have been for me early a good deal of a nursed intention the conflict between art and the world striking me thus betimes as one of the half dozen great primary motives i remember even having taken for granted with this fond inveteracy that no one of these pregnant themes was likely to prove under the test more full of matter this being the case meanwhile what would all experience have done but enrich one's conviction since if on the one hand i had gained a more and more intimate view of the nature of art and the conditions therewith imposed so the world was a conception that clearly required and that would for ever continue to take any amount of filling in the happy and fruitful truth at all events was that there was opposition why there should be was another matter and that the opposition would beget an infinity of situations what had doubtless occurred in fact moreover was that just this question of the essence and the reasons of the opposition had shown itself to demand the light of experience so that to the growth of experience truly the treatment of the subject had yielded it had waited for that advantage yet i continue to see experience given me its jog mainly in the form of an invitation from the gentle editor of the atlantic the late thomas bailey ulrich to contribute to his pages a serial that should run through the year that friendly appeal becomes thus the most definite statement i can make of the genesis of the book though from the moment of its reaching me everything else in the matter seems to live again what lives not least to be quite candid it's the fact that i was to see this production make a virtual end for the time as by its sinister effect though for reasons still obscure to me of the pleasant old custom of the running of the novel not for many years was i to feel the practice for my benefit confidingly revive the inference of the tragic muse was thus exactly other than what i had all earnestly 
if of course privately enough invoked for it and i remember well the particular chill at last of the sense of my having launched it in a great grey void from which no echo or message whatever would come back none in the event ever came and as i now read the book over i find the circumstances make in its name for special tenderness of charity even for that finer consideration hanging in the parental breast about the maimed or slighted the disfigured or defeated the unlucky or unlikely child with this hapless small mortal thought of further as somehow compromising i am thus able to take the thing as having quite wittingly and undisturbedly existed for itself alone and to liken it to some aromatic bag of gathered herbs of which the string has never been loosed or better still to some jar of potpourri shaped and overfigured and polished but of which the lid never lifted has provided for the intense accumulation of the fragrance within the consistent the sustained preserved tone of the tragic muse its constant and doubtless rather fine-drawn truth to its particular salt pitch and accent are critically speaking its principal merit the inner harmony that i perhaps presumptuously permit myself to compare to an unevaporated scent after which indeed i may well be summoned to say what i mean in such a business by an appreciable tone and how i can justify my claim to it a demonstration that will await us later suffice it just here that i find the latent historic clue in my hand again with the easy recall of my prompt grasp of such a chance to make a story about art there was my subject this time all mature with having long waited and with the blessed dignity that my original perception of its value was quite lost in the mist of youth i must long have carried in my head the notion of a young man who should amid difficulty the difficulties being the story have abandoned public life for the zealous pursuit of some supposedly minor craft just as evidently there had hovered before me some possible picture by all comic and ironic of one of the most salient london social passions the unappeasable curiosity for the things of the theatre for every one of them that is except the drama itself and for the personality of the performer almost any performer quite sufficiently serving in particular this latter verily had struck me as an aspect appealing mainly to satiric treatment the only adequate or effective treatment i had again and again felt for most of the distinctively social aspects of london the general artlessly histrionized air of things caused so many examples to spring from behind any hedge what came up however at once for my own stretched canvas was that it would have to be ample give me really space to turn round and that a single illustrative case might easily be meagre fare the young man who should chalk admired politics and of course some other admired object with them would be all very well but he wouldn't be enough therefore what should one say to some other young man who would chuck something and somebody else admired in their way too there need never at the worst be any difficulty about the things advantageously chuckable for art the question is all but of choosing them in the heap yet were i to represent a struggle an interesting one indispensably with the passions of the theatre as a profession or at least as an absorption i should have to place the theatre in another light than the satiric 
this however would by good luck be perfectly possible too without a sacrifice of truth and i should doubtless even be able to make my theatric case as important as i might desire it it seemed clear that i needed big cases small ones would practically give my central idea away and i make out now my still labouring under the illusion that the case of the sacrifice for art can ever be with truth with taste with discretion involved apparently and showily big i dare say it glimmered upon me even then that the very sharpest difficulty of the victim of the conflict i should seek to represent and the very highest interest of his predicament dwell deep in the fact that his repudiation of the great obvious great moral or functional or useful character shall just have to consent to resemble a surrender for absolutely nothing those characters are all large and expansive seeded and established and endowed whereas the most charming truth about the preference for art is that to parade abroad so thoroughly inward and so naturally embarrassed a matter is to falsify and vulgarize it that as a preference attended with the honours of publicity it is indeed nowhere that in fact under the rule of its sincerity its only honours are those of contradiction concentration and a seemingly deplorable indifference to everything but itself nothing can well figure as less big in an honest thesis than a marked instance of somebody's willingness to pass mainly for an ass of these things i must i say have been in strictness aware what i perhaps failed of was to note that if a certain romantic glamour even that of mere eccentricity or of a fine perversity may be flung over the act of exchange of a career for the aesthetic life in general the prose and the modesty of the matter yet come in with any exhibition of the particular branch of aesthetics selected then it is that the attitude of hero or heroine may look too much for the romantic effect like a low crouching over proved trifles art indeed has in our day taken on so many honours and emoluments that the recognition of its importance is more than a custom has become on occasion almost a fury the line is drawn especially in the english world only at the importance of heeding what it may mean the more i turn my pieces over at any rate the more i now see i must have found in them and i remember how once well in presence of my three typical examples my fear of too ample a canvas quite dropped the only question was that if i had marked my political case from so far back for a story by itself and then marked my theatrical case for another the joining together of these interests originally seen as separate might all disgracefully betray the seam show for mechanical and superficial a story was a story a picture a picture and i had a mortal horror of two stories two pictures in one the reason of this was the clearest my subject was immediately under that disadvantage so cheated of its indispensable centre as to become of no more use for expressing a main intention than a wheel without a hub is of use for moving a cart it was a fact apparently that one had on occasion seen two pictures in one were there not for instance certain sublime tintorettos at venice a majorless crucifixion in especial which showed without loss of authority half a dozen actions separately taking place yes that might be 
but there had surely been nevertheless a mighty pictorial fusion so that the virtue of composition had somehow thereby come all mysteriously to its own of course the affair would be simple enough if composition could be kept out of the question yet by what art or process what bars and bolts what unmuzzled dogs and pointed guns perform that feat i had to know myself utterly inapt for any such valour and recognised that to make it possible sundry things should have begun for me much further back than i had felt them even in their dawn a picture without composition slights its most precious chance for beauty and is moreover not composed at all unless the painter knows how that principle of health and safety working as an absolutely premeditated art has prevailed there may in its absence be life incontestably as the newcomes has life as les trois mousquetaires as tolstoy's peace and war have it but what do such large loose baggy monsters with their queer elements of the accidental and the arbitrary artistically mean we have heard it maintained we well remember that such things are superior to art but we understand least of all what that may mean and we look in vain for the artist the divine explanatory genius who will come to our aid and tell us there is life and life and as waste is only life sacrificed and thereby prevented from counting i delight in a deep breathing economy and an organic form my business was accordingly to go in for complete pictorial fusion some such common interest between my two first notions as would in spite of their birth under quite different stars do them no violence at all i recall with this confirmed infatuation of retrospect that through the mild perceptions i here glance at there struck for the tragic muse the first hour of a season of no small subjective felicity lighted mainly i seem to see by a wide west window that high aloft looked over near and far london sunsets a half grey half flushed expanse of london life the production of the thing which yet took a good many months lives for me again all contemporaneously in that full projection upon my very table of the good fog-filtered kensington mornings which had a way indeed of seeing the sunset in and which at the very last emerged to memory in a different and a sharper pressure that of an hotel bedroom in paris during the autumn of eighteen eighty nine with the exposition du centenaire about to end and my long story through the usual difficulties as well the usual difficulties and i fairly cherish the record as some adventurer in another line may hug the sense of his inveterate habit of just saving in time the neck he ever undiscouragedly risks were those bequeathed as a particular vice of the artistic spirit against which vigilance had been destined from the first to exert itself in vain and the effect of which was that again and again perversely incurably the centre of my structure would insist on placing itself not so to speak in the middle it mattered little that the reader with the idea or the suspicion of a structural centre is the rarest of friends and of critics a bird it would seem as merely fabled as the phoenix the terminational terror was none the less certain to break in and my work threatened to masquerade for me as an active figure condemned to the disgrace of legs too short 
ever so much too short for its body i urge myself to the candid confession that in very few of my productions to my eye has the organic centre succeeded in getting into proper position time after time then has the precious waistband or girdle studded and buckled and placed for brave outward show practically worked itself and in spite of desperate remonstrance or in other words essential counterplotting to a point perilously near the knees perilously i mean for the freedom of these parts in several of my compositions this displacement has so succeeded at the crisis in defying and resisting me has appeared so fraught with probable dishonour that i still turn upon them in spite of the greater or less success of final dissimulation a rueful and wandering eye these productions have in fact if i may be so bold about it specious and spurious centres altogether to make up for the failure of the two as to which in my list they are however that is another business not on any terms to be made known such at least would seem my resolution so far as i have thus proceeded of any attention ever arrested by the pages forming the object of this reference that rigour of discrimination has wholly and consistently failed i gather to constitute a part in which fact there is perhaps after all a rough justice since the infirmity i speak of for example has been always but the direct and immediate fruit of a positive access of foresight the overdone desire to provide for future need and lay up heavenly treasure against the demands of my climax if the art of the drama as a great french master of it has said is above all the art of preparations that is true only to a less extent of the art of the novel and true exactly in the degree in which the art of the particular novel comes near that of the drama the first half of a fiction insists ever on figuring to me as the stage or theatre for the second half and i have in general given so much space to making the theatre propitious that my halves have too often proved strangely unequal thereby has arisen with grim regularity the question of artfully of consummately masking the fault and conferring on the false quantity the brave appearance of the true but i am far from pretending that these desperations of ingenuity have not as through seeming most of the very essence of the problem their exasperated charm so far from it that my particular supreme predicament in the paris hotel after an undue primary leakage of time no doubt over at the great river spanning museum of the champ de mars and the torcadero fairly takes on to me now the tender grace of a day that is dead rereading the last chapters of the tragic muse i catch again the very odour of paris which comes up in the rich rumble of the rue de la paix with which my room itself for that matter seems impregnated and which hangs for reminiscence about the embarrassed effort to finish not ignobly within my already exceeded limits an effort prolonged each day to those late afternoon hours during which the tone of the terrible city seemed to deepen about one to an effect strangely composed at once of the auspicious and the fatal the plot of paris thickened at such hours beyond any other plot in the world i think but there one sat meanwhile with another on one's hands absolutely requiring precedence not the least imperative of one's conditions was thus that one should have really should have finally and 
given one's scale, concisely treated one's subject, in spite of there being so much of the confounded irreducible quantity still to treat. If I spoke just now, however, of the exasperated charm of supreme difficulty, that is because the challenge of economic representation so easily becomes, in any of the arts, intensely interesting to meet. To put all that is possible of one's idea into a form and compass that will contain and express it only by delicate adjustments and an exquisite chemistry, so that there will, at the end, be neither a drop of one's liquor left nor a hair's breadth of the rim of one's glass to spare, every artist will remember how often that sort of necessity has carried with it its particular inspiration. Therein lies the secret of the appeal to his mind of the successfully foreshortened thing, where representation is arrived at, as I have already elsewhere had occasion to urge not by the addition of items, a light that has for its attendant shadow a possible dryness, but by the art of figuring synthetically a compactness into which the imagination may cut thick as into the rich density of wedding cake. The moral of all which, indeed, I fear, is perhaps too trivially, but that the thick, the false, the dissembling second half of the work before me associated throughout with the effort to weigh my dramatic values as heavily as might be since there had to be so few presents that effort as at the very last a quite convulsive yet in this way highly agreeable spasm of such mild prodigies is the history of any specific creative effort composed but i have got too much out of the old kensington light of twenty years ago a lingering oblique ray of which to-day surely quite extinct played for the benediction over my canvas from the moment i made out at my high-perched west window my lucky title that is from the moment miriam ruth herself had given it me so this young woman had given me with it her own position in the book and so that in turn had given me my precious unity to which no more than miriam was either nick dormer or peter sherringham to be sacrificed much of the interest of the matter was immediately therefore in working out the detail of that unity and always entrancing range of questions the order the reason the relation of presented aspects with three general aspects that of miriam's case that of nick's and that of sherringham's there was work in plenty cut out since happy as it might be to say my several actions beautifully become one the point of the affair would be in showing them beautifully become so without which showing foul failure hovered and pounced well the pleasure of handling an action or otherwise expressed of a story is at the worst for a storyteller immense and the interest of such a question as for example keeping nick dormer's story his and yet making it also and all effectively in a large part peter sherringham's of keeping sherringham's his and yet making it in its high degree his kinsman's too and miriam ruth's into the bargain just as miriam ruth's is by the same token quite operatively his and nick's and just as that of each of the young men by an equal logic is very contributively hers the interest of such a question i say is ever so considerably the interest of the system on which the whole thing is done i see to-day that it was but half a system to say 
oh miriam a case herself is the link between the two other cases that device was to ask for as much help as it gave and to require a good deal more application than it announced on the surface the sense of a system saves the painter from the baseness of the arbitrary stroke the touch without its reason but as payment for that service the process insists on being kept impeccably the right one these are intimate truths indeed of which the charm mainly comes out but on experiment and in practice yet i like to have it well before me here that after all the tragic muse makes it not easy to say which of the situations concerned in it predominates and rules what has become in that imperfect order accordingly of the famous centre of one's subject it is surely not in nick's consciousness since why if it be are we treated to such an intolerable dose of sherry hams it can be in sherry hams we have for that altogether an access of nicks how on the other hand can it be in miriam's given that we have no direct exhibition of hers whatever that we get at it all inferentially and inductively seeing it only through a more or less bewildered interpretation of it by others the emphasis is all on an absolutely objective miriam and this affirmed how with such an amount of exposed subjectivity all round her can so dense a medium be a centre such questions as those go straight thanks to which they are i profess delightful going straight they are of the sort that makes answers possible miriam is central then to analysis in spite of being objective central in virtue of the fact that the whole thing has visibly from the first to get itself done in dramatic or at least in scenic conditions though scenic conditions which are as near an approach to the dramatic as the novel may permit itself and which have this in common with the latter that they move in the light of alternation this imposes a consistency other than that of the novel at its loosiest and for one's subject a different view and a different placing of the centre the charm of the scenic consistency the consistency of the multiplication of aspects that of making them amusingly various had haunted the author of the tragic muse from far back and he was in due course to yield to it all luxuriously too luxuriously perhaps in the awkward age as will doubtless with the extension of these remarks be complacently shown to put himself at any rate as much as possible under the protection of it had been ever his practice he had notably done so in the princess casamassima so frankly panoramic and processional and in what case could this protection have had more price than in the one before us no character in a play any play not a mere monologue has for the right expression of the thing a usurping consciousness the consciousness of others is exhibited exactly in the same way as that of the hero the prodigious consciousness of hamlet the most capacious and most crowded the moral presence the most asserted in the whole range of fiction only takes its turn with that of the other agents of the story no matter how occasional these may be it is left in other words to answer for itself equally with theirs wherefore by a parity of reasoning if not of example miriam's might without inconsequence be placed on the same footing and all in spite of the fact that the moral presence of each of the men most importantly concerned with her 
or with the second of whom she at least is importantly concerned is independently answered for the idea of the book being as i have said a picture of some of the personal consequences of the art appetite raised to intensity swollen to veracity the heavy emphasis falls where the symbol of some of the complications so begotten might be made as i judged heaven forgive me most amusing amusing i mean in the best very modern sense i never go behind miriam only poor sherringham goes a great deal and nick dormer goes a little and the author while they so waste wonderment goes behind them but none the less she is as thoroughly symbolic as functional for illustration of the idea as either of them while her image had seemed susceptible of a livelier and prettier concretion i had desired for her i remember all manageable vividness so ineluctable had it long appeared to do the actress to touch the theatre to meet that connection somehow or other in any free plunge of the speculative fork into the contemporary social salad the late r l stevenson was to write to me i recall and precisely on the occasion of the tragic muse that he was at a loss to conceive how one could find an interest in anything so vulgar or pretend to gather fruit in so scrubby an orchard but the view of a creature of the stage the view of the histrionic temperament a suggestive much less verily in respect to the poor stage per se than in respect to art at large affected me in spite of that as justly tenable an objection of a more pointed order was forced upon me by an acute friend later on and in another connection the challenge of one's right in any pretended show of social realities to attach to the image of a public character a supposed particular celebrity a range of interest of intrinsic distinction greater than any such display of importance on the part of eminent members of the class as we see them about us there was a nice point if one would yet only nice enough after all to be easily amusing we shall deal with it later on however in a more urgent connection what would have worried me much more had it dawned earlier is the light lately thrown by that admirable writer monsieur anatole france on the question of any animated view of the histrionic temperament a light that may well dazzle to distress any ingenuous worker in the same field in those parts of his brief but inimitable histoire comique on which he is most to be congratulated for there are some that prompt to reserves he has done the actress as well as the actor done above all the mountbank the mummer and the cabotin and mixed them up with a queer theatric air in a manner that practically warns all other hands off the material for ever at the same time i think i saw miriam and without a sacrifice of truth that is of the particular glow of verisimilitude i wished her most to benefit by in a complexity of relations finer than any that appear possible for the gentry of monsieur anatole france her relation to nick dormer for instance was intended as a superior interest that of being while perfectly sincere sincere for her and therefore perfectly consonant with her impulse perpetually to perform and with her success in performing the result of a touched imagination a touched pride for art as well as of the charm cast on other sensibilities still dormer's relation to herself is a different matter 
of which more presently but the sympathy she poor young woman very generously and intelligently offers him where most people have so stinted it is disclosed largely at the cost of her egotism and her personal pretensions even though in fact determined by her sense of their together nick and she postponing the world to their conception of other and finer decencies nick can't on the whole see for i have represented him as in his day quite sufficiently troubled and anxious why he should condemn to ugly feebleness his most prized faculty most prized at least by himself even in order to keep his seat in parliament to inherit mr carteret's blessing and money to gratify his mother and carry out the mission of his father to marry julia dallow in fine a beautiful imperative woman with a great many thousands a year it all comes back in the last analysis to the individual vision of decency the critical as well as the passionate judgment of it under sharp stress and nick's vision and judgment all on the aesthetic ground have beautifully coincided to miriam's imagination with a now fully marked and inspired and impenitent choice of her own so that other considerations powerfully aiding indeed she is ready to see their interests all splendidly as one she is in the uplifted state to which sacrifices and submissions loom large but loom so just because they must write sympathy write passion large her measure of what she would be capable of for him capable that is of not asking of him will depend on what he shall ask of her but she has no fear of not being able to satisfy him even to the point of chucking for him if need be that artistic identity of her own which she has begun to build up it will all be to the glory therefore of their common infatuation with art she will doubtless be no less willing to serve his than she was eager to serve her own purged now of the too great shrillness this puts her quite on a different level from that of monsieur france whose artistic identity is the last thing they wish to chuck the only dismissal is of all material and social overdraping nick dormer in point of fact asks of miriam nothing but that she shall remain awfully interesting to paint but that is his relation which as i say is quite a matter by itself he at any rate luckily for both of them it may be doesn't put her to the test he is so busy with his own case busy with testing himself and feeling his reality he has seen himself as giving up precious things for an object and that object has somehow not been the young woman in question nor anything very nearly like her she on the other hand has asked everything of peter sherringham who has asked everything of her and it is in so doing that she has really most testified for art and invited him to testify with his professed interest in the theatre one of those deep subjections that in men of taste the comedie francaise used in old days to conspire for and some such odd and affecting examples of which were to be noted he yet offers her his hand and an introduction to the very best society if she will leave the stage the power and her having the sense of the power to shine in the world is his highest measure of her the test applied by him to her beautiful human value just as the manner in which she turns on him 
is the application of her own standard and touchstone she is perfectly sure of her own for if there were nothing else and there is much she has tasted blood so to speak in the form of her so prompt and auspicious success with the public leaving all probations behind the whole of which as the book gives it is too rapid and sudden though inevitably so processes periods intervals stages degrees connections may be easily enough and barely enough named may be unconvincingly stated in fiction to the deep discredit of the writer but it remains the very deuce to represent them especially represent them under strong compression and in brief and subordinate terms and this even though the novelist who doesn't represent and represent all the time is lost exactly as much lost as the painter who at his work and given his intention doesn't paint all the time turn upon her friend at any rate miriam does and one of my main points is missed if it fails to appear that she does so with absolute sincerity and with the cold passion of the high critic who knows on sight of them together the more or less dazzling faults from the comparatively grey-coloured true sherringham's whole profession has been that he rejoices in her as she is and that the theatre the organised theatre will be as matthew arnold was in those very days pronouncing it irresistible and it is the promptness with which he sheds his pretended faith as soon as it feels in the air the breath of reality as soon as it asks of him a proof or a sacrifice it is this that excites her doubtless sufficiently arrogant scorn where is the virtue of his high interest if it has verily never been an interest to speak of and if all it has suddenly to suggest is that in face of a serious call it shall be unblushingly relinquished if he and she together and her great field and future and the whole cause they had armed and declared for have not been serious things they have been base make-believes and trivialities which is what in fact the homage of society to art always turns out so soon as art presumes not to be vulgar and futile it is immensely the fashion and immensely edifying to listen to this homage while it confines its attention to vanities and frauds but it knows only terror feels only horror the moment that instead of making all the concessions art proceeds to ask for a few miriam is nothing if not strenuous and evidently nothing if not cheeky where sherringham is concerned at least these in the all egoistical exhibition to which she is condemned are the very elements of her figure and the very colours of her portrait but she is mild and inconsequent for nick dormer who demands of her so little as if gravely and pityingly embracing the truth that his sacrifice on the right side is probably to have very little of her sort of recompense i must have had it well before me that she was all aware of the small strain a great sacrifice to nick would cost her by reason of the strong effect on her of his own superior logic in which the very intensity of concentration was so to find its account if the man however who holds her personally dear yet holds her extremely personal message to the world cheap so the man capable of a consistency and as she regards the matter of an honesty so much higher than sharing hands virtually cares really cares 
no straw for his fellow struggler if nick dormer attracts and all indifferently holds her it is because like herself and unlike peter he puts art first but the most he thus does for her in the event is to let her see how she may enjoy in intimacy the rigour it has taught him and which he cultivates at her expense this is the situation in which we leave her though there would be more still to be said about the difference for her of the two relations that to each of the men could i fondly suppose as much of the interest of the book left over for the reader as for myself sherringham for instance offers miriam marriage ever so handsomely but if nothing might lead me on further than the question of what it would have been open to us 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 novelists especially in the old days to show serially a young man in nick dormer's quite different position as offering or a young woman in miriam's as taking so for that very reason such an excursion is forbidden me the trade of the stage player and above all of the actress must have so many detestable sides for the person exercising it that we scarce imagine a full surrender to it without a full surrender not less to every immediate compensation to every freedom and the largest ease within reach which presentment of the possible case for miriam would yet have been condemned and on grounds both various and interesting to trace to remain very imperfect i feel moreover that i might still with space abound in remarks about nick's character and nick's crisis suggested to my present more reflective vision it strikes me alas that he is not quite so interesting as he was fondly intended to be and this in spite of the multiplication within the picture of his pains and penalties so that while i turn this slight anomaly over i come upon a reason that affects me as singularly charming and touching and at which indeed i have already glanced any presentation of the artist in triumph must be flat in proportion as it really sticks to its subject it can only smuggle in relief and variety for to put the matter in an image all we then in his triumph see of the charm compeller is the back he turns to us as he bends over his work his triumph decently is but the triumph of what he produces and that is another affair his romance is the romance he himself projects he eats the cake of the very rarest privilege the most luxurious baked in the oven of the gods therefore he mayn't have it in the form of the privilege of the hero at the same time the privilege of the hero that is of the martyr and of the interesting and appealing and comparatively floundering person places him in quite a different category belongs to him only as to the artist deluded diverted frustrated or vanquished when the amateur in him gains for our admiration or compassion or whatever all that the expert has to do without therefore i strove in vain i feel to embroil and adorn this young man on whom a hundred ingenious touches are thus lavished he has insisted in the event on looking as simple and flat as some mere brass check or engraved number the symbol and guarantee of a stored treasure the better part of him is locked too much away from us and the part we see has to pass for well what it passes for so lamentedly among his friends and relatives no accordingly nick dormer isn't the best thing in the book as i judge i imagined he would be and it contains nothing better i make out 
than that preserved and achieved unity and quality of tone a value in itself which i referred to at the beginning of these remarks what i mean by this is that the interest created and expression of that interest are things kept as to kind genuine and true to themselves the appeal the fidelity to the prime motive is with no little art strained clear even as silver is polished in a degree answering at least by intention to the air of beauty there is an awkwardness again in having thus belatedly to point such features out but in that wrought appearance of animation and harmony that effect of free movement and yet of recurrent and insistent reference the tragic muse has struck me again as conscious of a bright advantage henry james end of preface Chapter One of the Tragic Muse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragic Muse by Henry James. Chapter One. The people of France have made it no secret that those of England, as a general thing, are to their perception an inexpressive and speechless race perpendicular and unsociable unaddicted to enriching any bareness of contact with verbal or other embroidery this view might have derived encouragement a few years ago in paris from the manner in which four persons sat together in silence one fine day about noon in the garden as it is called of the palais de l'industrie the central court of the great glazed bazaar where among plants and parterres graveled walks and thin fountains are arranged the figures and groups the monuments and busts which form in the annual exhibition of the salon the department of statuary the spirit of observation is naturally high at the salon quickened by a thousand artful or artless appeals but it need have put forth no great intensity to take in the characters i mention as a solicitation of the eye on definite grounds these visitors too constituted a successful plastic fact and even the most superficial observer would have marked them as products of an insular neighbourhood representatives of that tweed and waterproof class with which on the recurrent occasions when the english turn out for a holiday christmas and easter whitsuntide and the autumn paris be sprinkles itself at a night's notice they had about them the indefinable professional look of the british traveller abroad the air of preparation for exposure material and moral which is so oddly combined with the serene revelation of security and of persistence and which excites according to individual susceptibility the ire or the admiration of foreign communities they were the more unmistakable as they presented mainly the happier aspects of the energetic race to which they had the honour to belong the fresh diffused light of the salon made them clear and important they were finished creations in their way and ranged there motionless on their green bench were almost as much on exhibition as if they had been hung on the line three ladies and a young man they were obviously a family a mother two daughters and a son a circumstance which had the effect at once of making each member of the group doubly typical and of helping to account for their fine taciturnity they were not with each other on terms of ceremony and also were probably fatigued 
with their course among the pictures the rooms on the upper floor their attitude on the part of visitors who had superior features even if they might appear to some passers-by to have neglected a fine opportunity for completing these features with an expression was after all a kind of tribute to the state of exhaustion of bewilderment to which the genius of france is still capable of reducing the proud en voilà des aprides more than one of their fellow-gazers might have been heard to exclaim and certain it is that there was something depressed and discouraged in this interesting group who sat looking vaguely before them not noticing the life of the place somewhat as if each had a private anxiety it might have been finely guessed however that though on many questions they were closely united this present anxiety was not the same for each if they looked grave moreover this was doubtless partly the result of their all being dressed in such mourning as told of a recent bereavement the eldest of the three ladies had indeed a face of a fine austere mould which would have been moved to gaiety only by some force more insidious than any she was likely to recognize in paris cold still and considerably worn it was neither stupid nor hard it was firm narrow and sharp this competent matron acquainted evidently with grief but not weakened by it had a high forehead to which the quality of the skin gave a singular polish it glittered even when seen at a distance a nose which achieved a high free curve and a tendency to throw back her head and carry it well above her as if to disengage it from the possible entanglements of the rest of her person if you had seen her walk you would have felt her to tread the earth after a fashion suggesting that in a world where she had long since discovered that one couldn't have one's own way one could never tell what annoying aggression might take place so that it was well from hour to hour to save what one could lady agnes saved her head her white triangular forehead over which her close crinkled flaxen hair reproduced in different shades in her children made a looped silken canopy like the marquee at a garden party her daughters were as tall as herself that was visible even as they sat there and one of them the younger evidently altogether pretty a straight slender gray-eyed english girl of the sort who show good figures and fresh complexions the sister who was not pretty was also straight and slender and gray-eyed but the gray in this case was not so pure nor were the straightness and the slenderness so maidenly the brother of these young ladies had taken off his hat as if he felt the air of the summer day heavy in the great pavilion he was a lean strong clear-faced youth with a formed nose and thick light brown hair which lay continuously and profusely back from his forehead so that to smooth it from the brow to the neck but a single movement of the hand was required i cannot describe him better than by saying that he was the sort of young englishman who looks particularly well in strange lands and whose general aspect his inches his limps his friendly eyes the modulation of his voice the cleanness of his flesh tints and the fashion of his garments excites on the part of those who encounter him in far countries on the ground of a common speech a delightful sympathy of race this sympathy may sometimes be qualified by the seen limits of his apprehension but it almost revels as such horizons recede we shall see quickly enough how accurate a measure it might have taken of nicholas dormer there was food for suspicion perhaps in the wandering blankness that sat at moments in his eyes 
as if he had no attention at all not the least in the world at his command but it is no more than just to add without delay that this discouraging symptom was known among those who liked him by the indulgent name of dreaminess by his mother and sisters for instance his dreaminess was constantly noted he is the more welcome to the benefit of such an interpretation as there is always held to be something engaging in the combination of the muscular and amusing the mildness of strength after some time an interval during which these good people might have appeared to have come individually to the palais de l'industrie much less to see the works of art than to think over their domestic affairs the young man rousing himself from his reverie addressed one of the girls i say biddy why should we sit moping here all day come and take a turn about with me his younger sister while he got up leaned forward a little looking round her but she gave for the moment no further sign of complying with his invitation where shall we find you then if peter comes asked the other miss dormer making no movement at all i dare say peter won't come he'll leave us here to cool our heels oh nick dear biddy exclaimed in a small sweet voice of protest it was plainly her theory that peter would come and even a little her fond fear that she might miss him should she quit that spot we shall come back in a quarter of an hour really i must look at these things nick declared turning his face to a marble group which stood near them on the right a man with the skin of a beast round his loins tussling with a naked woman in some primitive effort of courtship or capture lady agnes followed the direction of her son's eyes and then observed everything seems very dreadful i should think biddy had better sit still hasn't she seen enough horrors up above i dare say that if peter comes julia will be with him the elder girl remarked irrelevantly well then he can take julia about that will be more proper said lady agnes mother dear she doesn't care a rap about art it's a fearful bore looking at fine things with julia nick returned won't you go with him grace and biddy appealed to her sister i think she has awfully good taste grace exclaimed not answering this inquiry don't say nasty things about her lady agnes broke out solemnly to her son after resting her eyes on him a moment with an air of reluctant reprobation i say nothing about what she'd say herself the young man urged about some things she has very good taste but about this kind of thing she has no taste at all that's better i think said lady agnes turning her eyes again to the kind of thing her son appeared to designate she's awfully clever awfully grace went on with decision awfully awfully her brother repeated standing in front of her and smiling down at her you are nasty nick you know you are said the young lady but more in sorrow than in anger biddy got up at this as if the accusatory tone prompted her to place herself generously at his side mightn't you go and order lunch in that place you know she asked of her mother then we'll come back when it was ready my dear child i can't order lunch lady agnes replied with a cold impatience which seemed to intimate that she had problems far more important than those of victualling to contend with then perhaps peter will if he comes i'm sure he's up in everything of that sort oh hang peter nick exclaimed leave him out of account and do order lunch mother but not cold beef and pickles i must say about him you are not nice biddy ventured to remark to her brother hesitating and even blushing a little you make up for it my dear the young man answered giving her chin 
a very charming rotund little chin a friendly whisk with his forefinger i can't imagine what you've got against him her ladyship said gravely dear mother it's disappointed fondness nick argued they won't answer one's notes they won't let one know where they are nor what to expect hell has no fury like a woman scorned nor like a man either peter has such a tremendous lot to do it's a very busy time at the embassy there are sure to be reasons biddy explained with her pretty eyes reason enough no doubt said lady agnes who accompanied these words with an ambiguous sigh however as if in paris even the best reasons would naturally be bad ones doesn't julia write to you doesn't she answer you the very day grace asked looking at nick as if she were the bold one he waited returning her glance with a certain severity what do you know about my correspondence no doubt i ask too much he went on i'm so attached to them dear old peter dear old julia she's younger than you my dear cried the elder girl still resolute yes nineteen days i'm glad you know her birthday she knows yours she always gives you something lady agnes reminded her son her taste is good then isn't it nick grace dormer continued she makes charming presents my dear mother it isn't her taste it's her husband's how her husband's the beautiful objects of which she disposes so freely are the things he collected for years laboriously devotedly poor man she disposes of them to you but not to others said lady agnes but that's all right she added as if this might have been taken for a complaint of the limitations of julia's bounty she has to select among so many and that's a proof of taste her ladyship pursued you can't say she doesn't choose lovely ones grace remarked to her brother in a tone of some triumph my dear they're all lovely george dallow's judgment was so sure he was incapable of making a mistake nicholas dormer returned i don't see how you can talk of him he was dreadful said lady agnes my dear if he was good enough for julia to marry he is good enough for us to talk of she did him a very great honour i dare say but he was not unworthy of it no such enlightened collection of beautiful objects has been made in england in our time you think too much of beautiful objects lady agnes sighed i thought you were just now lamenting that i think too little it's very nice his having left julia so well off biddy interposed soothingly as if she foresaw a tangle he treated her en grand seigneur absolutely nick went on he used to look greasy all the same grace bore on it with a dull weight his name ought to have been tello you're not saying what julia would like if that's what you're trying to say her brother observed don't be vulgar grace said lady agnes i know peter sherringham's birthday biddy broke out innocently as a pacific diversion she had passed her hand into nick's arm to signify her readiness to go with him while she scanned the remoter reaches of the garden as if it had occurred to her that to direct their steps in some such sense might after all be the shorter way to get at peter he is too much older than you my dear grace answered without encouragement that's why i've noticed it he's thirty-four do you call that too old i don't care for slobbering infants biddy cried don't be vulgar lady agnes enjoined again come bid we'll go and be vulgar together for that's what we are i'm afraid her brother said to her we'll go and look at all these low works of art do you really think it's necessary to the child's development lady agnes demanded as the pair turned away and then while her son struck as by a challenge paused lingering a moment with his little sister on his arm 
what we've been through this morning in this place and what you've paraded before our eyes the murders the tortures all kinds of disease and indecency nick looked at his mother as if this sudden protest surprised him but as if also there were lurking explanations of it which he quickly guessed her resentment had the effect not so much of animating her cold face as of making it colder less expressive though visibly prouder ah dear mother don't do the british matron he replied good-humouredly british matrons soon said i don't know what they are coming to how odd that you should have been struck with the disagreeable things when for myself i felt it to be most interesting the most suggestive morning i've passed for ever so many months oh nick nick lady agnes cried with a strange depth of feeling i like them better in london they are much less unpleasant said grace dormer they are things you can look at her ladyship went on we certainly make the better show the subject doesn't matter it's the treatment the treatment biddy protested in a voice like the tinkle of a silver bell poor little bit her brother broke into a laugh how can i learn to model mamma dear if i don't look at things and if i don't study them the girl continued this question passed unheeded and nicholas dormer said to his mother more seriously but with a certain kind explicitness as if he could make a particular allowance this place is an immense stimulus to me it refreshes me excites me it's such an exhibition of artistic life it's full of ideas full of refinements it gives one such an impression of artistic experience they tried everything they feel everything while you were looking at the murders apparently i observed an immense deal of curious and interesting work there are too many of them poor devils so many who must make their way who must attract attention some of them can only taper forth stand on their heads turn somersaults or commit deeds of violence to make people notice them after that no doubt a good many will be quieter but i don't know to-day i am in an appreciative mood i feel indulgent even to them they gave me an impression of intelligence of eager observation all art is one remember that biddy dear the young man continued smiling down from his height it's the same great many-headed effort and any ground that's gained by an individual any spark that's struck in any province it's of use and of suggestion to all the others we are all in the same boat we do you say my dear are you really setting up for an artist lady agnes asked nick just hesitated i was speaking for biddy but you are one nick you are the girl cried lady agnes looked for an instant as if she were going to say once more don't be vulgar but she suppressed these words had she intended them and uttered sounds few in number and not completely articulate to the effect that she hated talking about art while her son spoke she had watched him as if failing to follow yet something in the tone of her exclamation hinted that she had understood him but too well we are all in the same boat biddy repeated with cheerful zeal not me if you please lady agnes replied it's horrid messy work you're modelling ah but look at the results said the girl eagerly glancing about at the monuments in the garden as if in regard even to them she were through that unity of art her brother had just proclaimed in some degree an effective cause there's a great deal being done here a real vitality nicholas dormer went on to his mother in the same reasonable informing way some of these fellows go very far they do indeed said lady agnes 
i'm fond of young schools like this movement in sculpture nick insisted with his slightly provoking serenity they are old enough to know better may i look mamma it is necessary to my development biddy declared you may do as you like said lady agnes with dignity she ought to see good work you know the young man went on i leave it to your sense of responsibility this statement was somewhat majestic and for a moment evidently it tempted nick almost provoked him or at any rate suggested to him an occasion for some pronouncement he had had on his mind apparently however he judged the time on the whole not quite right and his sister grace interposed with the inquiry please mamma are we never going to lunch ah mother mother the young man murmured in a troubled way looking down at her with a deep fold in his forehead for lady agnes also as she returned his look it seemed an occasion but with this difference that she had no hesitation in taking advantage of it she was encouraged by his slight embarrassment for ordinarily nick was not embarrassed you used to have so much sense of responsibility she pursued but sometimes i don't know what has become of it it seems all all gone ah mother mother he exclaimed again as if there were so many things to say that it was impossible to choose but now he stepped closer bent over her and in spite of the publicity of their situation gave her a quick expressive kiss the foreign observer whom i took for granted in the beginning to sketch the scene would have had to admit that the rigid english family had after all a capacity for emotion grace dormer indeed looked round her to see if at this moment they were noticed she judged with satisfaction that they had escaped End of chapter 1chapter two of the tragic muse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the tragic muse by henry james chapter two nick dormer walked away with biddy but he had not gone far before he stopped in front of a clever bust where his mother in the distance saw him playing in the air with his hand carrying out by this gesture which presumably was applausive some critical remark he had made to his sister lady agnes raised her glass to her eyes by the long handle to which rather a clanking chain was attached perceiving that the bust represented an ugly old man with a bald head at which her ladyship indefinitely sighed though it was not apparent in what way such an object could be detrimental to her daughter nick passed on and quickly paused again this time his mother discerned before the marble image of a strange grimacing woman presently she lost sight of him he wandered behind things looking at them all round i ought to get plenty of ideas for my modelling aren't i nick his sister put to him after a moment ah my poor child what shall i say don't you think i have any capacity for ideas the girl continued ruefully lots of them no doubt but the capacity for applying them for putting them into practice how much of that have you how can i tell till i try what do you mean by trying biddy dear why you know you've seen me do you call that trying her brother amusedly demanded ah nick she said with sensibility but then with more spirit and please what do you call it well this for instance is a good case and her companion pointed to another bust ahead of a young man in terracotta at which they had just arrived a modern young man to whom with his thick neck 
his little cap and his white ring of dense curls the artist had given the air of some sturdy florentine of the time of lorenzo biddy looked at the image a moment ah that's not trying that's succeeding not altogether it's only trying seriously well why shouldn't i be serious mother wouldn't like it she has inherited the fine old superstition that art's pardonable only so long as it's bad so long as it's done at odd hours for a little distraction like a game of tennis or of whist the only thing that can justify it the effort to carry it as far as one can which you can't do without time and singleness of purpose she regards as just the dangerous the criminal element it's the oddest hint part before view the drollest immorality she doesn't want one to be professional biddy returned as if she could do justice to every system better leave it alone then they are always duffers enough i don't want to be a duffer biddy said but i thought you encouraged me so i did my poor child it was only to encourage myself with your own work your painting with my futile my ill-starred endeavors union is strength so that we might present a wider front a larger surface of resistance biddy for a while said nothing and they continued their tour of observation she noticed how he passed over some things quickly his first glance sufficing to show him if they were worth another and then recognized in a moment the figures that made some appeal his tone puzzled but his certainty of eye impressed her and she felt what a difference there was yet between them how much longer in every case she would have taken to discriminate she was aware of how little she could judge of the value of a thing till she had looked at it ten minutes indeed modest little biddy was compelled privately to add and often not even then she was mystified as i say nick was often mystifying it was his only fault but one thing was definite her brother had high ability it was the consciousness of this that made her bring out at last i don't so much care whether or no i please mamma if i please you oh don't lean on me i'm a wretched broken reed i'm no use really he promptly admonished her do you mean you are a duffer biddy asked in alarm frightful frightful so that you intend to give up your work to let it alone as you advise me it has never been my work all that business biddy if it had it would be different i should stick to it and you won't stick to it the girl said standing before him open-eyed her brother looked into her eyes a moment and she had a compunction she feared she was indiscreet and was worrying him your questions are much simpler than the elements out of which my answer should come a great talent what's simpler than that one excellent thing dear biddy no talent at all well yours is so real you can't help it we shall see we shall see said nick dorma let us go look at that big group we shall see if your talent's real biddy went on as she accompanied him no we shall see if as you say i can't help it what nonsense paris makes one talk the young man added as they stopped in front of the composition this was true perhaps but not in a sense he could find himself tempted to deplore the present was far from his first visit to the french capital he had often quitted england and usually made a point of putting in as he called it a few days there on the outward journey to the continent or on the return but at present the feelings for the most part agreeable attendant upon a change of air and of scene had been more punctual and more acute than for a long time before and stronger the sense of novelty refreshment amusement 
of the hundred appeals from that quarter of thought to which on the whole his attention was apt most frequently though not most confessedly to stray he was fonder of paris than most of his countrymen though not so fond perhaps as some other captivated aliens the place had always had the virtue of quickening in him sensibly the life of reflection and observation it was a good while since his impressions had been so favourable to the city by the same a good while at all events since they had ministered so to excitement to exhilaration to ambition even to a restlessness that was not prevented from being agreeable by the excess of agitation in it nick could have given the reason of this unwanted glow but his preference was very much to keep it to himself certainly to persons not deeply knowing or at any rate not deeply curious in relation to the young man's history the explanation might have seemed to beg the question consisting as it did of the simple formula that he had at last come to a crisis why a crisis what was it and why had he not come to it before the reader shall learn these things in time if he cares enough for them our young man had not in any recent year failed to see the salon which the general voice this season pronounced not particularly good none the less it was the present exhibition that for some cause connected with his crisis made him think fast produce that effect he had spoken of to his mother as a sense of artistic life the precinct of the marbles and bronzes spoke to him especially to-day the glazed garden not florally rich with its new productions alternating with perfunctory plants and its queer damp smell partly the odour of plastic clay of the studios of sculptors put forth the voice of old associations of other visits of companionships now ended an insinuating eloquence which was at the same time somehow identical with the general sharp contagion of paris there was youth in the air and a multitudinous newness forever reviving and the diffusion of a hundred talents ingenuities experiments the summer clouds made shadows on the roof of the great building the white images hard in their crudity spotted the place with provocations the rattle of plates at the restaurant sounded sociable in the distance and our young man congratulated himself more than ever that he had not missed his chance he felt how it would help him to settle something at the moment he made this reflection his eye fell upon a person who appeared just in the first glimpse to carry out the idea of help he uttered a lively ejaculation which however in its want of finish biddy failed to understand so pertinent so relevant and congruous was the other party to this encounter the girl's attention followed her brothers resting with it on a young man who faced them without seeing them engaged as he was in imparting to two companions his ideas about one of the works exposed to view what biddy remarked was that this young man was fair and fat and of the middle stature he had a round face and a short beard and on his crown a mere reminiscence of hair as the fact that he carried his hat in his hand permitted to be observed bridget dormer who was quick placed him immediately as a gentleman but as a gentleman unlike any other gentleman she had ever seen she would have taken him for very foreign but that the words proceeding from his mouth reached her ear and imposed themselves as a rare variety of english it was not that a foreigner might not have spoken smoothly enough nor yet that the speech of this young man was not smooth it had in truth a conspicuous and aggressive perfection and biddy was sure no mere learner would have ventured to play such tricks with the tongue 
he seemed to draw rich effects and wandering airs from it to modulate and manipulate it as he would have done a musical instrument her view of the gentleman's companions was less operative save for her soon making the reflection that they were people whom in any country from china to peru you would immediately have taken for natives one of them was an old lady with a shawl that was the most salient way in which she presented herself the shawl was an ancient much used fabric of embroidered cashmere such as many ladies wore forty years ago in their walks abroad and such as no lady wears to-day it had fallen half off the back of the wearer but at the moment biddy permitted herself to consider her she gave it a violent jerk and brought it up to her shoulders again where she continued to arrange and settle it with a good deal of jauntiness and elegance while she listened to the talk of the gentleman biddy guessed that this little transaction took place very frequently and was not unaware of its giving the old lady a droll factitious faded appearance as if she were singularly out of step with the age the other person was very much younger she might have been a daughter and had a pale face a low forehead and thick dark hair what she chiefly had however biddy rapidly discovered was a pair of largely gazing eyes our young friend was helped to the discovery by the accident of their resting at this moment for a time it struck biddy as very long on her own both these ladies were clad in light thin scant gowns giving an impression of flowered figures and odd transparencies and in low shoes which showed a great deal of stocking and were ornamented with large rosettes biddy's slightly agitated perception travelled directly to their shoes they suggested to her vaguely that the wearers were dancers connected possibly with the old-fashioned exhibition of the shawl dance by the time she had taken in so much as this the mellifluous young man had perceived and addressed himself to her brother he came on with an offered hand nick greeted him and said it was a happy chance he was uncommonly glad to see him i never come across you i don't know why nick added while the two smiling looked at each other up and down like men reunited after a long interval oh it seems to me there's reason enough our paths in life are so different nick's friend had a great deal of manner as was evinced by his fashion of saluting biddy without knowing her different yes but not so different as that don't we both live in london after all and in the nineteenth century ah my dear dorma excuse me i don't live in the nineteenth century jamais de la vie the gentleman declared nor in london either yes when i'm not at Summerkand. but surely we've diverged since the old days i adore what you burn you burn what i adore while the stranger spoke he looked cheerfully hospitably at biddy not because it was she she easily guessed but because it was in his nature to desire a second auditor a kind of sympathetic gallery her life was somehow filled with shy people and she immediately knew she had never encountered any one who seemed so to know his part and recognize his cues how do you know what i adore nicholas dormer asked i know well enough what you used to that's more than i do myself there were so many things yes there are many things many many that's what makes life so amusing do you find it amusing my dear fellow c'est à se tordre don't you think so ah it was high time i should meet you i see i have an idea you need me upon my word i think i do nick said in a tone which struck his sister made her wonder still more why if the gentleman was so important as that he didn't introduce him 
there are many gods and this is one of their temples the mysterious personage went on it's a house of strange idols isn't it and of some strange and unnatural sacrifices to biddy as much as to her brother this remark might have been offered but the girl's eyes turned back to the ladies who for the moment had lost their companion she felt irresponsive and feared she should pass with this easy cosmopolite for a stiff scared english girl which was not the type she aimed at but wasn't even ocular commerce overbold so long as she hadn't a sign from nick the elder of the strange women had turned her back and was looking at some bronze figure losing her shawl again as she did so but the other stood where their escort had quitted her giving all her attention to his sudden sociability with others her arms hung at her sides her head was bent her face lowered so that she had an odd appearance of raising her eyes from under her brows and in this attitude she was striking though her air was so unconciliatory as almost to seem dangerous did it express resentment at having been abandoned for another girl biddy who began to be frightened there was a moment when the neglected creature resembled a tigress about to spring was tempted to cry out that she had no wish whatever to appropriate the gentleman then she made the discovery that the young lady too had a manner almost as much as her clever guide and the rapid induction that it perhaps meant no more than his she only looked at biddy from beneath her eyebrows which were wonderfully arched but there was ever so much of a manner in the way she did it biddy had a momentary sense of being a figure in a ballet a dramatic ballet a subordinate motionless figure to be dashed at to music or strangely capered up to it would be a very dramatic ballet indeed if this young person were the heroine she had magnificent hair the girl reflected and at the same moment heard nick said to his interlocutor you're not in london one can't meet you there i rove drift float was the answer my feelings direct me if such a life as mine may be said to have a direction where there's anything to feel i try to be there the young man continued with his confiding laugh i should like to get hold of you nick returned well in that case there would be no doubt the intellectual adventure those are the currents any sort of personal relation that govern my career i don't want to lose you this time nick continued in a tone that excited biddy's surprise a moment before when his friend had said that he tried to be where there was anything to feel she had wondered how he could endure him don't lose me don't lose me cried the stranger after a fashion which affected a girl as the highest expression of irresponsibility she had ever seen after all why should you let us remain together unless i interfere and he looked smiling and interrogative at biddy who still remained blank only noting again that nick forbore to make them acquainted this was an anomaly since he prized the gentleman so still there could be no anomaly of nick's that wouldn't impose itself on his younger sister certainly i keep you he said unless on my side i deprive those ladies charming women but it's not an indissoluble union we meet we communicate we part they're going i'm seeing them to the door i shall come back with this nick's friend rejoined his companions who moved away with him the strange fine eyes of the girl lingering on biddy's brother as well as on biddy herself as they receded who is he who are they biddy instantly asked he's a gentleman nick made answer insufficiently she thought and even with a shade of hesitation he spoke as if she might have supposed he was not one and if he was really one why didn't he introduce him 
but biddy wouldn't for the world have put this question and he now moved to the nearest bench and dropped upon it as to await the other's return no sooner however had his sister seated herself than he said see here my dear do you think you had better stay do you want me to go back to mother the girl asked with a lengthening visage well what do you think he asked it indeed gaily enough is your conversation to be about about private affairs no i can't say that but i doubt if mother would think it the sort of things that's necessary to your development this assertion appeared to inspire her with the eagerness with which she again broke out but who are they who are they i know nothing of the ladies i never saw them before the man is a fellow i knew very well at oxford he was thought immense fun there we've diverged as he says and i had almost lost sight of him but not so much as he thinks because i've read him read him with interest he has written a very clever book what kind of a book a sort of novel what sort of novel well i don't know with a lot of good writing biddy listened to this so receptively that she thought it perverse her brother should add i dare say peter will have come if you return to mother i don't care if he has peter's nothing to me but i'll go if you wish it nick smiled upon her again and then said it doesn't signify we'll all go all she echoed he won't hurt us on the contrary he will do us good this was possible the girl reflected in silence but none the less the idea struck her as courageous of their taking the odd young man back to breakfast with them and with the others especially if peter should be there if peter was nothing to her it was singular she should have attached such importance to this contingency the odd young man reappeared and now that she saw him without his queer female appendages he seemed personally less weird he struck her moreover as generally a good deal accounted for by the literary character especially if it were responsible for a lot of good writing as he took his place on the bench nick said to him indicating her my sister bridget and then mentioned his name mr gabriel nash you enjoy paris you're happy here mr nash inquired leaning over his friend to speak to the girl though his words belonged to the situation it struck her that his tone didn't and this made her answer him more dryly than she usually spoke oh yes it's very nice and french art interests you you find things here that please oh yes i like some of them mr nash considered her kindly i hope you'd say you like the academy better she would if she didn't think you expected it said nicholas dormer oh nick biddy protested miss dormer's herself an english picture their visitor pronounced in the tone of a man whose urbanity was a general solvent that's a compliment if you don't like them biddy exclaimed ah some of them some of them there's a certain sort of thing mr nash continued we must feel everything everything that we can we're here for that you do like english art then nick demanded with a slight accent of surprise mr nash indulged his wonder my dear dormer do you remember the old complaint i used to make of you you had formulas that were like walking in one's hat one may see something in a case and one may not upon my word said nick i don't know any one who was fonder of a generalization than you you turn them off as the man at the street corner distributes handbills they were my wild oats i've sown them all we shall see that oh there's nothing of them now a tame scanty homely growth my only good generalizations are my actions we shall see them then 
ah pardon me you can't see them with the naked eye moreover mine are principally negative people's actions i know are for the most part the things they do but mine are all the things i don't do there are so many of those so many but they don't produce any effect and then all the rest are shades extremely fine shades shades of behavior nick inquired with an interest which surprised his sister mr nash's discourse striking her mainly as the twaddle of the underworld shades of impression of appreciation said the young man with his explanatory smile all my behavior consists of my feelings well don't you show your feelings you used to wasn't it mainly those of disgust nash asked those operate no longer i've closed that window do you mean you like everything dear me no but i look only at what i do like do you mean that you've lost the noble faculty of disgust i haven't the least idea i never try it my dear fellow said gabriel nash we've only one life that we know anything about fancy taking it up with disagreeable impressions when then shall we go in for the agreeable what do you mean by the agreeable nick demanded oh the happy moments of our consciousness the multiplication of those moments we must save as many as possible from the dark gulf nick had excited surprise on the part of his sister but it was now biddy's turn to make him open his eyes a little she raised her sweet voice in appeal to the stranger don't you think there are any wrongs in the world any abuses and sufferings oh so many so many that's why one must choose choose to stop them to reform them isn't that the choice biddy asked that's nick's she added blushing and looking at the personage are ah, our divergence yes mr nash sighed there are all kinds of machinery for that very complicated and ingenious your formulas my dear dormer your formulas hang them i haven't got any nick now bravely declared to me personally the simplest ways are those that appeal most mr nash went on we pay too much attention to the ugly we notice it we magnify it the great thing is to leave it alone and encourage the beautiful you must be very sure you get hold of the beautiful said nick ah precisely and that's just the importance of the faculty of appreciation we must train our special sense it's capable of extraordinary extension life's none too long for that but what's the good of the extraordinary extension if there's no affirmation of it if it all goes to the negative as you say where are the fine consequences dormer asked in my own spirit one is one's self a fine consequence that's the most important one we have to do with i am a fine consequence said gabriel nash biddy rose from the bench at this and stepped away a little as to look at a piece of statuary but she had not gone far before pausing and turning she bent her eyes on the speaker with a heightened colour an air of desperation and the question after a moment are you then an aesthete ah there's one of the formulas that's walking in one's hat i have no profession my dear young lady i have no etat civil these things are a part of the complicated ingenious machinery as i say i keep to the simplest way i find that gives one enough to do merely to be is such a metier to live such an art to fill such a career bridget dorma turned her back and examined her statue and her brother said to his old friend and to write to write oh i shall never do it again 
you've done it almost well enough to be inconsistent that book of yours is anything but negative it's complicated and ingenious my dear fellow i'm extremely ashamed of that book said gabriel nash ah call yourself a bloated buddhist and have done with it his companion exclaimed have done with it i haven't the least desire to have done with it and why should one call oneself anything one deprives other people of their dearest occupation let me add that you don't begin to have an insight into the art of life till it ceases to be of the smallest consequence to you what you may be called that's rudimentary but if you go in for shades you must also go in for names you must distinguish nick objected he observes nothing without his categories his types and varieties ah trust him to distinguish said gabriel nash sweetly that's for his own convenience he has privately a terminology to meet it that's one style but from the moment it's for the convenience of others the signs have to be grosser the shades begin to go that's a deplorable hour literature you see is for the convenience of others it requires the most abject concessions it played such mischief with one's style that really i've had to give it up and politics nick asked well what about them was mr nash's reply with a special cadence as he watched his friend's sister who was still examining her statue biddy was divided between irritation and curiosity she had interposed space but she had not gone beyond earshot nick's question made her curiosity throb as a rejoinder to his friend's words that no doubt you will say is still far more for the convenience of others is still worse for one's style biddy turned round in time to hear mr nash answer it has simply nothing in life to do with shades i can't say worse for it than that biddy stepped nearer at this and drew still further on her courage won't mamma be waiting oughtn't we to go to luncheon both this young man looked up at her and mr nash broke out you ought to protest you ought to save him to save him biddy echoed he had a style upon my word he had but i've seen it go i've read his speeches you were capable of that nick laughed for you yes but it was like listening to a nightingale in a brass band i think they were beautiful biddy declared her brother got up at this tribute and mr nash rising too said with his bright colloquial air but miss dorma he had eyes he was made to see to see all over to see everything there's so few like that i think he still sees biddy returned wondering a little why nick didn't defend himself he sees his side his dreadful side dear young lady poor man fancy your having a side you you and spending your days and your nights looking at it i'd as soon pass my life looking at an advertisement on a hoarding you don't see me some day a great statesman said nick my dear fellow it's exactly what i have a terror of mercy don't you admire them biddy cried it's a trade like another and a method of making one's way which society certainly condones but when one can be something better why what in the world is better biddy asked the young man gasped and nick replying for him said gabriel nash is better you must come and lunch with us i must keep you i must he added we shall save him yet mr nash kept on easily to biddy while they went and the girl wondered still more what her mother would make of him end of chapter two
Chapter Three of the Tragic Muse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragic Muse by Henry James. Chapter Three. After her companions left her, Lady Agnes rested for five minutes in silence with her elder daughter. At the end of which time she observed i suppose one must have food at any rate and getting up quitted the place where they had been sitting and where are we to go i hate eating out of doors she went on dear me when one comes to paris grace returned in a tone apparently implying that in so rash an adventure one must be prepared for compromises and concessions the two ladies wandered to where they saw a large sign of buffet suspended in the air entering a precinct reserved for little white clothed tables straw-covered chairs and long aproned waiters one of these functionaries approached them with eagerness and with a madame son seul receiving in return from her ladyship the slightly snappish announcement non nous sommes beaucoup he introduced them to a table larger than most of the others and under his protection they took their places at it and began rather languidly and vaguely to consider the question of the repast the waiter had placed a carte in lady agnes's hands and she studied it through her eyeglass with a failure of interest while he enumerated with professional fluency the resources of the establishment and grace watched the people at the other tables she was hungry and had already broken a morsel from a long glazed roll not cold beef and pickles you know she observed to her mother lady agnes gave no heed to this profane remark but dropped her eyeglass and laid down the greasy document what does it signify i dare say it's all nasty grace continued and she added inconsequently if peter comes he is sure to be particular let him first be particular to come her ladyship exclaimed turning a cold eye upon the waiter poulet chasseur filet mignon sauce béanaise the man suggested you'll give us what i tell you said lady agnes and she mentioned with distinctness and authority the dishes of which she desired that the meal should be composed he interjected three or four more suggestions but as they produced absolutely no impression on her he became silent and submissive doing justice apparently to her ideas for lady agnes had ideas and though it had suited her humour ten minutes before to profess herself helpless in such a case the manner in which she imposed them on the waiter as original practical and economical showed the high executive woman the mother of children the daughter of earls the consort of an official the dispenser of hospitality looking back upon a lifetime of luncheons she carried many cares and the feeding of multitudes she was honourably conscious of having fed them decently as she had always done everything had ever been one of them everything is absurdly dear she remarked to her daughter as the waiter went away to this remark grace made no answer she had been used for a long time back to hearing that everything was very dear it was what one always expected so she found the case herself but she was silent and inventive about it and nothing further passed in the way of conversation with her mother while they waited for the latter's orders to be executed till lady agnes reflected audibly he makes me unhappy the way he talks about julia sometimes i think he does it to torment one one can't mention her grace responded it's better not to mention her but to leave it alone yet he never mentions her of himself in some cases 
that's supposed to show that people like people though of course something more's required to prove it lady agnes continued to meditate sometimes i think he's thinking of her then at others i can't fancy what he's thinking of it would be awfully suitable said grace biting her roll her companion had a pause as if looking for some higher ground to put it upon then she appeared to find this loftier level in the observation of course he must like her he has known her always nothing can be plainer than that she likes him grace opined poor julia lady agnes almost wailed and her tone suggested that she knew more about that than she was ready to state it isn't as if she wasn't clever and well-read her daughter went on if there were nothing else there would be a reason in her being so interested in politics in everything that he is ah what nick is that's what i sometimes wonder grace eyed her parent in some despair why mother isn't he going to be like papa she waited for an answer that didn't come after which she pursued i thought you thought him so like him already well i don't said lady agnes quietly who is then certainly percy isn't lady agnes was silent a space there's no one like your father dear papa grace handsomely concurred then with a rapid transition it would be so jolly for all of us she'd be so nice to us she's that already in her way said lady agnes conscientiously having followed the return quick as it was much good does it do her and she reproduced the note of her bitterness of a moment before it does her some good that one should look out for her i do and i think she knows it grace declared one can at any rate keep other women off don't meddle you are very clumsy was her mother's not particularly sympathetic rejoinder there are other women who are beautiful and there are others who are clever and rich yes but not all in one that's what's so nice in julia her fortune would be thrown in he wouldn't appear to have married her for it if he does he won't said lady agnes a trifle obscurely yes that's what's so charming and he could do anything then couldn't he well your father had no fortune to speak of yes but didn't uncle percy help him his wife helped him said lady agnes dear mamma the girl was prompt there's one thing she added that mr carteret will always help nick what do you mean by always why whether he marries julia or not things aren't so easy lady agnes judged it will all depend on nick's behavior he can stop it tomorrow grace dormer stared she evidently thought mr cateret's beneficence a part of the scheme of nature how could he stop it by not being serious it isn't so hard to prevent people giving you money serious grace repeated does he want him to be a prig like lord egbert yes that's exactly what he wants and what he'll do for him he'll do for him only if he marries julia has he told you grace inquired and then before her mother could answer i'm delighted at that she cried he hasn't told me but that's the way things happen lady agnes was less optimistic than her daughter and such optimism as she cultivated was a thin tissue with the sense of things as they are showing through if nick becomes rich charles carteret will make him more so if he doesn't he won't give him a shilling oh mamma grace demurred it's all very well to say that in public life money isn't as necessary as it used to be her ladyship went on broodingly those who say so don't know anything about it it's always intensely necessary her daughter visibly affected by the gloom of her manner felt impelled to evoke as a corrective a more cheerful idea i dare say 
but there's the fact isn't there that poor papa had so little yes and there's the fact that it killed him these words came out with a strange quick little flare of passion they startled grace dormer who jumped in her place and gasped oh mother the next instant however she added in a different voice oh peter for with an air of eagerness a gentleman was walking up to them how do you do cousin agnes how do you do little grace peter sheringham laughed and shook hands with them and three minutes later was settled in his chair at their table on which the first elements of the meal had been placed explanations on one side and the other were demanded and produced from which it appeared that the two parties had been in some degree at cross purposes the day before lady agnes and her companions travelled to paris sheringham had gone to london for forty-eight hours on private business of the ambassadors arriving on his return by the night train only early that morning there had accordingly been a delay in his receiving nick stormer's two notes if nick had come to the embassy in person he might have done him the honour to call he would have learned that the second secretary was absent lady agnes was not altogether successful in assigning a motive to her son's neglect of this courteous form she could but say i expected him i wanted him to go and indeed not hearing from you he would have gone immediately an hour or two hence on leaving this place but we're here so quietly not to go out not to seem to appeal to the ambassador nick put it so oh mother we'll keep out of it a friendly note would do i don't know definitely what he wanted to keep out of unless anything like gaiety the embassy isn't gay i know but i'm sure his note was friendly wasn't it i dare say you'll see for yourself he's different directly he gets abroad he doesn't seem to care lady agnes paused a moment not carrying out this particular elucidation then she resumed he said you'd have seen julia and that you'd understand everything from her and when i asked how she'd know he said oh she knows everything he never said a word to me about julia peter sheringham returned lady agnes and her daughter exchanged a glance at this the latter had already asked three times where julia was and her ladyship dropped that they had been hoping she would be able to come with peter the young man set forth that she was at the moment at an hotel in the rue de la paix but had only been there since that morning he had seen her before proceeding to the champs elysees she had come up to paris by an early train she had been staying at versailles of all places in the world she had been a week in paris on her return from cannes her stay there had been of nearly a month fancy and then had gone out to versailles to see mrs billinghurst perhaps they'd remember her poor dallow's sister she was staying there to teach her daughters french she had a dozen or two and julia had spent three days with her she was to return to england about the twenty-fifth it would make seven weeks she must have been away from town a rare thing for her she usually stuck to it so in summer three days with mrs billinghurst how very good-natured of her lady agnes commented oh they are very nice to her sheringham said well i hope so grace dormer exhaled why didn't you make her come here i proposed it but she wouldn't another eye beam at this passed between the two ladies and peter went on she said you must come and see her at the hotel de hollande of course we'll do that lady agnes declared nick went to ask about her at the westminster she gave that up they wouldn't give her the rooms she wanted her usual set she is delightfully particular grace said complacently 
then she added she does like pictures doesn't she peter sherringham stared oh i dare say but that's not what she has in her head this morning she has some news from london she's immensely excited what has she in her head lady agnes asked what's her news from london grace added she wants nick to stand nick to stand both ladies cried she undertakes to bring him in for harsh mr pinks is dead the fellow you know who got the seat at the general election he dropped down in london disease of the heart or something of that sort julia has her telegram but i see it was in last night's papers imagine nick never mentioned it said lady agnes don't you know mother abroad he only reads foreign papers oh i know i've no patience with him her ladyship continued dear julia it's a nasty little place and pinks had a tight squeeze one hundred and seven or something of that sort but if it returned a liberal a year ago very likely it will do so again julia at any rate believes it can be made to if the man's nick and is ready to take the order to put him in i'm sure if she can do it she will grace pronounced dear dear julia and nick can do something for himself said the mother of this candidate i've no doubt he can do anything peter sherringham returned good-naturedly then do you mean in expenses he inquired ah i'm afraid he can't do much in expenses poor dear boy and it's dreadful how little we can look to percy well i dare say you make look to julia i think that's her idea delightful julia lady agnes broke out if poor sir nicholas could have known of course he must go straight home she added he won't like that said grace then he will have to go without liking it it will rather spoil your little excursion if you've only just come peter suggested to say nothing of the great biddies if she is enjoying paris we may stay perhaps with julia to protect us said lady agnes ah she won't stay she'll go over for her man her man the fellow who stands whoever he is especially if he is nick these last words caused the eyes of peter sherringham's companions to meet again and he went on she will go straight down to harsh wonderful julia lady agnes panted of course nick must go straight there too well i suppose he must see first if they'll have him if they'll have him why how can he tell till he tries i mean the people at headquarters the fellows who arrange it lady agnes coloured a little my dear peter do you suppose there will be the least doubt of their having the son of his father of course it's a great name cousin agnes a very great name one of the greatest simply lady agnes smiled it's the best name in the world said grace more emphatically all the same it didn't prevent his losing his seat by half a dozen votes it was too odious her ladyship cried i remember i remember and in such a case as that why didn't they immediately put him in somewhere else how one sees you live abroad dear peter there happens to have been the most extraordinary lack of openings i never saw anything like it for a year they've had their hand on him keeping him all ready i dare say they've telegraphed him and he hasn't told you lady agnes faltered he's so very odd when he is abroad at home too he lets things go grace interposed he does so little takes no trouble her mother suffered this statement to pass unchallenged and she pursued philosophically i suppose it's because he knows he's so clever so he is dear old man but what does he do 
what has he been doing in a positive way he's been painting ah not seriously lady agnes protested that's the worst way said peter sherringham good things neither of the ladies made a direct response to this but lady agnes said he has spoken repeatedly they are always calling on him he speaks magnificently grace attested that's another of the things i lose living in far countries and he's doing the salon now with the great biddy just the things in this part i can't think what keeps him so long lady agnes groaned did you ever see such a dreadful place sherringham stared aren't the things good i had an idea good cried lady agnes they're too odious too wicked ah laughed peter that's what people fall into if they live abroad the french oughtn't to live abroad here they come grace announced at this point but they've got a strange man with them that's a bore when we want to talk lady agnes sighed peter got up in the spirit of welcome and stood a moment watching the others approach there will be no difficulty in talking to judge by the gentleman he dropped and while he remains so conspicuous our eyes may briefly rest on him he was middling high and was visibly a representative of the nervous rather than of the phlegmatic branch of his race he had an oval face fine firm features and a complexion that tended to be brown brown were his eyes and women thought them soft dark brown his hair in which the same critics sometimes regretted the absence of a little undulation it was perhaps to conceal this plainness that he wore it very short his teeth were white his moustache was pointed and so was the small beard that adorned the extremity of his chin his face expressed intelligence and was very much alive it had the further distinction that it often struck superficial observers with a certain foreignness of caste the deeper sort however usually felt it latently english enough there was an idea that having taken up the diplomatic career and gone to live in strange lands he cultivated the mask of an alien an italian or a spaniard of an alien in time even one of the wonderful ubiquitous diplomatic agents of the sixteenth century in fact none the less it would have been impossible to be more modern than peter sherringham more of one's class in one's country but this didn't prevent several stray persons bridget dormer for instance from admiring the hue of his cheek for its olive richness and its moustache and beard for their resemblance to those of charles i at the same time she rather jumbled her comparisons she thought he recalled a titan End of chapter three Chapter Four of The Tragic Muse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Tragic Muse by Henry James. Chapter Four. Peter's meeting with Nick was of the friendliest on both sides, involving a great many dear fellows and old boys and his salutation to the younger of the miss dormers consisted of the frankest delighted to see you my dear bid there was no kissing but there was cousinship in the air of a conscious living kind as gabriel nash doubtless quickly noted hovering for a moment outside the group biddy said nothing to peter sherringham but there was no flatness in a silence which heaved as it were with the fairest physiognomic portents nick introduced gabriel nash to his mother and to the other two as a delightful old friend whom he had just come across and sherringham acknowledged the act by saying to mr nash but as if rather less for his sake than for that of the presenter 
I've seen you very often before. Ah, repetition, recurrence. We haven't yet, in the study of how to live, abolished that clumsiness, have we? Mr. Nash genially inquired. It's a poverty in the subnumeraries of our stage that we don't pass once for all, but come round and cross again, like a procession or an army at the theatre. It's a sordid economy that ought to have been managed better. The right thing would be just one appearance, and the procession, regardless of expense, forever and forever different. The company was occupied in placing itself at table, so that the only disengaged attention for the moment was Grace's, to whom, as her eyes rested on him, the young man addressed these last words with a smile. Alas, it's a very shabby idea, isn't it? The world isn't got up regardless of expense. Grace looked quickly away from him and said to her brother, Nick, Mr. Pinks is dead. Mr. Pinks, asked Gabriel Nash, appearing to wonder where he should sit. The member for Harsh, and Julia wants you to stand, the girl went on. Mr. Pinks, the member for Harsh? What names, to be sure? Gabriel mused cheerfully, still unseated. Julia wants me? I'm much obliged to her, Nick absently said. Nash, please sit by my mother, with Peter on her other side. My dear, it isn't Julia, Lady Agnes spoke earnestly. Everyone wants you. Haven't you heard from your people? Didn't you know the seat was vacant? Nick was looking round the table to see what was on it. Upon my word, I don't remember. What else have you ordered, mother? There's some beef bras, my dear, and afterwards some jollantine. Here's a dish of eggs with asparagus tips. I advise you to go in for it, Nick, said Peter Sheringham, to whom the preparation in question was presented. Into the eggs with asparagus tips? Donnez men se vous plaît. My dear fellow, how can I stand? How can I sit? Where's the money to come from? The money? Why, from Jul— Grace began, but immediately caught her mother's eye. Poor Julia! How you do work her! Nick exclaimed. Nash, I recommend you the asparagus tips. Mother, he's my best friend. Do look after him. I've an impression I've breakfasted. I'm not sure, Nash smiled. With those beautiful ladies? Try again. You'll find out. The money can be managed. The expenses are very small, and the seat's certain, Lady Agnes pursued, not apparently heeding her son's injunction in respect to Nash. Rather, if Julia goes down, her elder daughter exclaimed. Perhaps Julia won't go down, Nick answered humorously. Biddy was seated next to Mr. Nash, so that she could take occasion to ask, Who are the beautiful ladies? as if she failed to recognize her brother's illusion. In reality, this was an innocent trick. She was more curious than she could have given a suitable reason for about the odd women from whom her neighbor had lately separated. Deluded, misguided, infatuated persons, Mr. Nash replied, understanding that she had asked for a description. Strange, eccentric, almost romantic types— predestined victims, simple-minded sacrificial lambs. This was copious, yet it was vague, so that Biddy could only respond, Oh, all that? But meanwhile, Peter Sheringham said to Nick, Julia's here, you know. You must go and see her. Nick looked at him an instant rather hard, as if to say, You too? But Peter's eyes appeared to answer, No, no, not I. Upon which his cousin rejoined, of course I'll go and see her. I'll go immediately. Please to thank her for thinking of me. Thinking of you? There are plenty to think of you, Lady Agnes said. There are sure to be telegrams at home. We must go back. We must go back. We must go back to England? Nick Dormer asked. And as his mother made no answer, he continued, Do you mean I must go to Harsh? Her ladyship evaded this question, inquiring of Mr. Nash, if he would have a morsel of fish. But her gain was small, for this gentleman, struck again by the unhappy name of the bereaved constituency, only broke out, Ah, what a place to represent! How can you? How can you? It's an excellent place, said Lady Agnes coldly. I imagine you've never been there. It's a very good place indeed. It belongs very largely to my cousin, Mrs. Dallow. 
Gabriel partook of the fish, listening with interest, but I thought we had no more pocket burrows. It's pockets we rather lack, so many of us. There are plenty of harshes, Nick Dormer observed. I don't know what you mean, Lady Agnes said to Nash, with considerable majesty. Peter Sherringham also addressed him with an, Oh, it's all right. They come down on you like a shot. And the young man continued ingenuously, Do you mean to say you've to pay money to get into that awful place? That it's not you who are paid? Into that awful place? Lady Agnes repeated blankly. Into the House of Commons, that you don't get a high salary? My dear Nash, you're delightful. Don't leave me, don't leave me, Nick cried, while his mother looked at him with an eye that demanded, Who in the world's this extraordinary person? What then did you think pocket burrows were? Peter Sherringham asked. Mr. Nash's facial radiance rested on him. Why, burrows that filled your pocket. To do that sort of thing without a bribe, Sass Trop Fort. He lives at Samarkand, Nick Dormer explained to his mother, who flushed perceptibly. What do you advise me? I'll do whatever you say, he went on to his old acquaintance. My dear, my dear, Lady Agnes pleaded. See Julia first, with all respect to Mr. Nash. She's of excellent counsel, said Peter Sherringham. Mr. Nash smiled across the table at his host. The lady first, the lady first. I've not a word to suggest as against any idea of hers. We mustn't sit here too long. There'll be so much to do, said Lady Agnes anxiously, perceiving a certain slowness in the service of the beef brice. Biddy had been up to this moment mainly occupied in looking, covertly and in snatches, at Peter Sherringham, as was perfectly lawful in a young lady with a handsome cousin whom she had not seen for more than a year but her sweet voice now took license to throw in the words we know what mr nash thinks of politics he told us just now he thinks them dreadful no not dreadful only inferior the personage impugned protested everything's relative inferior to what lady agnes demanded mr nash appeared to consider a moment to anything else that may be in question Nothing else is in question, said her ladyship, in a tone that would have been triumphant if it had not been so dry. Ah, then, and her neighbor shook his head sadly. He turned after this to Biddy. The ladies whom I was with just now, and in whom you were so good as to express an interest? Biddy gave a sign of assent, and he went on. They're persons theatrical, the younger ones trying to go upon the stage. And you are assisting her? Biddy inquired, pleased had guessed so nearly right. Not in the least. I'm rather choking her off. I consider it the lowest of the arts. Lower than politics? asked Peter Sherringham, who was listening to this. Dear, no, I won't say that. I think the Théâtre Francais a greater institution than the House of Commons. I agree with you there, laughed Sherringham, all the more that I don't consider the dramatic art a low one. It seems to me, on the contrary, to include all the others. Yes, that's a view. I think it's the view of my friends. Of your friends? Two ladies, old acquaintances, whom I met in Paris a week ago, and whom I've just been spending an hour with in this place. You should have seen them. They struck me very much, Biddy said to her cousin. I should like to see them if they really have anything to say to the theater. It can easily be managed. Do you believe in the theater? asked Gabriel Nash. Passionately, Sherringham confessed. Don't you? Before Nash had had time to answer, Biddy had interposed with a sigh. How I wish I could go, but in Paris I can't. I'll take you, Biddy. I vow I'll take you. But the plays, Peter, the girl objected. Mama says they're worse than the pictures. Oh, we'll arrange that. They shall do one at the Francais on purpose for a delightful little yearning English girl. Can you make them? I can make them do anything I choose. Ah, then it's the theater that believes in you, said Mr. Nash. It would be ungrateful if it didn't after all I've done for it, Sherringham gaily opined. Lady Agnes had withdrawn herself from between him and her other guest, and, to signify that she at least had finished eating, had gone to sit by her son, 
whom she held with some importunity in conversation but hearing the theatre talked of she threw across an impersonal challenge to the paradoxical young man pray should you think it better for a gentleman to be an actor better than being a politician ah comedian for comedian isn't the actor more honest lady agnes turned to her son and brought forth with spirit think of your great father nicholas he was an honest man said nicholas that's perhaps why he couldn't stand it peter sherringham judged the colloquy to have taken an uncomfortable twist though not wholly as it seemed to him by the act of nick's queer comrade to draw it back to safer ground he said to this personage may i ask if the ladies you just spoke of are english mrs and miss ruth isn't that the rather odd name the very same only the daughter according to her kind desires to be known by some nom de guerre before she has even been able to enlist and what does she call herself bridget dormer asked maud vavasour or edith temple or gladys vane some rubbish of that sort then what is her own name miriam miriam ruth it would do very well and would give her the benefit of the prepossessing fact that to the best of my belief at least she's more than half a jewess it is as good as rachel felix sherringham said the names are good but not the talent the girl's splendidly stupid and more than half a jewess don't you believe it sherringham laughed don't believe she's a jewess biddy asked still more interested in miriam ruth no no that she's stupid really if she is she'll be the first ah you may judge for yourself nash rejoined if you'll come to-morrow afternoon to madame carre rue de constantinople ah la entresol madame carre why i've already a note from her i found it this morning on my return to paris asking me to look in at five o'clock and listen to a jeune anglaise that's my arrangement i obtained the favor the ladies want an opinion and dear old carre has consented to see them and to give one maud vavasour will recite and the venerable artist will pass judgment sherringham remembered he had his note in his pocket and took it out to look it over she wishes to make her a little audience she says she'll do better with that and she asks me because i'm english i shall make a point of going and bring dormer if you can the audience will be better will you come dormer mr nash continued appealing to his friend will you come with me to hear an english amateur recite and an old french actress pitch into her nick looked round from his talk with his mother and grace i'll go anywhere with you so that as i've told you i mayn't lose sight of you may keep hold of you poor mr nash why is he so useful lady agnes took a cold freedom to inquire he steadies me mother oh i wish you'd take me peter biddy broke out wistfully to her cousin to spend an hour with an old french actress do you want to go upon the stage the young man asked no but i want to see something to know something madame Corre's wonderful in her way but she's hardly company for a little english girl i'm not little i'm only too big and she goes the person you speak of for a professional purpose and with her good mother smiled mr nash i think lady agnes would hardly venture oh i've seen her good mother said biddy as if she had her impression of what the worth of that protection might be yes but you haven't heard her it's then that you measure her biddy was wistful still is it the famous honorine carré the great celebrity honorine in person the incomparable the perfect said peter sherringham the first artist of our time taking her altogether she and i are old pals she has been so good as to come and say things which she does sometimes still dans le monde as no one else can in my rooms make her come then we can go there one of these days and the young lady miriam maud gladys make her come too sherringham looked at nash and the latter was bland oh you'll have no difficulty she'll jump at it very good i'll give a little artistic tea with julia too of course and you must come mr nash this gentleman promised with an inclination and peter continued 
But if, as you say, you're not for helping the young lady, how came you to arrange this interview with the great model? Precisely to stop her short. The great model will find her very bad. Her judgments, as you probably know, are radamanthine. Unfortunate creature, said Biddy. I think you're cruel. Never mind. I'll look after them, Sheringham laughed. And how can Madame Carré judge if the girl recites English? She's so intelligent that she could judge if she recited Chinese, Peter declared. That's true, but the June Anglaise recites also in French, said Gabriel Nash. Then she isn't stupid, and in Italian, and in several more tongues, for aught I know. Sheringham was visibly interested. Very good, we'll put her through them all. She must be most clever, Biddy went on yearningly. She has spent her life on the continent. She has wandered about with her mother. She has picked up things. And is she a lady? Biddy asked. Oh, tremendous! The great ones of the earth on the mother's side. On the father's, on the other hand, I imagine, only a Jew stockbroker in the city. Then they're rich, or ought to be, Sheringham suggested. Ought to be? Ah, there's the bitterness. The stockbroker had too short a go. He was carried off in his flower. However, he left his wife a certain property, which she appears to have muddled away, not having the safeguard of being herself a Hebrew. This is what she has lived on till today, this and another resource. Her husband, as she has often told me, had the artistic temperament. That's common, as you know, among ses messieurs. He made the most of his little opportunities and collected various pictures, tapestries, enamels, porcelains, and similar gugas. He parted with them also, I gather, at a profit. In short, he carried on a neat little business as a brocanteur. It was nipped in the bud, but Mrs. Ruth was left with a certain number of these articles in her hands. Indeed, they must have formed her only capital. She was not a woman of business. She turned them, no doubt, to indifferent account, but she sold them piece by piece, and they kept her going while her daughter grew up. It was to this precarious traffic, conducted with extraordinary mystery and delicacy, that five years ago, in Florence, I was indebted for my acquaintance with her. In those days I used to collect, heaven help me, I used to pick up rubbish, which I could ill afford. It was a little phase, we have our little phases, haven't we? Mr. Nash asked with childlike trust, and I've come out on the other side. Mrs. Ruth had an old green pot, and I heard of her old green pot. To hear of it was to long for it, so that I went to see it under cover of night. I bought it, and a couple of years ago I overturned and smashed it. It was the last of the little phase. It was not, however, as you've seen, the last of Mrs. Ruth. I met her afterwards in London, and I found her a year or two ago in Venice. She appears to be a great wanderer. She had other old pots of other colors, red, yellow, black, or blue. She could produce them of any complexion you like. I don't know whether she carried them about with her, or whether she had little secret stores in the principal cities of Europe. Today, at any rate, they seem all gone. On the other hand, she has her daughter, who has grown up and who's a precious vase of another kind, less fragile, I hope, than the rest. May she not be overturned and smashed. Peter Sheringham and Biddy Dormer listened with attention to this history, and the girl testified to the interest with which she had followed it by saying, when Mr. Nash had ceased speaking, a Jewish stockbroker, a dealer in curiosities, what an odd person to marry for a person who was well born. I dare say he was a German. His name must have been simply Roth, and the poor lady, to smarten it up, has put in another O, Sheringham ingeniously suggested. You're both very clever, said Gabriel, and Rudolf Roth, as I happen to know, was indeed the designation of Maud Vavasor's papa. But so far as the question of derogation goes, one might as well drown as starve, for what connection is not a misalliance when one happens to have the unaccommodating, the crushing honor of being a Neville Nugent of Castle Nugent. That's the high lineage of Maud's mamma. I seem to have heard it mentioned that Rudolf Roth was very versatile, and, like most of his species, not unacquainted with the practice of music. He had been employed to teach the harmonium 
to Miss Neville Nugent, and she had profited by his lessons. If his daughter liked him, and she's not like her mother, he was darkly and dangerously handsome, so I venture rapidly to reconstruct the situation. A silence for the moment had fallen on Lady Agnes and her other two children, so that Mr. Nash, with his universal urbanity, practically addressed these last remarks to them, as well as to his other auditors. Lady Agnes looked as if she wondered whom he was talking about, and having caught the name of a noble residence, she inquired, "'Castle Nugent? Where in the world's that?' "'It's a domain of immeasurable extent and almost inconceivable splendor, but I fear not to be found in any prosaic earthly geography.' Lady Agnes rested her eyes on the tablecloth, as if she weren't sure a liberty had not been taken with her, or at least with her order, and while Mr. Nash continued to abound in descriptive suppositions, it must be on the banks of the Manzanares or the Guadalquivir, Peter Sherringham, whose imagination had seemingly been kindled by the sketch of Miriam Ruth, took up the argument and reminded him that he had a short time before assigned a low place to the dramatic art, and had not yet answered the question as to whether he believed in the theatre, which gave the speaker a further chance. I don't know that I understand your question. There are different ways of taking it. Do I think it's important? Is that what you mean? Important certainly to managers and stage carpenters who want to make money, to ladies and gentlemen who want to produce themselves in public by limelight, and to other ladies and gentlemen who are bored and stupid and don't know what to do with their evening. It's a commercial and social convenience, which may be infinitely worked, but important artistically, intellectually, how can it be so poor, so limited a form? Upon my honor it strikes me as rich and various. Do you think it's a poor and limited form, Nick? Sheringham added, appealing to his kinsman. I think whatever Nash thinks, I've no opinion today but his. This answer of the hope of the dormers drew the eyes of his mother and sisters to him, and caused his friend to exclaim that he wasn't used to such responsibilities. So few people had ever tested his presence of mind by agreeing with him. Oh, I used to be of your way of feeling, Nash went on to Sheringham. I understand you perfectly. It's a phase like another. I've been through it. J'ai et comme ça. And you went then very often to the Théâtre Francais, and it was there I saw you. I place you now. I'm afraid I noticed none of the other spectators, Nash explained. I had no attention but for the great Carré. She was still on the stage. Judge of my infatuation and how I can allow for yours when I tell you that I sought her acquaintance, that I couldn't rest till I had told her how I hung upon her lips. It's just what I told her, Sheringham returned. She was very kind to me. She said, Vos me rendez de force. That's just what she said to me. And we've remained very good friends. So have we, laughed Sheringham. And such perfect art as hers. Do you mean to say you don't consider that important? Such a rare dramatic intelligence? I'm afraid you read the Fuiltons. You catch their phrases. Nash spoke with pity. Dramatic intelligence is never rare. Nothing's more common. Then why have we so many shocking actors? Have we? I thought they were mostly good, succeeding more easily and more completely in that business than in anything else. What could they do? Those people generally, if they didn't do that poor thing, and reflect that the poor thing enables them to succeed. Of course, always, there are numbers of people on the stage who are no actors at all, for it's even easier to our poor humanity to be ineffectively stupid and vulgar than to bring down the house. It's not easy, by what I can see, to produce completely any artistic effect, Sheringham declared, and those the actor produces are among the most momentous we know. You'll not persuade me that to watch such an actress as Madame Carré isn't an education of the taste an enlargement of one's knowledge. She did what she could, poor woman, but in what belittling, coarsening conditions. She had to interpret a character in a play, and a character in a play, not to say the whole piece. I speak more particularly of modern pieces, is such a wretchedly small peg to hang anything on. 
the dramatist shows us so little, is so hampered by his audience, is restricted to so poor an analysis. I know the complaint. It's all the fashion now. The raffines despise the theatre, said Peter Sherringham in the manner of a man abreast with the culture of his age, and not to be captured by a surprise. Canu, canu. It will be known better yet, won't it, when the essentially brutal nature of the modern audience is still more perceived, when it has been properly analyzed. The ominium gatherum of the population of a big commercial city, at the hour of the day when their taste is at its lowest, flocking out of hideous hotels and restaurants, gorged with food, stultified with buying and selling, and with all the other sordid preoccupations of the age, squeezed together in a sweltering mass, disappointed in their seats, timing the author, timing the actor, wishing to get their money back on the spot, all before eleven o'clock. Fancy putting the exquisite before a tribunal such as that. There's not even a question of it. The dramatist wouldn't if he could, and in nine cases out of ten, he couldn't if he would. He has to make the basest concessions. One of his principal canons is that he must enable his spectators to catch the suburban trains which stop at 11.30. What would you think of any other artist, the painter or the novelist, whose governing forces should be the dinner and the suburban trains? The old dramatists didn't defer to them, not so much at least, and that's why they're less and less actable. If they're touched, the large loose men, it's only to be mutilated and trivialized. Besides, they had a simpler civilization to represent, societies in which the life of man was in action, in passion, in immediate and violent expression. Those things could be put upon the playhouse boards with comparatively little sacrifice of their completeness and their truth. Today, we're so infinitely more reflective and complicated and diffuse that it makes all the difference. What can you do with a character, with an idea, with a feeling, between dinner and the suburban trains. You can give a gross, rough sketch of them, but how little you touch them, how bald you leave them, what crudity compared with what the novelist does. Do you write novels, Mr. Nash? Peter candidly asked. No, but I read them when they're extraordinarily good, and I don't go to plays. I read Balzac, for instance, and I encounter the admirable portrait of Valerie Marneff, in La Cassine Betty, and you contrast it with the poverty of Emile Auger's Seraphine in Les Lioness Pauvre? I was awaiting you there. That's the cheval de bataille of you fellows. What an extraordinary discussion! What dreadful authors! Lady Agnes murmured to her son, but he was listening so attentively to the other young men that he made no response, and Peter Sherringham went on. I've seen Madame Carré in things of the modern repertory, which she has made as vivid to me, caused to abide as ineffably in my memory as Valérie Marneff. She's the Balzac, as one may say, of actresses. The miniaturist, as it were, of whitewashers, Nash offered as a substitute. It might have been guessed that Sherringham resented his damned freedom, yet could but emulate his easy form. You'd be magnanimous if you thought the young lady you've introduced to your old friend would be important. Mr. Nash lightly weighed it. She might be much more so than she ever will be. Lady Agnes, however, got up to terminate the scene, and even to signify that enough had been said about people and questions she had never so much as heard of. Everyone else rose, the waiter brought Nicholas the receipt of the bill, and Sherringham went on, to his interlocutor. Perhaps she'll be more so than you think. Perhaps, if you take an interest in her. A mystic voice seems to exhort me to do so, to whisper that though I've never seen her, I shall find something in her. On which Peter appealed. What do you say, Biddy? Shall I take an interest in her? The girl faltered, colored a little, felt a certain embarrassment in being publicly treated as an oracle. If she's not nice, I don't advise it. And if she is nice? You advise it still less, her brother exclaimed, laughing and putting his arm round her. Lady Agnes looked somber. 
she might have been saying to herself, Heaven help us, what chance has a girl of mine with a man who's so agog about actresses? She was disconcerted and distressed. A multitude of incongruous things, all the morning, had been forced upon her attention. Displeasing pictures and still more displeasing theories about them, vague portents of perversity on Nick's part, and a strange eagerness on Peter's, learned apparently in Paris, to discuss, with a person who had a tone she never had been exposed to, topics irrelevant and uninteresting, almost disgusting, the practical effect of which was to make light of her presence. Let us leave this, let us leave this, she grimly said. The party moved together toward the door of departure, and her ruffled spirit was not soothed, by hearing her son remark to his terrible friend, "'You know you don't escape me. I stick to you.' At this Lady Agnes broke out and interposed, "'Pardon my reminding you that you're going to call on Julia.' "'Well, can't Nash also come to call on Julia? That's just what I want, that she should see him.' Peter Sheringham came humanely to his kinswoman's assistance. "'A better way, perhaps, will be for them to meet under my auspices at my dramatic tea. This will enable me to return one favor for another. If Mr. Nash is so good as to introduce me to this aspirant for honors, we estimate so differently, I'll introduce him to my sister, a much more positive quantity. It's easy to see who'll have the best of it, Grace Dormer declared, while Nash stood there serenely, impartially, in a graceful, detached way, which seemed characteristic of him assenting to any decision that relieved him of the grossness of choice and generally confident that things would turn out well for him he was cheerfully helpless and sociably indifferent ready to preside with a smile even at the discussion of his own admissibility nick will bring you i've a little corner at the embassy sheringham continued you're very kind you must bring him then tomorrow rue de constantinople at five o'clock don't be afraid. Oh, dear, Biddy wailed as they went on again, and Lady Agnes, seizing his arm, marched off more quickly with her son. When they came out into the champ Elysee, Nick Dormer, looking round, saw his friend had disappeared. Biddy had attached herself to Peter, and Grace couldn't have encouraged Mr. Nash. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Tragic Muse》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Tragic Muse》by Henry James, Chapter Five. Lady Agnes's idea had been that her son should go straight from the Palais de l'Industrie to the Hotel de Hollande with or without his mother and his sisters as his humour should seem to recommend much as she desired to see their valued julia and as she knew her daughters desired it she was quite ready to put off their visit if this sacrifice should contribute to a speedy confrontation for nick she was anxious he should talk with mrs dallow and anxious he should be anxious himself but it presently appeared that he was conscious of no pressure of eagerness his view was that she and the girls should go to their cousin without delay and should if they liked spend the rest of the day in her society he would go later he would go in the evening there were lots of things he wanted to do meanwhile this question was discussed with some intensity though not at length while the little party stood on the edge of the place de la concorde to which they had proceeded on foot and lady agnes noticed that the lots of things to which he proposed to give precedence over an urgent duty a conference with a person who held out full hands to him were implied somehow in the friendly glance with which he covered the great square the opposite bank of the seine the steep blue roofs of the quay, the bright immensity of Paris. What in the world could be more important than making sure of his seat? 
so quickly did the good lady's imagination travel and now that idea appealed to him less than a ramble in search of old books and prints since she was sure this was what he had in his head julia would be flattered should she know it but of course she mustn't know it lady agnes was already thinking of the least injurious account she could give of the young man's want of precipitation she would have liked to represent him as tremendously occupied in his room at their own hotel in getting off political letters to every one it should concern and particularly in drawing up his address to the electors of harsh fortunately she was a woman of innumerable discretions and a part of the worn look that sat in her face came from her having schooled herself for years in commerce with her husband and her sons not to insist unduly she would have liked to insist nature had formed her to insist and the self-control had told in more ways than one even now it was powerless to prevent her suggesting that before doing anything else nick should at least repair to the inn and see if there weren't some telegrams he freely consented to do as much as this and having called a cab that she might go her way with the girls kissed her again as he had done at the exhibition this was an attention that could never displease her but somehow when he kissed her she was really the more worried she had come to recognize it as a sign that he was slipping away from her and she wished she might frankly take it as his clutch at her to save him she drove off with a vague sense that at any rate she and the girls might do something toward keeping the place warm for him she had been a little vexed that peter had not administered more of a push toward the hotel de hollande clear as it had become to her now that there was a foreignness in peter which was not to be counted on and which made him speak of english affairs and even of english domestic politics as local and even funny they were very grandly local and if one recalled in public life an occasional droll incident wasn't that liberally viewed just the warm human comfort of them as she left the two young men standing together in the middle of the place de la concorde the grand composition of which nick as she looked back appeared to have paused to admire as if he hadn't seen it a thousand times she wished she might have thought of peter's inference with her son as exerted a little more in favour of localism she had a fear he wouldn't abbreviate the boy's ill-timed flanerie however he had been very nice he had invited them all to dine with him that evening at a convenient cafe promising to bring julia and one of his colleagues so much as this he had been willing to do to make sure nick and his sister should meet his want of localism moreover was not so great as that if it should turn out that there was anything beneath his manner toward biddy the upshot of this reflection might have been represented by the circumstance of her ladyship's remarking after a minute to her younger daughter who sat opposite her in the voiture de place that it would do no harm if she should get a new hat and that the search might be instituted that afternoon a french hat mamma said grace oh do wait till she gets home i think they are really prettier here you know biddy opined and lady agnes said simply i dare say they are cheaper what was in her mind in fact was i dare say peter thinks them becoming it will be seen she had plenty of inward occupation the sum of which was not lessened by her learning when she reached the top of the rue de la paix that mrs dallow had gone out half an hour before and had left no message she was more disconcerted by this incident than she could have explained or than she thought was right as she had taken for granted julia would be in a manner waiting for them 
how could she be sure nick wasn't coming when people were in paris a few days they didn't mope in the house but she might have waited a little longer or have left an explanation was she then not so much in earnest about nick's standing didn't she recognize the importance of being there to see him about it lady agnes wondered if her behavior were a sign of her being already tired of the way this young gentleman treated her perhaps she had gone out because an instinct told her that the great propriety of their meeting early would make no difference with him told her he wouldn't after all come his mother's heart sank as she glanced at this possibility that their precious friend was already tired she hadn't on her side an intuition that there were still harder things in store she had disliked having to tell mrs dallow that nick wouldn't see her till the evening but now she disliked still more her not being there to hear it she even resented a little her kinswoman's not having reasoned that she and the girls would come in any event and not thought them worth staying in for it came up indeed that she would perhaps have gone to their hotel which was a good way up the rue de rivoli near the palais royal on which the cabman was directed to drive to that establishment as he jogged along she took in some degree the measure of what that might mean julia's seeking a little to avoid them was she growing to dislike them did she think they kept too sharp an eye on her so that the idea of their standing in a still closer relation wouldn't be enticing her conduct up to this time had not worn such an appearance unless perhaps a little just a very little in the matter of her ways with poor grace lady agnes knew she wasn't particularly fond of poor grace and could even sufficiently guess the reason the manner in which grace betrayed most how they want to make sure of her she remembered how long the girl had stayed the last time she had been at harsh going for an acceptable week and dragging out her visit to a month she took a private heroic vow that grace shouldn't go near the place again for a year not that is unless nick and julia were married within the time if that were to happen she shouldn't care she recognized that it wasn't absolutely everything julia should be in love with nick it was also better she should dislike his mother and sisters after a probable pursuit of him than before lady agnes did justice to the natural rule in virtue of which it usually comes to pass that a woman doesn't get on with her husband's female belongings and was even willing to be sacrificed to it in her disciplined degree but she desired not to be sacrificed for nothing if she was to be objected to as a mother-in-law she wished to be the mother-in-law first at the hotel in the rue de rivoli she had the disappointment of finding that mrs dallow had not called and also that no telegrams had come she went in with the girls for half an hour and then straggled out with them again she was undetermined and dissatisfied and the afternoon was rather a problem of the kind moreover that she disliked most and was least accustomed to not a choice between different things to do her life had been full of that but a want of anything to do at all nick had said to her before they separated you can knock about with the girls you know everything's amusing here that was easily said while he sauntered and gossiped with peter sheringham and perhaps went to see more pictures like those in the salon he was usually on such occasions very good-natured about spending his time with them but this episode had taken altogether a perverse profane form she had no desire whatever to knock about and was far from finding everything in paris amusing she had no aptitude for aimlessness and moreover thought it vulgar if she had found julia's card at the hotel the sign of a hope of catching them 
just as they came back from the salon she would have made a second attempt to see her before the evening but now certainly they would leave her alone lady agnes wandered joylessly with the girls in the palais royal and the rue de richelieu and emerged upon the boulevard where they continued their frugal prowl as biddy rather irritatingly called it they went into five shops to buy a hat for biddy and her ladyship's presumptions of cheapness were woefully belied who in the world's your comic friend peter sheringham was meanwhile asking of his kinsman as they walked together ah there's something else you lost by going to cambridge you lost gabriel nash he sounds like an elizabethan dramatist sheringham said but i haven't lost him since it appears now i shan't be able to have you without him oh as for that wait a little i'm going to try him again but i don't know how he wears what i mean is that you've probably lost his freshness which was the great thing i rather fear he's becoming conventional or at any rate serious bless me do you call that serious he used to be so gay he had a real genius for playing with ideas he was a wonderful talker it seems to me he does very well now said peter sheringham oh this is nothing he had great flights of old very great flights one saw him rise and rise and turn somersaults in the blue one wondered how far he could go he is very intelligent and i should think it might be interesting to find out what it is that prevents the whole man from being as good as his parts i mean in case he isn't so good i see you more than suspect that mind it be simply that he's too great an ass that would be the whole i shall see in time but it certainly isn't one of the parts it may be the effect but it isn't the cause and it's for the cause i claim an interest do you think him an ass for what he said about the theatre he's pronouncing it a coarse art to differ from you about him that reason would do said sheringham the only bad one would be one that shouldn't preserve our difference you needn't tell me you agree with him for frankly i don't care then your passion still burns nick dormer asked my passion i don't mean for any individual exponent of the equivocal art mark the guilty conscience mark the rising blush mark the confusion of mind i mean the old sign one knew you best by your permanent stall at the francais your inveterate attendance at the premieres the way you follow the young talents and the old yes it's still my little hobby my little folly if you like sheringham said i don't find i get tired of it what will you have strong predilections are rather a blessing they are simplifying i'm fond of representation the representation of life i like it better i think than the real thing you like it too you'd be ready in other conditions to go in for it in your way so you have no right to cast the stone you like it best done by one vehicle and i by another and our preference on either side has a deep root in us there's a fascination to me in the way the actor does it when his talent ah he must have that has been highly trained ah it must be that the things he can do in this effort at representation with the dramatist to back him seem to me innumerable he can carry it to a point and i take great pleasure in observing them in recognizing and comparing them it's an amusement like another i don't pretend to call it by any exalted name but in this veil of friction it will serve one can lose oneself in it and it has the recommendation in common i suppose with the study of the other arts that the further you go in it the more you find so i go rather far if you will but is it the principal sign one knows me by peter abruptly asked 
don't be ashamed of it nick returned else it will be ashamed of you i ought to discriminate you are distinguished among my friends and relations by your character of rising young diplomatist but you know i always want the final touch to the picture the last fruit of analysis therefore i make out that you are conspicuous among rising young diplomatists for the infatuation you describe in such pretty terms you evidently believe it will prevent my ever rising very high but pastime for pastime is it any idler than yours than mine why you've half a dozen while i only allow myself the luxury of one for the theatre's my sole vice really is this more wanton say than to devote weeks to the consideration of the particular way in which your friend mr nash may be most intensely a twaddler and a bore that's not my ideal of choice recreation but i'd undertake to satisfy you about him sooner you are a young statesman who happens to be an on disponibility for the moment but you spend not a little of your time in besmearing canvas with bright-coloured pigments the idea of representation fascinates you but in your case is representation in oils or do you practise watercolours and pastel too you even go much further than i for i study my art of predilection only in the works of others i don't aspire to leave works of my own you are a painter possibly a great one but i'm not an actor nick dormer declared he would certainly become one he was so well on the way to it and sheringham without heeding this charge went on let me add that considering you are a painter your portrait of the complicated nash is lamentably dim he is not at all complicated it's only too simple to give an account of most people have a lot of attributes and appendages that dress him up and superscribe them and what i like gabriel for is that he hasn't any at all it makes him it keeps him so refreshingly cool by jove you match him there isn't it an appendage and an attribute to escape kicking how does he manage that sheringham asked i haven't the least idea i don't know that he doesn't rouse the kicking impulse besides he can kick back and i don't think any one has ever seen him duck or dodge his means his profession his belongings have never anything to do with the question he doesn't shade off into other people he's as neat as an outline cut out of paper with scissors i like him therefore because in dealing with him you know what you've got hold of with most men you don't to pick the flower you must break off the whole dusty thorny worldly branch you find you are taking up in your grasp all sorts of other people and things dangling accidents and conditions poor nash has none of those encumbrances he is the solitary fragrant blossom my dear fellow you'd be better for a little of the same pruning sheringham retorted and the young men continued their walk and their gossip jerking each other this way and that punching each other here and there with an amicable roughness consequent on their having been boys together intimacy had reigned of old between the little sheringhams and the little dormers united in the country by ease of neighbouring and by the fact that there was first cousinship not neglected among the parents lady agnes standing in this plastic relation to lady windrush the mother of peter and julia as well as of other daughters and of a maturer youth who was to inherit and who since then had inherited the ancient barony many things had altered later on but not the good reasons for not explaining one of our young men had gone to eton and the other to harrow 
the scattered school on the hill was the tradition of the dormers and the divergence had rather taken its course in university years bricket however had remained accessible to windrush and windrush to bricket to which estate percival dormer had now succeeded terminating the interchange a trifle rudely by letting out that pleasant white house in the midlands its expropriated inhabitants lady agnes and her daughters adored it to an american reputed rich who in the first flush of his sense of contrasts considered that for twelve hundred a year he got it at a bargain bricket had come to the late sir nicholas from his elder brother dying wifeless and childless the new baronet so different from his father though recalling at some points the uncle after whom he had been named that nick had to make it up by cultivating conformity roamed about the world taking shots which excited the enthusiasm of society when society heard of them at the few legitimate creatures of the chase the british rifle had up to that time spared lady agnes meanwhile settled with her girls in a gabled lattice house in a mentionable quarter though it still required a little explaining of the temperate zone of london it was not into her lap poor woman that the revenues of bracket were poured there was no dower house attached to that moderate property and the allowance with which the estate was charged on her ladyship's behalf was not an incitement to grandeur nick had a room under his mother's roof which he mainly used to dress for dinner when dining in calcutta gardens and he had kept on his chambers in the temple for to a young man in public life an independent address was indispensable moreover he was suspected of having a studio in an out-of-the-way district the indistinguishable parts of south kensington incongruous as such a retreat might seem in the case of a member of parliament it was an absurd place to see his constituents unless he wanted to paint their portraits a kind of representation with which they would scarce have been satisfied and in fact the only question of portraiture had been when the wives and daughters of several of them expressed a wish for the picture of their handsome young member nick had not offered to paint it himself and the studio was taken for granted rather than much looked into by the ladies in calcutta gardens to express a disposition to regard whims of this sort as extravagance pure and simple was known by them to be open to correction for they were not oblivious that mr carteret had humours which weighed against them in the shape of convenient checks nestling between the inside pages of legible letters of advice mr carteret was nick's providence just as nick was looked to in a general way to be that of his mother and sisters especially since it had become so plain that percy who was not subtly selfish would operate mainly with a six bore quite out of that sphere it was not for studios certainly that mr carteret sent cheques but they were an expression of general confidence in nick and a little expansion was natural to a young man enjoying such a luxury as that it was sufficiently felt in calcutta gardens that he could be looked to not to betray such confidence for mr carteret's behaviour could have no name at all unless one were prepared to call it encouraging he had never promised anything but he was one of the delightful persons with whom the redemption precedes or dispenses with the vow he had been an early and lifelong friend of the late right honourable gentleman a political follower a devoted admirer a staunch supporter in difficult hours he had never married espousing nothing more reproductive than sir nicholas's views he used to write letters to the times in favour of them and had so far as was known neither chick nor child 
nothing but an amiable little family of eccentricities the flower of which was his odd taste for living in a small steep clean country town all green gardens and red walls with a girdle of hedgerows all clustered about an immense brown old abbey when lady agnes's imagination rested upon the future of her second son she liked to remember that mr carteret had nothing to keep up the inference seemed so direct that he would keep up nick the most important event in the life of this young man had been incomparably his success under his father's eyes more than two years before in the sharp contest for crockhurst a victory which his consecrated name his extreme youth his ardour in the fray the marked personal sympathy of the party and the attention excited by the fresh cleverness of his speeches tinted with young idealism and yet sticking sufficiently to the question the burning question which has since burned out had made quite splendid there had been leaders in the newspapers about it half in compliment to her husband who was known to be failing so prematurely he was almost as young to die and to die famous for lady agnes regarded it as famous as his son had been to stand tributes the boy's mother religiously preserved cut out and tied together with a ribbon in the innermost drawer of a favourite cabinet but it had been a barren or almost a barren triumph for in the order of importance in nick's history another incident had run it as the phrase is very close nothing less than the quick dissolution of the parliament in which he was so manifestly destined to give symptoms of a future he had not recovered his seat at the general election for the second contest was even sharper than the first and the tories had put forward a loud vulgar rattling bullying money-spending man it was to a certain extent a comfort that poor sir nicholas who had been witness of the bright hour should have passed away before the darkness he died with all his hopes on his second son's head unconscious of near disappointment handing on the torch and the tradition after a long supreme interview with nick at which lady agnes had not been present but which she knew to have been a thorough paternal dedication an august communication of ideas on the highest national questions she had reason to believe he had touched on those of external as well as of domestic and of colonial policy leaving on the boy's nature and manner from that moment the most unmistakable traces if his tendency to reverie increased it was because he had so much to think over in what his pale father had said to him in the hushed dim chamber laying on him the great mission that death had cut short breathing into him with unforgettable solemnity the very accents sir nicholas's voice had been wonderful for richness that he was to sound again it was work cut out for a lifetime and that coordinating power in relation to detail which was one of the great characteristics of the lamented statesman's high distinction the most analytic of the weekly papers was always talking about it had enabled him to rescue the prospect from any shade of vagueness or of ambiguity five years before nick dormer went up to be questioned by the electors of crockhurst peter sheringham had appeared before a board of examiners who let him off much less easily though there were also some flattering prejudices in his favour such inferences being a part of the copious light unembarrassing baggage with which each of the young men began life peter passed however passed high and had his reward in prompt assignment to small subordinate diplomatic duties in germany since then he had had his professional adventures which need not arrest us insomuch as they had all paled in the light of his appointment 
nearly three years previous to the moment of our making his acquaintance to a secretaryship of embassy in paris he had done well and had gone fast and for the present could draw his breath at ease it pleased him better to remain in paris as a subordinate than to go to honduras as a principal and nick dormer had not put a false colour on the matter in speaking of his stall at the théâtre francais as a sedative to his ambition nix's inferiority in age to his cousin sat on him more lightly than when they had been in their teens and indeed no one can very well be much older than a young man who has figured for a year however imperceptibly in the house of commons separation and diversity had made them reciprocally strange enough to give a price to what they shared they were friends without being particular friends that further degree could always hang before them as a suitable but not oppressive contingency and they were both conscious that it was in their interest to keep certain differences to chaff each other about so possible was it that they might have quarrelled if they had had everything in common peter as being wide-minded was a little irritated to find his cousin always so intensely british while nick dormer made him the object of the same compassionate criticism recognized in him a rare knack with foreign tongues but reflected and even with extravagance declared that it was a pity to have gone so far from home only to remain so homely moreover nick had his ideas about the diplomatic mind finding in it for his own sympathy always the wrong turn dry narrow barren poor he pronounced it in familiar conversation with a clever secretary wanting in imagination in generosity in the finest perceptions and the highest courage this served as well as anything else to keep the peace between them it was a necessity of their friendly intercourse that they should scuffle a little and it scarcely mattered what they scuffled about nick dormer's express enjoyment of paris the shop windows on the quays the old books on the parapet the gaiety of the river the grandeur of the louvre every fine feature of that prodigious face struck his companion as a sign of insularity the appreciation of such things having become with sheringham an unconscious habit a contented assimilation if poor nick for the hour was demonstrative and lyrical it was because he had no other way of sounding the note of farewell to the independent life of which the term seemed now definitely in sight the sense so pressed upon him that these were the last moments of his freedom he would waste time till half-past seven because half-past seven meant dinner and dinner meant his mother solemnly attended by the strenuous shade of his father and reinforced by julia End of chapter five chapter six of the tragic muse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the tragic muse by henry james chapter six when he arrived with the three members of his family at the restaurant of their choice peter sheringham was already seated there by one of the immaculate tables but mrs dallow was not yet on the scene and they had time for a sociable settlement time to take their places and unfold their napkins crunch their rows breathe the savoury air and watch the door before the usual raising of heads and suspension of forks the sort of stir that accompanied most of this lady's movements announced her entrance the dame de comtois ducked and reducked the people looked round peter and nick got up there was a shuffling of chairs 
julia had come peter was relating how he had stopped at her hotel to bring her with him and had found her according to her custom by no means ready on which fearing his guests would arrive first at the rendezvous and find no proper welcome he had come off without her leaving her to follow he had not brought a friend as he intended having divined that julia would prefer a pure family party if she wanted to talk about her candidate now she stood looking down at the table and her expectant kinsfolk drawing off her gloves letting her brother draw off her jacket lifting her hands for some rearrangement of her hat she looked at nick last smiling but only for a moment she said to peter are we going to dine here oh dear why didn't you have a private room nick had not seen her at all for several weeks and had seen her but little for a year but her off-hand cursory manner had not altered in the interval she spoke remarkably fast as if speech were not in itself a pleasure to have it over as soon as possible and her brusquerie was of the dark shade friendly critics account for by pleading shyness shyness had never appeared to him an ultimate quality or a real explanation of anything it only explained an effect by another effect neither with a cause to boast of what he suspected in julia was that her mind was less pleasing than her person an ugly a really blighting idea which as yet he had but half accepted it was a case in which she was entitled to the benefit of every doubt and oughtn't to be judged without a complete trial nick meanwhile was afraid of the trial this was partly why he had been of late to see her so little because he was afraid of the sentence afraid of anything that might work to lessen the charm it was actually in the power of her beauty to shed there were people who thought her rude and he hated rude women if he should fasten on that view or rather if that view should fasten on him what could still please and what he admired in her would lose too much of its sweetness if it be thought odd that he had not yet been able to read the character of a woman he had known since childhood the answer is that this character had grown faster than nick's observation the growth was constant whereas the observation was but occasional though it had begun early if he had attempted inwardly to phrase the matter as he probably had not he might have pronounced the effect she produced upon him too much a compulsion not the coercion of design of importunity nor the vulgar pressure of family expectation a betrayed desire he should like her enough to marry her but a mixture of diverse urgent things of the sense that she was imperious and generous probably more the former than the latter and of a certain prevision of doom the inference of the idea that he should come to it that he was predestined this had made him shrink from knowing the worst about her not to wish to get used to it in time but what was more characteristic of him the wish to interpose a temporary illusion illusions and realities and hopes and fears however fell into confusion whenever he met her after a separation the separation so far as seeing her alone or as continuous talk was concerned had now been tolerably long had lasted really ever since his failure to regain his seat an impression had come to him that she judged that failure rather stiffly had thought and had somewhat sharply said that he ought to have done better this was a part of her imperious way and a part not all to be overlooked on a mere present basis if he were to marry her 
he should come to an understanding with her he should give her his own measure as well as take hers but the understanding might in the actual case suggest too much that he was to marry her you could quarrel with your wife because there were compensations for her but you mightn't be prepared to offer these compensations as prepayment for the luxury of quarrelling it was not that such a luxury wouldn't be considerable our young man none the less thought as julia dallow's fine head poised itself before him again a high spirit was of course better than a mawkish to be mismated with any day in the year she had much the same colour as her brother but as nothing else in her face was the same the resemblance was not striking her hair was of so dark a brown that it was commonly regarded as black and so abundant that a plain arrangement was required to keep it in natural relation to the rest of her person her eyes were of a grey sometimes pronounced too light and were not sunken in her face but placed well on the surface her nose was perfect but her mouth was too small and nick dormer and doubtless other persons as well had sometimes wondered how with such a mouth her face could have expressed decision her figure helped it for she appeared tall being extremely slender yet was not and her head took turns and positions which though a matter of but half an inch out of the common this way or that somehow contributed to the air of resolution and temper if it had not been for her extreme delicacy of line and surface she might have been called bold but as it was she looked refined and quiet refined by tradition and quiet for a purpose and altogether she was beautiful with the gravity of her elegant head her hair like the depths of darkness her eyes like its earlier clearing her mouth like a rare pink flower peter said he had not taken a private room because he knew biddy's tastes she liked to see the world she had told him so the curious people the coming and going of paris oh anything for biddy julia replied smiling at the girl and taking her place lady agnes and her elder daughter exchanged one of their looks and nick exclaimed jocosely that he didn't see why the whole party should be sacrificed to a presumptuous child the presumptuous child blushingly protested she had never expressed any such wish to peter upon which nick with broader humour revealed that peter had served them so out of stinginess he had pitchforked them together in the public room because he wouldn't go to the expense of a cabinet he had brought no guest no foreigner of distinction nor diplomatic swell to honour them and now they would see what a poultry dinner he would give them peter stabbed him indignantly with a long roll and lady agnes who seemed to be waiting for some manifestation on mrs dallow's part which didn't come concluded with a certain coldness that they quite sufficed to themselves for privacy as well as for society nick called attention to this fine phrase of his mother's and said it was awfully neat while grace and biddy looked harmoniously at julia's clothes nick felt nervous and joked a good deal to carry it off a levity that didn't prevent julia saying to him after a moment you might have come to see me to-day you know didn't you get my message from peter scold him julia scold him well i begged him to go said lady agnes and to this grace added her voice with an oh julia do give it to him these words however had not the effect they suggested since mrs dallow only threw off for answer in her quick curt way that that would be making far too much of him it was one of the things in her that nick mentally pronounced ungraceful 
the perversity of pride or of shyness that always made her disappoint you a little if she saw you expected a thing she snubbed effusiveness in a way that yet gave no interesting hint of any wish to keep it herself in reserve effusiveness however certainly was the last thing of which lady agnes would have consented to be accused and nick while he replied to julia that he was sure he shouldn't have found her was not unable to perceive the operation on his mother of that shade of manner he ought to have gone he owed you that she went on but it's very true he would have had the same luck as we i went with the girls directly after luncheon i suppose you got our card he might have come after i came in said mrs dallow dear julia i'm going to see you to-night i've been waiting for that nick returned of course we had no idea when you'd come in said lady agnes i'm so sorry you must come to-morrow i hate calls at night julia serenely added well then will you roam with me will you wander through paris on my arm nick asked smiling will you take a drive with me oh that would be perfection cried grace i thought we were all going somewhere to the hippodrome peter biddy said oh not all just you and me laughed peter i'm going home to my bed i've earned my rest lady agnes sighed can't peter take us demanded grace nick can take you home mamma if julia won't receive him and i can look perfectly after peter and biddy take them to something amusing please take them mrs dallow said to her brother her voice was kind but had the expectation of assent in it and nick observed both the good nature and the pressure you are tired poor dear she continued to lady agnes fancy you are being dragged about so what did you come over for my mother came because i brought her nick said it's i who have dragged her about i brought her for a little change i thought it would do her good i wanted to see the salon it isn't a bad time i've a carriage and you must use it you must use nothing else it shall take you everywhere i'll drive you about to-morrow julia dropped these words with all her air of being able rather than of wanting but nick had already noted and he noted now afresh and with pleasure that her lack of unction interfered not a bit with her always acting it was quite sufficiently manifest to him that for the rest of the time she might be near his mother she would do for her numberless good turns she would give things to the girls he had a private admiration of that expensive parisian perhaps not perfectly useful things lady agnes was a woman who measured outlays and returns but she was both too acute and too just not to recognize the scantest offer from which an advantage could proceed dear julia she exclaimed responsively and her tone made this brevity of acknowledgment adequate julia's own few words were all she wanted it's so interesting about harsh she added we're immensely excited yes nick looks it merci bas de vin it's just the thing for you you know julia said to him to be sure he knows it he's immensely grateful it's really very kind of you you do me a very great honour julia nick hastened to add don't be tiresome please that lady returned we'll talk about it later of course there are lots of points nick pursued at present let's be purely convivial somehow harsh is such a false note here nous causerons de ça my dear fellow you've caught exactly the tone of mr gabriel nash peter sheringham declared on this who is mr gabriel nash mrs dallow asked nick is he a gentleman 
biddy says so grace dormer interposed before this inquiry was answered it's to be supposed that any one nick brings to lunch with us lady agnes rather coldly sighed ah grace with your tremendous standard her son said while peter sherringham explained to his sister that mr nash was nick's new mentor or oracle whom moreover she should see if she would come and have tea with him i haven't the least desire to see him julia made answer any more than i have to talk about harsh and bore poor peter oh certainly dear you'd bore me her brother rang out one thing at a time then let us by all means be convivial only you must show me how mrs stello went on to nick what does he mean cousin agnes does he want us to drain the wine cup to flash with repartee you'll do very well said nick you are thoroughly charming tonight do go to peter's julia if you want something exciting you'll see a wonderful girl biddy broke in with her smile on peter wonderful for what for thinking she can act when she can't said the roguish biddy dear me what people you all know i hate peter's theatrical people and aren't you going home julia lady agnes inquired home to the hotel dear no too harsh to see about everything i'm in the midst of telegrams i don't know yet i suppose there's no doubt they'll have him lady agnes decided to pursue who'll have whom why the local people and the party managers i'm speaking of the question of my son's standing they'll have the person i want them to have i dare say there are so many people in it in one way or another it's dreadful i like the way you sit there julia went on to nick so do i he smiled back at her and he thought she was charming now because she was gay and easy and willing really though she might plead incompetence to understand how jocose a dinner in a pothouse in a foreign town might be she was in good humour or was going to be and not grand nor stiff nor indifferent nor haughty nor any of the things people who disliked her usually found her and sometimes even a little made him believe her the spirit of mirth in some cold natures manifests itself not altogether happily their effort of recreation resembles too much the bath of the hippopotamus but when mrs stello put her elbows on the table one felt she could be trusted to get them safely off again for a family in mourning the dinner was lively the more so that before it was half over julia had arranged that her brother eschewing the inferior spectacle should take the girls to the theatre francais it was her idea and nick had a chance to observe how an idea was apt to be not successfully controverted when it was julia's even the programme appeared to have been prearranged to suit it just the thing for the cheek of the young person in a full heure de rien and mademoiselle de la zeglia peter was all willingness but it was julia who settled it even to sending for the newspaper he was by a rare accident unconscious of the evening's bill and to reassuring biddy who was happy but anxious on the article of their being too late for good places peter could always get good places a word from him and the best box was at his disposal she made him write the word on a card and saw a messenger dispatched with it to the rue de richelieu and all this without loudness or insistence parenthetically and authoritatively the box was bespoken and the carriage as soon as they had had their coffee found to be in attendance peter drove off in it with the girls understanding that he was to send it back and nick waited for it over the finished repast with the two ladies 
after this his mother was escorted to it and conveyed to her apartments and all the while it had been julia who governed the succession of events do be nice to her lady agnes breathed to him as he placed her in the vehicle at the door of the cafe and he guessed it gave her a comfort to have left him sitting there with mrs dallow he had every disposition to be nice to his charming cousin if things went as she liked them it was the proof of a certain fine force in her the force of assuming they would julia had her differences some of them were much for the better and when she was in a mood like this evening's liberally dominant he was ready to encourage most of what she took for granted while they waited for the return of the carriage which had rolled away with his mother she sat opposite him with her elbows on the table playing first with one and then with another of the objects that encumbered it after five minutes of which she exclaimed oh i say we'll go and got up abruptly asking for her jacket he said something about the carriage and its order to come back for them and she replied well it can go away again i don't want a carriage she added i want to walk and in a moment she was out of the place with the people at the tables turning round again and the cassier swaying in her high seat on the pavement of the boulevard she looked up and down there were people at little tables by the door there were people all over the broad expanse of the asphalt there was a profusion of light and a pervasion of sound and everywhere though the establishment at which they had been dining was not in the thick of the fray the tokens of a great traffic of pleasure that night aspect of paris which represents it as a huge market for sensations beyond the boulevard des capucines it flared through the warm evening like a vast bazaar and opposite the cafe du rand the mud lane rose theatrical a high artful decor before the footlights of the rue royale where shall we go what shall we do mrs dallow asked looking at her companion and somewhat to his surprise as he had supposed she wanted but to go home anywhere you like it's so warm we might drive instead of going indoors we might go to the bois that would be agreeable yes but it wouldn't be walking however that doesn't matter it's mild enough for anything for sitting out like all these people and i've never walked in paris at night it would amuse me nick hesitated so it might but it isn't particularly recommended to ladies i don't care for that if it happens to suit me very well then we'll walk to the bastille if you like julia hesitated on her side still looking about it's too far i'm tired we'll sit here and she dropped beside an empty table on the terrace of monsieur durand this will do it's amusing enough and we can look at the mud lane that's respectable if we must have something we'll have a madere is that respectable not particularly so much the better what are those people having box couldn't we have box are they very low then i shall have one i've been so wonderfully good i've been staying at Vasseilles. je me dois bien cela she insisted but pronounced the thin liquid in a tall glass very disgusting when it was brought nick was amazed reflecting that it was not for such a discussion as this that his mother had left him with hands in his pockets he had been looking out but as his eloquence flowed faster he turned to his friend who had dropped upon a sofa with her face to the window she had given her jacket and gloves to her maid but had kept on her hat and she leaned forward a little as she sat clasping her hands together in her lap and keeping her eyes on him 
the lamp in a corner was so thickly veiled that the room was in tempered obscurity lighted almost equally from the street and the brilliant shop fronts opposite therefore why be sapient and solemn about it like an editorial in a newspaper nick added with a smile she continued to look at him after he had spoken then she said if you don't want to stand you've only to say so you needn't give your reasons it's too kind of you to let me off that and then i'm a tremendous fellow for reasons that's my strong point don't you know i have a lot more besides those i've mentioned done up and ready for delivery the odd thing is that they don't always govern my behaviour i rather think i do want to sand then what you said just now was a speech julia declared a speech the rot the humbug of the hustings no those great truths remain and a good many others but an inner voice tells me i'm in for it and it will be much more graceful to embrace this opportunity accepting your cooperation than to wait for some other and forfeit that advantage i shall be very glad to help you anywhere she went on thanks awfully he returned still standing there with his hands in his pockets you'd do it best in your own place and i have no right to deny myself such a help julia calmly considered i don't do it badly ah you're so political of course i am it's the only decent thing to be but i can only help you if you'll help yourself i can do a great deal but i can't do everything if you'll work i'll work with you but if you're going into it with your hands in your pockets i'll have nothing to do with you nick instantly changed the position of these members and sank into a seat with his elbows on his knees you are very clever but you must really take a little trouble things don't drop into people's mouths i'll try i'll try i've a great incentive he admitted of course you have my mother my poor mother julia breathed some vague sound and he went on and of course always my father dear good man my mother's even more political than you i dare say she is and quite right said mrs dallow and she can't tell me a bit more than you can what she thinks what she believes what she wants pardon me i can tell you perfectly there's one thing i always immensely want to keep out a tory i see that's a great philosophy it would do very well and i desire the good of the country i'm not ashamed of that and can you give me an idea of what it is the good of the country i know perfectly what it isn't it isn't what the tories want to do what do they want to do oh it would take me long to tell you all sorts of trash it would take you long and it would take them longer all they want to do is to prevent us from doing on our side we want to prevent them from preventing us that's about as clearly as we all see it so on both sides it's a beautiful lucid inspiring program i don't believe in you mrs dallow replied to this leaning back on her sofa i hope not julia indeed he paused a moment still with his face toward her and his elbows on his knees then he pursued you are a very accomplished woman and a very zealous one but you haven't an idea you know not to call an idea what you mainly want is to be at the head of a political salon to start one to keep it up to make it a success much you know me julia protested but he could see through the dimness that her face spoke differently you'll have it in time but i won't come to it nick went on you can't come less than you do when i say you'll have it i mean you've already got it that's why i don't come i don't think you know what you mean said mrs dello i've an idea that's as good as any of yours any of those you've treated me to this evening 
it seems to me the simple idea that one ought to do something or other for one's country something or other certainly covers all the ground there's one thing one can always do for one's country which is not to be afraid afraid of what nick dormer waited a little as if his idea amused him but he presently said i'll tell you another time it's very well to talk so glibly of standing he added but it isn't absolutely foreign to the question that i haven't got the cash what did you do before she asked the first time my father paid and the other time oh mr carteret your expenses won't be at all large on the contrary said julia they shan't be i shall look out sharp for that i shall have the great hutchby of course but you know i want you to do it well she paused an instant and then of course you can send the bill to me thanks awfully you're tremendously kind i shouldn't think of that nick dormer got up as he spoke and walked to the window again his companion's eyes resting on him while he stood with his back to her i shall manage it somehow he wound up mr carteret would be delighted said julia i dare say but i hate taking people's money that's nonsense when it's for the country isn't it for them when they get it back nick replied turning round and looking for his hat it's startlingly late you must be tired mrs dallow made no response to this and he pursued his quest successful only when he reached a duskier corner of the room to which the hat had been relegated by his cousin's maid mr carteret would expect so much if he pays and so would you yes i'm bound to say i should i should expect a great deal everything and mrs dallow emphasized this assertion by the way she rose erect if you are riding for a fall if you're only going in to miss it you had better stay out how can i miss it with you the young man smiled she uttered a word impatiently but indistinguishably and he continued and even if i do it will have been immense fun it is immense fun said julia but the best fun is to win if you don't if i don't he repeated as she dropped i'll never speak to you again how much you expect even when you don't pay mrs dallow's rejoinder was a justification of this remark expressing as it did the fact that should they receive on the morrow information on which she believed herself entitled to count information tending to show how hard the conservatives meant to fight she should look to him to be in the field as early as herself sunday was a lost day she should leave paris on monday oh they'll fight it hard they'll put up kingsbury said nick smoothing his hat they'll all come down all that can get away and kingsbury has a very handsome wife she's not so handsome as your cousin julia smiled oh dear no a cousin sooner than a wife any day nick laughed as soon as he had said this as if the speech had an awkward side but the reparation perhaps scarcely mended it the exaggerated mock meekness with which he added i'll do any blessed thing you tell me come here to-morrow then as early as ten she turned round moving to the door with him but before they reached it she brought out pray isn't a gentleman to do anything to be anything to be anything if he doesn't aspire to serve the state aspire to make his political fortune do you mean oh bless me yes there are other things what other things that can compare with that well i for instance i'm very fond of the arts of the arts she echoed did you never hear of them i'm awfully fond of painting at this julia stopped short and her fine grey eyes had for a moment the air of being set further forward in her head 
don't be odious good night she said turning away and leaving him to go end of chapter six chapter seven of the tragic muse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the tragic muse by henry james chapter seven peter sherringham reminded nick the next day that he had promised to be present at madame Coray's interview with the ladies introduced to her by gabriel nash and in the afternoon conformably to this arrangement the two men took their way to the rue de constantinople they found mr nash and his friends in the small beflounced drawing-room of the old actress who as they learned had sent in a request for ten minutes grace having been detained at a lesson a rehearsal of the comedie de salon about to be given for a charity by a fine lady at which she had consented to be present as an adviser mrs ruth sat on a black satin sofa with her daughter beside her while gabriel nash wandering about the room looked at the votive offerings which converted the little panelled box decorated in sallow white and gold into a theatrical museum the presents the portraits the wreaths the diadems the letters framed and glazed the trophies and tributes and relics collected by madame Carré during half a century of renown the profusion of this testimony was hardly more striking than the confession of something missed something hushed which seemed to rise from it all and make it melancholy like a reference to clappings which in the nature of things could now only be present as a silence so that if the place was full of history it was the form without the fact or at the most a redundancy of the one to a pinch of the other the history of a mask of a squeak of a series of vain gestures some of the objects exhibited by the distinguished artist her early portraits in lithograph or miniature represented the costume and embodied the manner of a period so remote that nick dormer as he glanced at them felt a quickened curiosity to look at the woman who reconciled being alive today with having been alive so long ago peter sherringham already knew how she managed this miracle but every visit he paid her added to his amused charmed sense that it was a miracle and that his extraordinary old friend had seen things he should never never see those were just the things he wanted to see most and her duration her survival cheated him agreeably and helped him a little to guess them his appreciation of the actor's art was so systematic that it had an antiquarian side and at the risk of representing him as attached to an absurd futility it must be said that he had as yet hardly known a keener regret for anything than for the loss of that antecedent world and in particular for his having belatedly missed the great comedienne the light of the french stage in the early years of the century of whose example and instruction madame Carré had had the inestimable benefit she had often described to him her rare predecessor straight from whose hands she had received her most celebrated parts and of whom her own manner was often a religious imitation but her descriptions troubled him more than they consoled only confirming his theory to which so much of his observation had already ministered that the actor's art in general was going down and down descending a slope with abysses of vulgarity at its foot after having reached its perfection more than fifty years ago in the talent of the lady in question he would have liked to dwell for an hour beneath the meridian gabriel nash introduced the newcomers to his companions but the younger of the two ladies gave no sign of lending herself to this transaction the girl was very white she huddled there silent and rigid frightened to death staring expressionless if bridget dormer had seen her at this moment she might have felt avenged for the discomfiture of her own spirit suffered at the salon the day before under the challenging eyes of maud vavasour 
It was plain at the present hour that Miss Vavasour would have run away had she not regarded the persons present as so many guards and keepers. Her appearance made Nick feel as if the little temple of art in which they were collected had been the waiting-room of a dentist sherringham had seen a great many nervous girls tremble before the same ordeal and he liked to be kind to them to say things that would help them to do themselves justice the probability in a given case was almost overwhelmingly in favour of their having any other talent one could think of in a higher degree than the dramatic but he could rarely refrain from some care that the occasion shouldn't be even as against his conscience too cruel there were occasions indeed that could scarce be too cruel to punish properly certain examples of presumptuous ineptitude he remembered what mr nash had said about this blighted maiden and perceived that though she might be inept she was now anything but presumptuous gabriel fell to talking with nick dormer while peter addressed himself to mrs ruth there was no use as yet for any direct word to the girl who was too scared even to hear mrs ruth with her shawl fluttering about her nestled against her daughter putting out her hand to take one of miriam's soothingly she had pretty silly near-sighted eyes a long thin nose and an upper lip which projected over the under as an ornamental cornice rests on its support so much depends really everything she said in answer to some sociable observation of sherringham's it's either this and she rolled her eyes expressively about the room or it's i don't know what perhaps we're too many peter hazarded to her daughter but really you'll find after you fairly begin that you'll do better with four or five before she answered she turned her head and lifted her fine eyes the next instant he saw they were full of tears the words she spoke however though uttered as if she had tapped a silver gong had not the note of sensibility oh i don't care for you he laughed at this declared it was very well said and that if she could give madame carre such a specimen as that the actress came in before he had finished his phrase and he observed the way the girl ruefully rose to the encounter hanging her head a little and looking out from under her brows there was no sentiment in her face only a vacancy of awe and anguish which had not even the merit of being fine of its kind for it spoke of no spring of reaction yet the head was good he noted at the same moment it was strong and salient and made to tell at a distance madame carre scarcely heeded her at first greeting her only in her order among the others and pointing to seats composing the circle with smiles and gestures as if they were all before the prompter's box the old actress presented herself to a casual glance as a red-faced rattled woman in a wig with beady eyes a hooked nose and pretty hands but nick dormer who had a sense for the overscored human surface soon observed that these comparatively gross marks included a great deal of delicate detail an eyebrow a nostril a flitting of expressions as if a multitude of little facial wires were pulled from within this accomplished artist had in particular a mouth which was visibly a rare instrument a pair of lips whose curves and fine corners spoke of a lifetime of points unerringly made and verses exquisitely spoken helping to explain the purity of the sound that issued from them her whole countenance had the look of long service of a thing infinitely worn and used drawn and stretched to excess with its elasticity overdone and its springs relaxed yet religiously preserved and kept in repair even as some valuable old timepiece which might have quivered and rumbled but could be trusted to strike the hour at the first word she spoke gabriel nash exclaimed endearingly ah la voix de salamene salamene who wore a big red flower on the summit of her dense wig had a very grand air a toss of the head and sundry little majesties of manner in addition to which she was strange almost grotesque and to some people would have been even terrifying capable of reappearing with her hard eyes as a queer vision of the darkness she excused herself for having made the company wait and mouthed and mimicked in the drollest way with intonations as fine as a flute the performance and the pretensions of the belles dames to whom she had just been endeavouring to communicate a few of the rudiments mais celles-là 
c'est une plaisanterie she went on to mrs ruth whereas you and your daughter chère madame i'm sure you are quite another matter the girl had got rid of her tears and was gazing at her and mrs ruth leaned forward and said portentously she knows four languages madame carre gave one of her histrionic stares throwing back her head that's three too many the thing's to do something proper with one we're very much in earnest continued mrs ruth who spoke excellent french i'm glad to hear it il n'y a que ça la te es bien the head's very good she said as she looked at the girl but let us see my dear child what you've got in it the young lady was still powerless to speak she opened her lips but nothing came with the failure of this effort she turned her deep sombre eyes to the three men un beau regard it carries well madame carre further commented but even as she spoke miss ruth's fine gaze was suffused again and the next moment she had definitely begun to weep nick dormer sprung up he felt embarrassed and intrusive there was such an indelicacy in sitting there to watch a poor working girl's struggle with timidity there was a momentary confusion mrs ruth's tears were seen also to flow mr nash took it gaily addressing however at the same time the friendliest most familiar encouragement to his companions and peter sherringham offered to retire with nick on the spot should their presence incommode the young lady but the agitation was over in a minute madame carre motioned mrs ruth out of her seat and took her place beside the girl and nash explained judiciously to the other men that she'd be worse should they leave her her mother begged them to remain so that there should be at least some english she spoke as if the old actress were an army of frenchwomen the young heroine of the occasion quickly came round and madame carre on the sofa beside her held her hand and emitted a perfect music of reassurance the nerves the nerves they're half our affair have as many as you like if you've got something else too voyons do you know anything i know some pieces some pieces of the repertoire miriam ruth stared as if she didn't understand i know some poetry english french italian german said her mother madame carre gave mrs ruth a look which expressed irritation at the recurrence of this announcement does she wish to act in all those tongues the phrase book isn't the comedy it's only to show you how she has been educated ah chere madame there's no education that matters i mean save the right one your daughter must have a particular form of speech like me like ces messieurs you see if i can speak french said the girl smiling dimly at her hostess she appeared now almost to have collected herself you speak it in perfection and english just as well said miss ruth you oughtn't to be an actress you ought to be a governess oh don't tell us that it's to escape from that pleaded mrs ruth i'm very sure your daughter will escape from that peter sherringham was moved to interpose oh if you could help her said the lady with a world of logging she has certainly all the qualities that strike the eye peter returned you're most kind sir mrs ruth declared elegantly draping herself she knows Salamene. i've heard her do Salamene, gabriel nash said to madame carre and she knows juliet she knows lady macbeth and cleopatra added mrs ruth voyons my dear child do you wish to work for the french stage or for the english the old actress demanded ours would have sore need of you miss ruth sherringham gallantly threw off could you speak to any one in london could you introduce her her mother eagerly asked dear madame i must hear her first and hear what madame carre says she has a voice of rare beauty and i understand voices said mrs ruth ah then if she has intelligence she has every gift she has a most poetic mind the old lady went on i should like to paint her portrait she's made for that nick dormer ventured to observe to mrs ruth partly because struck with the girl's suitability for sitting partly to mitigate the crudity of inexpressive spectatorship so all the artists say i've had three or four heads of her if you would like to see them she has been done in several styles if you were to see her i'm sure it would make her celebrated and me too nick easily laughed it would indeed a member of parliament nash declared ah i have the honour murmured mrs ruth looking gratified and mystified 
nick explained that she had no honour at all and meanwhile madame Carré had been questioning the girl chere madame i can do nothing with your daughter she knows too much she broke out it's a pity because i like to catch them wild oh she's wild enough if that's all and that's the very point the question of where to try mrs ruth went on into what do i launch her upon what dangerous stormy sea i've thought of it so anxiously try here try the french public they're so much the most serious said gabriel nash ah no try the english there's such a rare opening sherringham urged in quick opposition oh it isn't the public dear gentlemen it's the private side the other people it's the life it's the moral atmosphere je ne connais qu'une scène la notre madame carré declared i am sure by every one who knows that there's no other very correctly assured said mr nash the theatre in our countries is puerile and barbarous there's something to be done for it and perhaps mademoiselle's the person to do it sherringham contentiously suggested ah but an attendant what can it do for her madame carré asked well anything i can help to bring about said peter sherringham more and more struck with the girl's rich type miriam ruth sat in silence while this discussion went on looking from one speaker to the other with a strange dependent candour ah if your part's marked out i congratulate you mademoiselle and the old actress underlined the words as she had often underlined others on the stage she smiled with large permissiveness on the young aspirant who appeared not to understand her her tone penetrated however to certain depths in the mother's nature adding another stir to agitated waters i feel the responsibility of what she shall find in the life the standards of the theatre mrs ruth explained where is the purest tone where are the highest standards that's what i ask the good lady continued with a misguided intensity which elicited a peal of unceremonious but sociable laughter from gabriel nash the purest tone Quoi se, quoi se, quoi sa? Madame Carré demanded in the finest manner of modern comedy. We're very, very respectable, Mrs. Ruth went on, but now smiling and achieving likeness too. What I want is to place my daughter where the conduct and the picture of conduct in which she should take part wouldn't be quite absolutely dreadful. Now, Cherie, Madame, how about all that? How about conduct in the French theatre? all the things she should see the things she should hear the things she should learn her hostess took it as sherringham felt de très haut i don't think i know what you're talking about they're the things she may see and hear and learn everywhere only they're better done they're better said above all they're better taught the only conduct that concerns an actress it seems to me is her own and the only way for her to behave herself is not to be a helpless stick i know no other conduct but there are characters there are situations which i don't think i should like to see her undertake there are many no doubt which she would do well to leave alone laughed the frenchwoman i shouldn't like to see her represent a very bad woman a really bad one mrs sooth serenely pursued ah in england then and in your theatre every one's immaculately good your plays must be even more ingenious than i supposed we haven't any plays said gabriel nash people will write them for miss ruth it will be a new era sherringham threw in with wanton or at least with combative optimism will you sir will you do something a sketch of one of our grand english ideals the old lady asked engagingly oh i know what you do with our pieces to show your superior virtue madame carré cried before he had time to reply that he wrote nothing but diplomatic memoranda bad woman je ne joui que ça madame really bad i tried to make them real i can say la aventurier miriam interrupted in a cold voice which seemed to hint at a want of participation in the maternal solicitudes allow us the pleasure of hearing you then madame carré will give you the replique said peter sherringham certainly my child i can say it without the book madame carré responded put yourself there move that chair a little away she patted her young visitor encouraging her to rise settling with her the scene they should take 
while the three men sprang up to arrange a place for the performance. Miriam left her seat and looked vaguely about her, then having taken off her hat and given it to her mother, she stood on the designated spot, with her eyes to the ground. Abruptly, however, instead of beginning the scene, Madame Carré turned to the elder lady with an air which showed that a rejoinder to this visitor's remarks of a moment before had been gathering force in her breast. "'You mix things up, Chere, madame, and I have it on my heart to tell you so. I believe it's rather the case with you other English, and I've never been able to learn that either your morality or your talent is the gainer by it. To be too respectable, to go where things are done best, is in my opinion to be very vicious indeed, and to do them badly in order to preserve your virtue is to fall into a grossness more shocking than any other. To do them well is virtue enough, and not to make a mess of it the only respectability. That's hard enough to merit paradise. Everything else is base humbug. Voila, chere madame, the answer I have for your scruples. It's admirable, admirable, and I am glad my friend Dormer here has had the great advantage of hearing you utter it, Nash exclaimed with a free designation of Nick. That young man thought it, in effect, a speech denoting an intelligence of the question, yet he rather resented the idea that Gabriel should assume it would strike him as a revelation, and to show his familiarity with the line of thought it indicated, as well as to play his part appreciatively in the little circle, he observed to Mrs. Ruth as if they might take many things for granted. In other words, your daughter must find her safeguard in the artistic conscience but he had no sooner spoken than he was struck with the oddity of their discussing so publicly and under the poor girl's handsome nose the conditions which miss ruth might find the best for the preservation of her personal integrity however the anomaly was light and unoppressive the echoes of a public discussion of delicate questions seemed to linger so familiarly in the egotistical little room Moreover, the heroine of the occasion evidently was losing her embarrassment. She was the priestess on the tripod, awaiting the afflatus and thinking only of that. Her bared head, of which she had changed the position, holding it erect, while her arms hung at her sides, was admirable. Her eyes gazed straight out of the window and at the houses on the opposite side of the Rue de Constantinople. Mrs. Ruth had listened to Madame Carré with startled, respectful attention, but Nick, considering her, was very sure she hadn't at all taken in the great artist's little lesson. Yet this didn't prevent her from exclaiming in answer to himself, Oh, a fine artistic life! What indeed is more beautiful? Peter Sheringham had said nothing. He was watching Miriam and her attitude. She wore a black dress which fell in straight folds. Her face, under her level brows, was pale and regular. It had a strange, strong, tragic beauty. I don't know what's in her, he said to himself. Nothing, it would seem, from her persistent vacancy. But such a face as that, such a head, is a fortune. Madame Carré brought her to book, giving her the first line of the speech of Clorinda. Vos ne me fous pas, mon enfant, à jour hue. But still the girl hesitated, and for an instant appeared to make a vain convulsive effort. In this convulsion she frowned portentously. Her low forehead overhung her eyes. The eyes themselves, in shadow, stared, splendid and cold, and her hands clinched themselves at her sides. She looked austere and terrible, and was during this moment an incarnation, the vividness of which drew from Sheringham a stifled cry. Ella es bien bella, ah, oh, sa, murmured the old actress, and in the pause which still preceded the issue of sound from the girl's lips, Peter turned to his kinsman and said in a low tone, You must paint her just like that. Like that? As the tragic muse. She began to speak, a long, strong, colorless voice quavered in her young throat. She delivered the lines of Clorinda in the admired interview with Celia, the gem of the third act, with a rude monotony, and then gaining confidence with an effort at modulation which was not altogether successful, and which evidently she felt not to be so. Madame Carré sent back the ball without raising her hand, repeating the speeches of Celia, which her memory possessed from their having so often been addressed to her, and uttering the verses with soft, communicative art. 
So they went on through the scene, which, when it was over, had not precisely been a triumph for Miriam Ruth. Sherringham forbore to look at Gabriel Nash, and Madame Carré said, I think you've a voice, ma fille, somewhere or other. We must try and put our hand on it. Then she asked her what instruction she had had, and the girl, lifting her eyebrows, looked at her mother while her mother prompted her. Mrs. Delamere in London, she was once an ornament of the English stage. She gives lessons just to a very few. It's a great favor, such a very nice person. But above all, Signor Ruggieri, I think he taught us most. Mrs. Ruth explained that this gentleman was an Italian tragedian in Rome who instructed Miriam in the proper manner of pronouncing his language and also in the art of declaiming and gesticulating gesticulating i'll warrant declared their hostess they mimic as for the deaf they emphasize as for the blind mrs delamere is doubtless an epitome of all the virtues but i never heard of her you travel too much madame carre went on that's very amusing but the way to study is to stay at home to shut yourself up and hammer at your scales mrs ruth complained that they had no home to stay at in reply to which the old actress exclaimed Oh, you English, you're d'une légèreté à faire fremir. If you haven't a home, you must make, or at least for decency pretend to, one. In our profession, it's the first requisite. But where? That's what I ask, said Mrs. Ruth. Why not here? Sherringham threw out. Oh, here. And the good lady shook her head with a world of sad significance. "'Come and live in London, and then I shall be able to paint your daughter,' Nick Dormer interposed. "'Is that all it will take, my dear fellow?' asked Gabriel Nash. "'Ah, London's full of memories,' Mrs. Ruth went on. "'My father had a great house there. We always came up. But all that's over.' "'Study here, and then go to London to appear,' said Peter, feeling frivolous even as he spoke. "'To appear in French? No, in the language of Shakespeare. But we can't study that here.' Mr. Sherringham means that he will give you lessons, Madame Carré explained. Let me not fail to say it. He's an excellent critic. How do you know that, you who are beyond criticism and perfect? asked Sherringham, an inquiry to which the answer was forestalled by the girl's rousing herself to make it public that she could recite the Knights of Alfred de Musset. Diable, said the actress, that's more than I can. By all means give us a specimen. The girl again placed herself in position and rolled out a fragment of one of the splendid conversations of Musset's poet with his muse, rolled it loudly and proudly, tossed it and tumbled it about the room. Madame Carré watched her at first, but after a few moments she shut her eyes, though the best part of the business was to take in her young candidate's beauty. Sherringham had supposed Miriam rather abashed by the flatness of her first performance, but now he saw how little she could have been aware of this she was rather uplifted and emboldened she made a mush of the divine verses which in spite of certain sonorities and cadences an evident effort to imitate a celebrated actress a comrade of madame carre whom she had heard declaim them she produced as if she had been dashing blindfold at some playfellow she was to catch when she had finished madame carre passed no judgment only dropping perhaps you had better say something english she suggested some little piece of verse, some fable if there were fables in English. She appeared but scantily surprised to hear that there were not. It was a language of which one expected so little. Mrs. Ruth said, She knows her Tennyson by heart. I think he's much deeper than La Fontaine. And after some deliberation and delay, Miriam broke into The Lotus Eaters, from which she passed directly, almost breathlessly, to Edward Gray sherringham had by this time heard her make four different attempts and the only generalization very present to him was that she uttered these dissimilar compositions in exactly the same tone a solemn droning dragging measure suggestive of an exhortation from the pulpit and adopted evidently with the affecting intention and from a crude idea of style it was all funereal yet was artlessly rough Sherringham thought her English performance less futile than her French, but he could see that Madame Carré listened to it even with less pleasure. In the way the girl wailed forth some of her Tennysonian lines, he detected a faint gleam, 
as of something pearly in deep water but the further she went the more violently she acted on the nerves of mr gabriel nash that also he could discover from the way this gentleman ended by slipping discreetly to the window and leaning there with his head out and his back to the exhibition he had the art of mute expression his attitude said as clearly as possible no no you can't call me either ill-mannered or ill-natured i'm the showman of the occasion moreover and i avert myself leaving you to judge if there's a thing in life i hate it's this idiotic new fashion of the drawing-room recitation and of the insufferable creatures who practice it who prevent conversation and whom as they're beneath it you can't punish by criticism therefore what i'm doing's only too magnanimous bringing these benighted women here paying with my person stifling my just repugnance while sherringham judged privately that the manner in which miss ruth had acquitted herself offered no element of interest he yet remained aware that something surmounted and survived her failure something that would perhaps be worth his curiosity it was the element of outline and attitude the way she stood the way she turned her eyes her head and moved her limbs these things held the attention they had a natural authority and in spite of their suggesting too much the schoolgirl in the tableau vivant a plastic grandeur her face moreover grew as he watched it something delicate dawned in it a dim promise of variety and a touching plea for patience as if it were conscious of being able to show in time more shades than the simple and striking gloom which had as yet mainly graced it these rather rude physical felicities formed in short her only mark of a vocation he almost hated to have to recognize them he had seen them so often when they meant nothing at all that he had come at last to regard them as almost a guarantee of incompetence he knew madame Carré valued them singly so little that she counted them out in measuring an histrionic nature when deprived of the escort of other properties which helped and completed them she almost held them as a positive hindrance to success success of the only kind she esteemed far oftener than himself she had sat in judgment on young women for whom hair and eyebrows and a disposition for the statuesque would have worked the miracle of sanctifying their stupidity if the miracle were workable but that particular miracle never was the qualities she rated highest were not the gifts but the conquests the effects the actor had worked hard for had dug out of the mine by unwearied study sherringham remembered to have had in the early part of their acquaintance a friendly dispute with her on this subject he having been moved at that time to defend doubtless to excess the cause of the gifts she had gone so far as to say that a serious comedian ought to be ashamed of them ashamed of resting his case on them and when sherringham had cited the great rachel as a player whose natural endowment was rich and who had owed her highest triumphs to it she had declared that rachel was the very instance that proved her point a talent assisted by one or two primary aids a voice and a portentous brow but essentially formed by work unremitting and ferocious work i don't care a straw for your handsome girls she said but bring me one who's ready to dredge the tenth part of the way rachel drudged and i'll forgive her her beauty of course no tes bien rachel wasn't a gros pate that's a gift if you like mrs ruth who was evidently very proud of the figure her daughter had made her daughter who for all one could tell affected their hostess precisely as a gros pate appealed to madame Carré rashly and serenely for a verdict but fortunately this lady's voluble bone came rattling in at the same moment with the tea-tray the old actress busied herself in dispensing this refreshment and hospitable attention to her english visitors and under cover of the diversion thus obtained while the others talked together sherringham put her the question well is there anything in my young friend nothing i can see she's loud and coarse she's very much afraid you must allow for that afraid of me immensely but not a bit afraid of her authors nor of you madame Carré smiled aren't you prejudiced by what that fellow nash has told you why prejudiced he only told me she was very handsome and don't you think her so admirable but i'm not a photographer nor a dressmaker 
nor coiffure i can't do anything with back hair nor with a mere big stare the head's very noble said peter sherringham and the voice when she spoke english had some sweet tones ah you're english possibly all i can say is that i listened to her conscientiously and i didn't perceive in what she did a single nuance a single inflection or intention but not one mon cher i don't think she's intelligent but don't they often seem stupid at first say always then don't some succeed even when they're handsome when they're handsome they always succeed in one way or another you don't understand us english said peter sherringham madame Carré drank her tea then she replied marry her my son and give her diamonds make her an ambassadress she'll look very well she interests you so little that you don't care to do anything for her to do anything to give her a few lessons the old actress looked at him a moment after which rising from her place near the table on which the tea had been served she said to miriam ruth my dear child i give my voice for this scene in glass you did the english things best did i do them well asked the girl you've a great deal to learn but you've rude force the main things sont encore a dégager but they'll come you must work i think she has ideas said mrs ruth she gets them from you madame Carré replied i must say that if it's to be our theatre i'm relieved i do think ours safer the good lady continued ours is dangerous no doubt you mean you're more severe said the girl your mother's right the actress smiled you have ideas but what shall we do then how shall we proceed mrs ruth made this appeal plaintively and vaguely to the three gentlemen but they had collected a few steps off and were so occupied in talk that it failed to reach them work 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 exclaimed the actress in english i can play shakespeare i want to play shakespeare miriam made known that's fortunate as in english you haven't any one else to play but he's so great and he's so pure said mrs ruth that indeed seems the saving of you madame Carré returned you think me actually pretty bad don't you the girl demanded with her serious face mon dieu que vous dérangez of course you're rough but so was i at your age and if you find your voice it may carry you far besides what does it matter what i think how can i judge for your english public how shall i find my voice asked miriam ruth by trying il n'y a que ça work like a horse night and day besides mr sherringham as he says will help you that gentleman hearing his name turned round and the girl appealed to him will you help me really to find her voice said madame Carré. the voice when it's worth anything comes from the heart so i suppose that's where to look for it gabriel nash suggested much you know you haven't got any miriam retorted with the first scintillation of gaiety she had shown on this occasion any voice my child mr nash inquired any heart or any manners peter sherringham made the secret reflection that he liked her better lugubrious as the note of pertness was not totally absent from her mode of emitting these few words he was irritated moreover for in the brief conference he had just had with the young lady's introducer he had had to meet the rather difficult call of speaking of her hopefully mr nash had said with his bland smile and what impression does my young friend make in respect to which peter's optimism felt engaged by an awkward logic he answered that he recognized promise though he did nothing of the sort at the same time that the poor girl both with the exaggerated points of her person and the vanity of her attempt at expression constituted a kind of challenge struck him as a subject for inquiry a problem an explorable tract she was too bad to jump at and yet too taking perhaps after all only vulgarly to overlook especially when resting her tragic eyes on him with the trust of her deep really this note affected him as addressed directly to his honour giving him a chance to brave verisimilitude to brave ridicule even a little in order to show in a special case what he had always maintained in general that the direction of a young person's studies for the stage may be an interest of as high an order as any other artistic appeal 
Mr. Nash has rendered us the great service of introducing us to Madame Carré, and I'm sure we're immensely indebted to him, Mrs. Ruth said to her daughter, with an air affectionately corrective. But what good does that do us? the girl asked, smiling at the actress and gently laying her fingertips upon her hand. Madame Carré listens to me with adorable patience and then sends me about my business. Ah, in the prettiest way in the world. Mademoiselle, you're not so rough. The tone of that's very just. A la bonne, you're. Work, work, the actress cried. There was an inflection there, or very nearly. Practice it till you've got it. Come and practice it to me, if your mother will be so kind as to bring you, said Peter Sherringham. Do you give lessons? Do you understand? Miriam asked. I'm an old playgoer, and I've an unbounded belief in my own judgment. Old, sir, is too much to say, Mrs. Ruth remonstrated. My daughter knows your high position, but she's very direct. You'll always find her so. Perhaps you'll say there are less honorable faults. We'll come to see you with pleasure. Oh, I've been at the embassy when I was her age. Therefore, why shouldn't she go today? That was in Lord Davenant's time. A few people are coming to tea with me tomorrow. Perhaps you'll come then at five o'clock. It will remind me of the dear old times, said Mrs. Ruth. Thank you. I'll try and do better tomorrow, Miriam professed very sweetly. You do better every minute, Sherringham returned, and he looked at their hostess in support of this declaration. She's finding her voice, Madame Carré acknowledged. She's finding a friend, Mrs. Ruth threw in. And don't forget, when you come to London, my hope that you'll come and see me, Nick Dormer said to the girl, to try and paint you, that would do me good. She's finding even two, said Madame Carré. It's to make up for one I've lost, and Miriam looked with very good stage scorn at Gabriel Nash. It's he who thinks I'm bad. You say that to make me drive you home. You know it will, Nash returned. We'll all take you home. Why not? Sherringham asked. Madame Carré looked at the handsome girl, handsomer than ever at this moment, and at the three young men who had taken their hats and stood ready to accompany her. A deeper expression came for an instant into her hard, bright eyes. Ah, les jeunesse, she sighed. You'd always have that, my child, if you were the greatest goose on earth. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Tragic Muse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragic Muse by Henry James. Chapter Eight. At Peter Sherringham's the next day, Miriam had so evidently come with the expectation of saying something that it was impossible such a patron of the drama should forbear to invite her, little as the exhibition at Madame Carré's could have contributed to render the invitation prompt. His curiosity had been more appeased than stimulated, but he felt none the less that he had taken up the dark-browed girl and her reminiscential mother and must face the immediate consequences of the act. This responsibility weighed upon him during the twenty-four hours that followed the ultimate dispersal of the little party at the door of the Hôtel de la Garonne. On quitting Madame Carré, the two ladies had definitely declined Mr. Nash's offered cab, and had taken their way homeward on foot and with the gentlemen in attendance. The streets of Paris at that hour were bright and episodical and Sherringham trod them good-humouredly enough, and not too fast, leaning a little to talk with Miriam as he went. Their pace was regulated by her mother's, who advanced on the arm of Gabriel Nash, Nick Dormer was on her other side, in refined deprecation. Her sloping back was before them, exempt from retentive stillness in spite of her rigid principles, with the little drama of her lost and recovered shawl perpetually going on. 
Sherringham said nothing to the girl about her performance or her powers. Their talk was only of her manner of life with her mother, their travels, their pension, their economies, their want of a home, the many cities she knew well, the foreign tongues, and the wide view of the world she had acquired. He guessed, easily enough, the dolorous type of exile of the two ladies, wanderers in search of continental cheapness, inured to queer contacts and compromises, remarkably well connected in England, but going out for their meals. The girl was but indirectly communicative, though seemingly less from any plan of secrecy than from the habit of associating with people whom she didn't honor with her confidence. She was fragmentary and abrupt, as well as not in the least shy, subdued to dread of Madame Carré as she had been for the time. She gave Sherringham a reason for this fear, and he thought her reason innocently pretentious. She admired a great artist more than anything in the world, and in the presence of art, of great art, her heart beat so fast. Her manners were not perfect, and the friction of a varied experience had rather roughened than smoothed her. She said nothing that proved her intelligent, even though he guessed this to be the design of two or three of her remarks. But he parted from her with the suspicion that she was, according to the contemporary French phrase, a nature. The Hôtel de la Garonne was in a small renovated street in which the cobblestones of old Paris still flourished, lying between the Avenue de l'Opéra and the Place de la Bourse. Sherringham had occasionally traversed the high dimness, but had never noticed the tall, stale Maison Meuble, the aspect of which, that of a third-rate provincial inn, was an illustration of Mrs. Ruth's shrunken standard. We would ask you to come up, but it's quite at the top, and we haven't a sitting-room, the poor lady bravely explained. We had to receive Mr. Nash at a café. Nick Dormer declared that he liked cafés, and Miriam, looking at his cousin, dropped with a flash of passion the demand, do you wonder I should want to do something, so that we can stop living like pigs? Peter recognized the next day that though it might be boring to listen to her, it was better to make her recite than to let her do nothing. So effectually did the presence of his sister and that of Lady Agnes and even of Grace and Biddy appear by a strange tacit opposition to deprive hers, ornamental as it was, of a reason. He had only to see them all together to perceive that she couldn't pass for having come to meet them, even her mother's insinuating gentility failed to put the occasion on that footing, and that she must therefore be assumed to have been brought to show them something. She was not subdued, not colorless enough to sit there for nothing or even for conversation, the sort of conversation that was likely to come off, so that it was inevitable to treat her position as connected with the principal place on the carpet with silence and attention and the pulling together of chairs. Even when so established, it struck him as first as precarious in the light or the darkness of the inexpressive faces of the other ladies, seated in couples and rows on sofas. There were several in addition to Julia and the dormers, mainly the wives with their husbands of Sherringham's fellow secretaries, scarcely one of whom he felt he might count upon for a modicum of gush when the girl should have finished. Miss Ruth gave a representation of Juliet drinking the potion, according to the system, as her mother explained, of the famous Signor Ruggieri, a scene of high, fierce sound, of many cries and contortions. She shook her hair, which proved magnificent, half down before the performance was over. Then she declaimed several short poems by Victor Hugo, selected among many hundred by Mrs. Ruth, as the good lady was careful to make known. After this she jumped to the American lyre, 
regaling the company with specimens both familiar and fresh of longfellow lowell whittier holmes and of two or three poetesses now revealed to sherringham for the first time she flowed so copiously keeping the floor and rejoicing visibly in her luck that her host was mainly occupied with wondering how he could make her leave off he was surprised at the extent of her repertory which in view of the circumstance that she could never have received much encouragement it must have come mainly from her mother and he didn't believe in signor ruggieri denoted a very stiff ambition and a blundering energy it was her mother who checked her at last and he found himself suspecting that gabriel nash had intimated to the old woman that interference was necessary for himself he was chiefly glad madame carre hadn't come it was present to him that she would have judged the exhibition with its badness its impudence the absence of criticism wholly indecent his only new impression of the heroine of the scene was that of this same high assurance her coolness her complacency her eagerness to go on she had been deadly afraid of the old actress but was not a bit afraid of a cluster of femmes de mont of julia of lady agnes of the smart women of the embassy it was positively these personages who were rather in fear there was certainly a moment when even julia was scared for the first time he had ever remarked it the space was too small the cries the convulsions and rushes of the dishevelled girl were too near lady agnes wore much of the time the countenance she might have shown in the theatre during a play in which pistols were fired and indeed the manner of the young reciter had become more spasmodic and more explosive it appeared however that the company in general thought her very clever and successful which showed to sherringham's sense how little they understood the matter poor biddy was immensely struck she grew flushed and absorbed in proportion as miriam at her best moments became pale and fatal it was she who spoke to her first after it was agreed that they had better not fatigue her any more she advanced a few steps happening to be nearest she murmured oh thank you so much i never saw anything so beautiful so grand she looked very red and very pretty as she said this and peter sherringham liked her enough to notice her more and like her better when she looked prettier than usual as he turned away he heard miriam make answer with no great air of appreciation of her tribute i've seen you before two days ago at the salon with mr dormer yes i know he's your brother i've made his acquaintance since he wants to paint my portrait do you think he'll do it well he was afraid the girl was something of a brute also somewhat grossly vain this impression would perhaps have been confirmed if a part of the rest of the short conversation of the two young women had reached his ear biddy ventured to observe that she herself had studied modelling a little and that she could understand how any artist would think miss ruth a splendid subject if indeed she could attempt her head that would be a chance indeed thank you said miriam with a laugh as of high comedy i think i had rather not passe par tout la famille then she added if your brother's an artist i don't understand how he's in parliament oh he isn't in parliament now we only hope he will be ah i see and he isn't an artist either biddy felt herself conscientiously bound to state then he isn't anything said miss ruth well he's immensely clever ah i see miss ruth again replied mr nash has puffed him up so i don't know mr nash said biddy guilty of a little dryness as well as of a little misrepresentation and feeling rather snubbed well you needn't wish to biddy stood with her a moment longer still looking at her and not knowing what to say next but not finding her any less handsome because she had such odd manners biddy had an ingenious little mind which always tried as much as possible to keep different things separate 
it was pervaded now by the reflection attended with some relief that if the girl spoke to her with such unexpected familiarity of nick she said nothing at all about peter two gentlemen came up two of peter's friends and made speeches to miss ruth of the kind biddy supposed people learned to make in paris it was also doubtless in paris the girl privately reasoned that they learned to listen to them as this striking performer listened she received their advances very differently from the way she had received biddy's sherringham noticed his young kinswoman turn away still very red to go and sit near her mother again leaving miriam engaged with the two men it appeared to have come over her that for a moment she had been strangely spontaneous and bold and that she had paid a little of the penalty the seat next her mother was occupied by mrs ruth toward whom lady agnes's head had inclined itself with a preoccupied tolerance he had the conviction mrs ruth was telling her about the neville nugents of castle nugent and that lady agnes was thinking it odd she never had heard of them he said to himself that biddy was generous she had urged julia to come in order that they might see how bad the strange young woman would be but now that the event had proved dazzling she forgot this calculation and rejoiced in what she innocently supposed to be the performer's triumph she kept away from julia however she didn't even look at her to invite her also to confess that in vulgar parlance they had been sold he himself spoke to his sister who was leaning back with a detached air in the corner of a sofa saying something which led her to remark in reply ah i dare say it's extremely fine but i don't care for tragedy when it treads on one's toes she's like a cow who has kicked over the milking pail she ought to be tied up my poor julia it isn't extremely fine it isn't fine at all sherringham returned with some irritation pardon me then i thought that was why you invited us i imagine she was different peter said a little foolishly ah if you don't care for her so much the better it has always seemed to me you make too awfully much of those people oh i do care for her too rather she's interesting his sister gave him a momentary mystified glance and he added and she's dreadful he felt stupidly annoyed and was ashamed of his annoyance as he could have assigned no reason for it it didn't grow less for the moment from his seeing gabriel nash approach julia introduced by nick dormer he gave place to the two young men with some alacrity for he had a sense of being put in the wrong in respect to their specimen by nash's very presence he remembered how it had been a part of their bargain as it were that he should present that gentleman to his sister he was not sorry to be relieved of the office by nick and he even tacitly and ironically wished his kinsman friend joy of a colloquy with mrs dallow sherringham's life was spent with people he was used to people and both as host and as guest he carried the social burden in general lightly he could observe especially in the former capacity without uneasiness and take the temperature without anxiety but at present his company oppressed him he felt worried and that he showed it which was the thing in the world he had ever held least an honour to a gentleman dedicated to diplomacy he was vexed with the levity that had made him call his roomful together on so poor a pretext and yet was vexed with the stupidity that made the witnesses so evidently find the pretext sufficient he inwardly groaned at the delusion under which he had saddled himself with the tragic muse a tragic muse who was strident and pert and yet wished his visitors would go away and leave him alone with her nick dormer said to mrs dallow that he wanted her to know an old friend of his one of the cleverest men he knew and he added the hope that she would be gentle and encouraging with him he was so timid and so easily disconcerted mr nash hereupon dropped into a chair by the arm of her sofa their companion went away and mrs dallow turned her glance upon her new acquaintance without a perceptible change of position 
Then she emitted with rapidity the remark, It's very awkward when people are told one's clever. It's only awkward if one isn't, Gabriel smiled. Yes, but so few people are, enough to be talked about. Isn't that just the reason why such a matter, such an exception, ought to be mentioned to them, he asked? They mightn't find it out for themselves. Of course, however, as you say, there ought to be a certainty. Then they're sure to know it. Dormer's a dear fellow, but he's rash and superficial. Mrs. Dallow, at this incitement, turned her glance a second time on her visitor. But during the rest of the conversation, she rarely repeated the movement. If she liked Nick Dormer extremely, and it may, without more delay, be communicated to the reader that she did, her liking was of a kind that opposed no difficulty whatever to her not liking, in case of such a complication, a person attached or otherwise belonging to him. It was not in her nature to put up with others for the sake of an individual she loved. The putting up was usually consumed in the loving, and with nothing left over. If the affection that isolates and simplifies its object may be distinguished from the affection that seeks communications and contracts for it, Julia Dallows was quite of the encircling, not to say the narrowing sort. She was not so much jealous as essentially exclusive. She desired no experience for the familiar, and yet partly unsounded kinsmen in whom she took an interest that she wouldn't have desired for herself, and indeed the cause of her interest in him was partly the vision of his helping her to the particular extensions she did desire, the taste and thrill of great affairs and of public action. To have such ambitions for him appeared to her the highest honor she could do him. Her conscience was in it as well as her inclination, and her scheme, to her sense, was noble enough to varnish over any disdain she might feel for forces drawing him another way. She had a prejudice in general against his existing connections, a suspicion of them, and a supply of off-hand contempt in waiting. It was a singular circumstance that she was skeptical, even when knowing her as well as he did, he thought them worth recommending to her. The recommendation, indeed, mostly confirmed the suspicion. This was a law from which Gabriel Nash was condemned to suffer, if suffering could on any occasion be predicated of Gabriel Nash. His pretension was in truth that he had purged his life of such possibilities of waste, though probably he would have admitted that if that fair vessel should spring a leak, the wound in its side would have been dealt by a woman's hand. In dining two evenings before with her brother and with the dormers, Mrs. Dallow had been moved to exclaim that Peter and Nick knew the most extraordinary people. As regards Peter, the attitudinizing girl and her mother now pointed that moral with sufficient vividness, so that there was little arrogance in taking a similar quality for granted of the conceited man at her elbow who sat there as if he might be capable from one moment to another of leaning over the arm of her sofa. She had not the slightest wish to talk with him about himself, and was afraid for an instant that he was on the point of passing from the chapter of his cleverness to that of his timidity. It was a false alarm, however, for he only animadverted on the pleasures of the elegant extract hurled, literally, hurlay, in general, from the center of the room at one's defenseless head. He intimated that, in his opinion, these pleasures were all for the performers. The auditors had, at any rate, given Miss Ruth a charming afternoon. That, of course, was what Mrs. Dallow's kind brother had mainly intended in arranging the little party. Julia hated to hear him call her brother kind. The term seemed offensively patronizing. But he himself, he related, was now constantly employed in the same beneficence, listening two-thirds of his time to intonations and shrieks. She had doubtless observed it herself how the great current of the age, the adoration of the mime, was almost too strong for any individual, how it swept one along and dashed one against the rocks. 
as she made no response to this proposition gabriel nash asked her if she hadn't been struck with the main sign of the time the preponderance of the mountebank the glory and renown the personal favour he enjoyed hadn't she noticed what an immense part of the public attention he held in london at least for in paris society was not so pervaded with him and the women of the profession in particular were not in every drawing-room i don't know what you mean mrs dallow said i know nothing of any such people aren't they under your feet wherever you turn their performances their portraits their speeches their autobiographies their names their manners their ugly mugs as the people say and their idiotic pretensions i dare say it depends on the places one goes to if they're everywhere and she paused a moment i don't go everywhere i don't go anywhere but they mount on my back at home like the old man of the sea just observe a little when you return to london mr nash went on with friendly instructiveness julia got up at this she didn't like receiving directions but no other corner of the room appeared to offer her any particular reason for crossing to it she never did such a thing without a great inducement so she remained standing there as if she were quitting the place in a moment which indeed she now determined to do and her interlocutor rising also lingered beside her unencouraged but unperturbed he proceeded to remark that mr sherringham was quite right to offer miss ruth an afternoon sport she deserved it as a fine brave amiable girl she was highly educated knew a dozen languages was of illustrious lineage and was immensely particular immensely particular mrs dallow repeated perhaps i should say rather that her mother's so on her behalf particular about the sort of people they meet the tone the standard i'm bound to say they're like you they don't go everywhere that spirit's not so common in the mob calling itself good society as not to deserve mention she said nothing for a moment she looked vaguely round the room but not at miriam ruth nevertheless she presently dropped as in forced reference to her an impatient shake she's dreadfully vulgar ah don't say that to my friend dormer mr nash laughed are you and he such great friends mrs dallow asked meeting his eyes great enough to make me hope we shall be greater again for a little she said nothing but then went on why shouldn't i say to him that she's vulgar because he admires her so much he wants to paint her to paint her to paint her portrait oh i see i dare say she do for that mrs nash showed further amusement if that's your opinion of her you're not very complimentary to the art he aspires to practise he aspires to practise she echoed afresh haven't you talked with him about it ah you must keep him up to it julia dallow was conscious for a moment of looking uncomfortable but it relieved her to be able to demand of her neighbour with a certain manner are you an artist i try to be nash smiled but i work in such difficult material he spoke this with such a clever suggestion of mysterious things that she was to hear herself once more pay him the attention of taking him up difficult material i work in life at this she turned away leaving him the impression that she probably misunderstood his speech thinking he meant that he drew from the living model or some such platitude as if there could have been any likelihood he would have dealings with the dead this indeed would not fully have explained the abruptness with which she dropped their conversation gabriel however was used to sudden collapses and even to sudden ruptures on the part of those addressed by him and no man had more the secret of remaining gracefully with his conventional wares on his hands he saw mrs dallow approach nick dormer who was talking with one of the ladies of the embassy and apparently signified that she wished to speak to him he got up and they had a minute's talk after which he turned and took leave of his fellow visitors she said a word to her brother nick joined her and they then came together to the door in this movement they had to pass near nash 
and it gave her an opportunity to nod good-bye to him which he was by no means sure she would have done if nick hadn't been with her the young man just stopped he said to nash i should like to see you this evening late you must meet me somewhere we'll take a walk i should like that nash replied i shall smoke a cigar at the cafe on the corner of the place de l'opera you'll find me there he prepared to compass his own departure but before doing so he addressed himself to the duty of a few civil words to lady agnes this effort proved vain for on one side she was defended by the wall of the room and on the other rendered inaccessible by miriam's mother who clung to her with a quickly rooted fidelity showing no symptom of desistance nash declined perforce upon her daughter grace who said to him you were talking with my cousin mrs dallow to her rather than with her he smiled ah she's very charming grace said she's very beautiful and very clever the girl continued very very intelligent his conversation with miss dormer went little beyond this and he presently took leave of peter sherringham remarking to him as they shook hands that he was very sorry for him but he had courted his fate what do you mean by my fate sherringham asked you've got them for life why for life when i now clearly and courageously recognize that she isn't good ah but she'll become so said gabriel nash do you think that sherringham brought out with a candour that made his visitor laugh you will that's more to the purpose the latter declared as he went away ten minutes later lady agnes substituted a general vague assent for all further particular ones drawing off from mrs ruth and from the rest of the company with her daughters peter had had very little talk with biddy but the girl kept her disappointment out of her pretty eyes and said to him you told us she didn't know how but she does there was no suggestion of disappointment in this sherringham held her hand a moment ah it's you who know how dear biddy he answered and he was conscious that if the occasion had been more private he would have all lawfully kissed her presently three more of his guests took leave and mr nash's assurance that he had them for life recurred to him as he observed that mrs ruth and her damsel quite failed to profit by so many examples the lovicks remained a colleague and his sociable wife and peter gave them a hint that they were not to plant him there only with the two ladies miriam quitted mrs lovick who had attempted with no great subtlety to engage her and came up to her host as if she suspected him of a design of stealing from the room and had the idea of preventing it i want some more tea will you give me some more i feel quite faint you don't seem to suspect how this sort of thing takes it out of one peter apologized extravagantly for not having seen to it that she had proper refreshment and took her to the round table in a corner on which the little collation had been served he poured out tea for her and pressed bread and butter on her and petty fours of all which she profusely and methodically partook it was late the afternoon had faded and a lamp been brought in the wide shade of which shed a fair glow on the tea service and the plates of pretty food the lovick sat with mrs ruth at the other end of the room and the girl stood at the table drinking her tea and eating her bread and butter she consumed these articles so freely that he wondered if she had been truly in want of a meal if they were so poor as to have to count with that sort of privation this supposition was softening but still not so much so as to make him ask her to sit down she appeared indeed to prefer to stand she looked better so as if the freedom the conspicuity of it being on her feet and treading a stage were agreeable to her while sherringham lingered near her all vaguely his hands in his pockets and his mind now void of everything but a planned evasion of the theatrical question there were moments when he was so plentifully tired of it she broke out abruptly confess you think me intolerably bad intolerably no only tolerably i find that worse every now and then you do something very right sherringham said 
How many such things did I do today? Oh, three or four. I don't know that I counted very carefully. She raised her cup to her lips, looking at him over the rim of it, a proceeding that gave her eyes a strange expression. It bores you, and you think it disagreeable, then she, she then said, I mean a girl always talking about herself. He protested she could never bore him, and she added, Oh, I don't want compliments. I want the hard, the precious truth. An actress has to talk about herself. What else can she talk about, poor, vain thing? She can talk sometimes about other actresses. That comes to the same thing. You won't be serious. I'm awfully serious. There was something that caught his attention in the note of this, a longing, half hopeless, half argumentative, to be believed in. If one really wants to do anything, one must worry it out. Of course, everything doesn't come the first day, she kept on. I can't see everything at once, but I can see a little more, step by step, as I go, can't I? That's the way, that's the way, he gently enough returned. When you see the things to do, the art of doing them will come. If you hammer away, the great points to see them. Yes, and you don't think me clever enough for that. Why do you say so when I've asked you to come here on purpose? You've asked me to come, but I've had no success. On the contrary, everyone thought you wonderful. Oh, but they don't know, said Miriam Ruth. You've not said a word to me. I don't mind you, your not having praised me. That would be too banal. But if I'm bad, and I know I'm dreadful, I wish you'd talk to me about it. It's delightful to talk to you, Peter found himself saying. No, it isn't, but it's kind. And she looked away from him. Her voice had with this a quality which made him exclaim, Every now and then you say something. She turned her eyes back to him, and her face had a light. I don't want it to come by accident. Then she added, if there's any good to be got from trying, from showing oneself, how can it come unless one hears the simple truth, the truth that turns one inside out? It's all for that, to know what one is, if one's a stick. You've great courage. You've rare qualities, sharing him risk. She had begun to touch him, to seem different. He was glad she had not gone. But for a little she made no answer, putting down her empty cup and yearning over the table as for something more to eat. Suddenly she raised her head and broke out with vehemence. I will, I will, I will. You'll do what you want, evidently. I will succeed. I will be great. Of course I know too little. I've seen too little but I've always liked it. I've never liked anything else. I used to learn things and do scenes and rant about the room when I was but five years old. She went on communicative, persuasive, familiar, egotistical, as was necessary and slightly common, or perhaps only natural, with reminiscences, reasons, and anecdotes, an unexpected profusion, and with an air of comradeship, of freedom in any relation which seemed to plead that she was capable at least of embracing that side of the profession she desired to adopt. He noted that if she had seen very little, as she said, she had also seen a great deal. But both her experience and her innocence had been accidental and irregular. She had seen very little acting. The theater was always too expensive. If she, if she could only go often in Paris, for instance, every night for six months to see the best, the worst, everything, she would make things out, would observe and learn what to do, what not to do. It would be a school of schools, but she couldn't without selling the clothes off her back. It was vile and disgusting to be poor, and if ever she were to know the bliss of having a few francs in her pocket, she would make up for it. That she could promise. She had never been acquainted with anyone who could tell her anything, if it was good or bad or right or wrong, except Mrs. Delamere and poor Ruggieri. She supposed they had told her a great deal, but perhaps they hadn't, and she was perfectly willing to give it up if it was bad. Evidently, Madame Carré thought so. She thought it was horrid. Wasn't it perfectly divine the way the old woman had said those verses, those speeches of Célie? If she would only let her come and listen to her once in a while like that, it was all she would ask. 
She had got lots of ideas just from that half hour. She had practiced them over and over and over again. The moment she got home, he might ask her mother. He might ask the people next door. If Madame Carré didn't think she could work, she might have heard. Could she have listened at the door, something that would show her? But she didn't think her even good enough to criticize. Since that, since that wasn't criticism, telling her her head was good, of course her head was good. She needn't travel up to the Cartier Eccentrique to find that out. It was her mother, the way she talked, who gave the idea that she wanted to be elegant and more than a femme du monde and all that sort of trash. Of course that put people off when they were only thinking of the real right way. Didn't she know, Miriam himself, that this was the one thing to think of? But any one would be kind to her mother who knew what a dear she was. She doesn't know when anything's right or wrong. But she's a perfect saint, said the girl, obscuring considerably her vindication. She doesn't mind when I say things over by the hour, dinning them into her ears while she sits there and reads. She's a tremendous reader. She's awfully up in literature. She taught me everything herself. I mean all that sort of thing. Of course I'm not so fond of reading. I go in for the book of life. Sheringham wondered if her mother had not at any rate taught her that phrase. He thought it highly probable. It would give on my nerves, the life I lead her, Miriam continued, but she's really a delicious woman. The oddity of this epithet made Peter laugh, and altogether in a few minutes, which is perhaps a sign that he abused his right to be a man of moods, the young lady had produced in him a revolution of curiosity, set his sympathy in motion. Her mixture, as it spread itself before him, was an appeal and a challenge. She was sensitive and dense. She was underbred and fine. Certainly she was very various, and that was rare. Quite not at this moment the heavy-eyed, frightened creature who had pulled herself together with such an effort at Madame Carré's, nor the elated phenomenon who had just been declaiming, nor the rather affected and contradictious young person with whom he had walked home from the Rue de Constantinople. Was this succession of phases a sign she was really a case of the celebrated artistic temperament, the nature that made people provoking and interesting? That Sheringham himself was of shifting ex complexion is perhaps proved by his odd capacity for being of two different minds very nearly at the same time. Miriam was pretty now, with felicities and graces, with charming, unusual eyes. Yes, there were things he could do for her. He had already forgotten the chill of Mr. Nash's irony of his prophecy. He was even scarce conscious how little in general he liked hints, insinuations, favors asked obliquely and plaintively. That was doubtless also because the girl was suddenly so taking and so fraternizing. Perhaps indeed it was unjust to qualify as roundabout the manner in which Miss Ruth conveyed that it was open to him not only to pay for her lessons, but to meet the expense of her nightly attendance with her mother at instructive exhibitions of theatrical art. It was a large order, sending the pair to all the plays, but what Peter now found himself thinking of was not so much its largeness as the possible interest of going with them sometimes, and pointing the moral, the technical one, of showing her the things he liked, the things he disapproved. She repeated her declaration that she recognized the fallacy of her mother's view of heroines, impossibly virtuous, and of the importance of her looking out for such tremendously proper people, one must let her talk, but of course it creates a prejudice, she said with her eyes on Mr. and Mrs. Lovett, who had got up terminating their communion with Mrs. Ruth. It's a great muddle, I know, but she can't bear anything coarse or nasty, and quite right, too. I shouldn't I, either if I didn't have to, but I'm, I don't care a sou where I go if I can get to act, or who they are if they'll help me. I want to act. That's what I want to do. I don't want to meddle in people's affairs. I can look out for myself. I'm all right, the girl exclaimed roundly, frankly, with a ring of honesty which made her crude and pure. As for doing the bad ones, I'm not afraid of that. The bad ones? The bad women in the plays, like Madame Carré. I'll do any vile creature. I think you'll do best what you are, said Sheringham, laughed for the interest of it. You're a strange girl. Je crois bien. Doesn't one have to be? 
to want to go and exhibit oneself to a loathsome crowd on a platform with trumpets and a big drum for money to parade one's body and one's soul he looked at her a moment her face changed constantly now it had a fine flush and a noble delicacy give it up you're too good for it he found himself pleading i doubt if you've an idea of what girls have to go through never 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 till i'm pelted she cried then stay on here a bit i'll take you to the theatres oh you dear miriam delightfully exclaimed mr and mrs lovick accompanied by mrs ruth now crossed the room to them and the girl went on in the same tone mamma dear he's the best friend we've ever had he's a great deal nicer than i thought so are you mademoiselle said peter sherringham oh i trust mr sherringham i trust him infinitely mrs ruth returned covering him with her mild respectable wheedling eyes the kindness of every one has been beyond everything mr and mrs lovett can't say enough they make the most obliging offers they want you to know their brother oh i say he's no brother of mine mr lovett protested good-naturedly they think he'll be so suggestive he'll put us up to the right things mrs ruth went on it's just a little brother of mine such a dear amusing clever boy mrs lovick explained do you know she has got nine upon my honour she has said her husband this one is the sixth fancy if i had to take them all over yes it makes it rather awkward mrs lovick amiably conceded he has gone on the stage poor darling but he acts rather well he tried for the diplomatic service but he didn't precisely dazzle his examiners mr lovett further mentioned edmund's very nasty about him there are lots of gentlemen on the stage he's not the first it's such a comfort to hear that said mrs ruth i'm much obliged to you has he got a theatre miriam asked my dear young lady he hasn't even got an engagement replied the young man's terrible brother-in-law he hasn't been at it very long but i'm sure he'll get on he's immensely in earnest and very good-looking i just said it that if he should come over to see us you might rather like to meet him he might give you some tips as my husband says i don't care for his looks but i should like his tips miriam liberally smiled and is he coming over to see you asked sherringham to whom while his this exchange of remarks which he had not lost was going on mrs ruth had in lowered accents addressed herself not if i can help it i think mr lovick but mr lovick was so gaily rude that it wasn't embarrassing oh sir i'm sure you're fond of him mrs ruth remonstrated as the party passed together into the antechamber no really i like some of the others four or five of them but i don't like arty we'll make it up to him then we'll like him miriam answered with spirit and her voice rang in the staircase sherringham attended them a little way with a charm which her host had rather missed in her loudness of the day before end of chapter eight chapter nine of the tragic muse this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragic Muse by Henry James, Chapter 9 Nick Dormer found his friend Nash that evening at the place of their tryst, smoking a cigar in the warm, bright night on the terrace of the café forming one of the angles of the Place de l'Opéra. He sat down with him, but at the end of five minutes uttered a protest against the crush and confusion, the publicity and vulgarity of the place, the shuffling procession of the crowd, the jostle of fellow customers, the perpetual brush of waiters come away i want to talk to you and i can't talk here i don't care where we go it will be pleasant to walk well stroll away to the quartier sérieux each time i come to paris i at the end of three days take the boulevard with its conventional grimace into greater aversion i hate even to cross it i go half a mile round to avoid it 
The young men took their course together down the Rue de la Paix to the Rue de Rivoli, which they crossed, passing beside the gilded rails of the Tuileries. The beauty of the night, the only defect of which was that the immense illumination of Paris kept it from being quite night enough, made it a sort of bedizened, rejuvenated day, gave a charm to the quieter streets, drew our friends away to the right, to the river and the bridges across the gardens of the Tuileries. They came out upon the Seine. They kept on and on, moving slowly, smoking, talking, pausing, stopping to look, to emphasize, to compare. They fell into discussion, into confidence, into inquiry, sympathetic or satiric, and into explanations which needed in turn to be explained. The balmy night, the time for talk, the amusement of Paris, the memory of younger passages gave a lift to the occasion. Nick had already forgotten his little brush with Julia on his leaving Peter's tea party at her side, and that he had been almost disconcerted by the asperity with which she denounced the odious man he had taken it into his head to force upon her impertinent and fatuous she had called him and when nick began to plead that he was really neither of these things though he could imagine his manner might sometimes suggest them she had declared that she didn't wish to argue about him or ever to hear of him again nick hadn't counted on her liking gabriel nash but had thought her not liking him wouldn't perceptibly matter he had given himself the diversion not cruel surely to any one concerned of seeing what she would make of a type she had never before met. She had made even less than he expected, and her intimation that he had played her a trick had been irritating enough to prevent his reflecting that the offence might have been in some degree with Nash. But he had recovered from his resentment sufficiently to ask this personage, with every possible circumstance of implied consideration for the lady, what had been the impression made by his charming cousin upon my word my dear fellow i don't regard that as a fair question gabriel said besides if you think mrs dallow charming what on earth need it matter to you what i think the superiority of one man's opinion over another's is never so great as when the opinion's about a woman it was to help me to find out what I think of yourself, Nick returned. Oh, that you'll never do. I shall bewilder you to the end. The lady with whom you were so good as to make me acquainted is a beautiful specimen of the English garden flower, the product of high cultivation and much tending, a tall, delicate stem with the head set upon it in a manner which, as a thing seen and remembered, should doubtless count for us as a gift of the gods she's the perfect type of the object raised or bred and everything about her hangs together and conduces to the effect from the angle of her elbow to the way she drops that vague conventional dry little o oh, which dispenses with all further performance that degree of completeness is always satisfying but i didn't satisfy her and she didn't understand me i don't think they usually understand she's no worse than i then ah uh, she didn't try no she doesn't try but she probably thought you a monster of conceit and she would think so still more if she were to hear you talk about her trying very likely very likely said gabriel nash i've an idea as good many people think that it strikes me as comic i suppose it's a result of my little system what little system oh nothing more wonderful than the idea of being just the same to every one people have so bemuddled themselves that the last thing they can conceive is that one should be simple lord do you call yourself simple nick ejaculated absolutely in the sense of having no interest of my own to push no nostrum to advertise no power to conciliate no axe to grind I'm not a savage, ah, far from it, but I really think I'm perfectly independent. Well, that's always provoking, Nick knowingly returned. So it would appear to the great majority of one's fellow mortals, and I well remember the pang with which I originally made that discovery. It darkened my spirit at a time when I had no thought of evil. What we like when we're unregenerate is that a newcomer should give us a password, 
come over to our side join our little camp or religion get into our little boat in short whatever it is and help us to row it it's natural enough we're mostly in different tubs and cockles paddling for life our opinions our convictions and doctrines and standards are simply the particular thing that will make the boat go our boat naturally for they may very often be just the thing that will sink another if you won't get in people generally hate you your metaphor's very lame said nick it's the overcrowded boat that goes to the bottom oh i'll give it another leg or two boats can be big in the infinite of space and a doctrine's a raft that floats the better the more passengers it carries a passenger jumps over from time to time not so much from fear of sinking as from a want of interest in the course or the company he swims he plunges he dives he dips down and visits the fishes and the mermaids and the submarine caves he goes from craft to craft and splashes about on his own account in the blue cool water the regenerate as i call them are the passengers who jump over in search of better fun i jumped over long ago and now of course you're at the head of the regenerate for in your turn nick found the figure delightful you all form a select school of porpoises not a bit and i know nothing about heads in the sense you mean i've grown a tail if you will i'm the merman wandering free it's the jolliest of trades before they had gone many steps further nick dormer stopped short with a question i say my dear fellow do you mind mentioning to me whether you're the greatest humbug and charlatan on earth or a genuine intelligence one that has sifted things for itself i do lead your poor british wit a dance i'm so sorry nash replied benignly but i'm very sincere and i have tried to straighten out things a bit for myself then why do you give people such a handle such a handle for thinking you're an for thinking you're a mere farceur i dare say it's my manner they're so unused to any sort of candour well then why don't you try another nick asked one has the manner that one can and mine moreover's a part of my little system ah if you make so much of your little system you're no better than any one else nick returned as they went on i don't pretend to be better for we're all miserable sinners i only pretend to be bad in a pleasanter brighter way by what i can see it's the simplest thing in the world just take for granted our right to be happy and brave what's essentially kinder and more helpful than that what's more beneficent but the tradition of dreariness of stodginess of dull dense literal prose has so sealed people's eyes that they've ended by thinking that most natural of all things the most perverse why so keep up the dreariness in our poor little day no one can tell me why and almost every one calls me names for simply asking the question but i go on for i believe one can do a little good by it i want so much to do a little good gabriel nash continued taking his companion's arm my persistence is systematic don't you see what i mean i won't be dreary no 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 and i won't recognize the necessity or even if there be any way out of it the accident of dreariness in the life that surrounds me that's enough to make people stare they're so damned stupid they think you so damned impudent nick freely explained at this nash stopped him short with a small cry and turning his eyes nick saw under the lamps of the key that he had brought a flush of pain into his friend's face i don't strike you that way oh me wasn't it just admitted that i don't in the least make you out that's the last thing nash declared as if he were thinking the idea over with an air of genuine distress but with a little patience we'll clear it up together if you care enough about it he added more cheerfully letting his companion proceed again he continued heaven help us all what do people mean by impudence 
there are many i think who don't understand its nature or its limits and upon my word i've literally seen mere quickness of intelligence or of perception the jump of a step or two a little whir of the wings of talk mistaken for it yes i've encountered men and women who thought you impudent if you weren't simply so stupid as they the only impudence is unprovoked or even mere dull aggression and i indignantly protest that i'm never guilty of that clumsiness ah for what do they take one with their beastly presumption even to defend myself sometimes i've to make believe to myself that i care i always feel as if i didn't successfully make others think so perhaps they see impudence in that but i dare say the offence is in the things that i take as i say for granted for if one tries to be pleased one passes perhaps inevitably for being pleased above all with one's self that's really not my case i find my capacity for pleasure deplorably below the mark i've set this is why as i've told you i cultivate it i try to bring it up and i'm actuated by positive benevolence i've that impudent pretension that's what i mean by being the same to everyone by having only one manner if one's conscious and ingenious to that end what's the harm when one's motives are so pure by never never making the concession one may end by becoming a perceptible force of good what concession are you talking about in god's name nick demanded why that we're here all for dreariness it's impossible to grant it sometimes if you wish to deny it ever and what do you mean then by dreariness that's modern slang and terribly vague many good things are dreary virtue and decency and clarity and perseverance and courage and honour say at once that life's dreary my dear fellow gabriel nash exclaimed that's on the whole my besetting impression c'est la que je vous attends i'm precisely engaged in trying what can be done and taking it the other way it's my little personal experiment life consists of the personal experiments of each of us and the point of an experiment is that it shall succeed what we contribute is our treatment of the material our rendering of the text our style a sense of the qualities of a style is so rare that many persons should doubtless be forgiven for not being able to read or at all events to enjoy us but is that a reason for giving it up for not being in this other sphere if one possibly can an addison a ruskin a renan ah oh, we must write our best it's the great thing we can do in the world on the right side one has one's form que diable and a mighty good thing that one has i'm not afraid of putting all life into mine and without unduly squeezing it i'm not afraid of putting in honour and courage and charity without spoiling them on the contrary i shall only do them good people may not read you at sight may not like you but there's a chance they'll come round and the only way to court the chance is to keep it up always to keep it up that's what i do my dear man if you don't think i've perseverance if someone's touched here and there if you give a little impression of truth and charm that's your reward besides of course the pleasure for yourself don't you think your style's a trifle affected nick asked for further amusement that's always the charge against a personal manner if you've any at all people think you've too much perhaps perhaps who can say the lurking unexpressed is infinite and affectation must have begun long ago with the first act of reflective expression the substitution of the few placed articulate words for the cry or the thump or the hug of course one isn't perfect but that's the delightful thing about art that there's always more to learn and more to do it grows bigger the more one uses it and meets more questions the more they come up no doubt i'm rough still but i'm in the right direction i make it my business to testify for the fine ah the fine there it stands over there said nick dormer i'm not so sure about yours i don't know what i've got hold of but notre dame is truth notre dame is charm on notre dame the distracted mind can rest come over with me and look at her 
they had come abreast of the low island from which the great cathedral disengaged today from her old contacts and adhesions rises high and fair with her front of beauty and her majestic mass darkened at that hour or at least simplified under the stars but only more serene and sublime for her happy union far aloft with the cool distance and the night our young men fantasticating as freely as i leave the reader to estimate cross the wide short bridge which made them face toward the monuments of old paris the palais de justice the conciergerie the holy chapel of saint louis they came out before the church which looks down on a square where the past once so thick in the very heart of paris had been made rather a blank pervaded however by the everlasting freshness of the vast cathedral face it greeted nick dormer and gabriel nash with a kindness the long centuries had done nothing to dim the lamplight of the old city washed its foundations but the towers and buttresses the arches the galleries the statues the vast rose window the large full composition seemed to grow clearer while they climbed higher as if they had a conscious benevolent answer for the upward gaze of men how it straightens things out and blows away one's vapours anything that's done said nick while his companion exclaimed blandly and affectionately the dear old thing the great points to do something instead of muddling and questioning and by jove it makes me want to want to build the cathedral nash inquired yes just that it's you who puzzle me then my dear fellow you can't build them out of words what is it the great poets do asked nick their words are ideas their words are images enchanting collations and unforgettable signs but the verbiage of parliamentary speech is well said nick with a candid reflective sigh you can rear a great structure of many things not only of stones and timbers and painted glass they walked round this example of one pausing criticizing admiring and discussing mingling the grave with the gay and paradox with contemplation behind and at the sides the huge dusky vessel of the church seemed to dip into the seine or rise out of it floating expansively a ship of stone with its flying buttresses thrown forth like an array of mighty oars nick dormer lingered near it in joy and soothing content as if it had been the temple of a faith so dear to him that there was peace and security in its precinct and there was comfort too and consolation of the same sort in the company at this moment of nash's equal appreciation of his response by his own signs to the great effect it took it all in so and then so gave it all out that nick was reminded of the radiance his boyish admiration had found in him of old the easy grasp of everything of that kind everything of that kind was to nick's sense the description of a wide and bright domain they crossed to the farther side of the river where the influence of the gothic monument threw a distinction even over the parisian smartnesses the municipal rule and measure the importunate symmetries the handsomeness of everything the extravagance of gas light the perpetual click on the neat bridges in front of a quiet little cafe on the left bank gabriel nash said let's sit down he was always ready to sit down it was a friendly establishment and an unfashionable quarter far away from the caravan series there were the usual little tables and chairs on the quay the muslin curtains behind the glazed front the general sense of sawdust and of drippings of watery beer the place was subdued to stillness but not extinguished by the lateness of the hour no vehicles passed only now and then a light parisian foot beyond the parapet they could hear the flow of the seine nick dormer said it made him think of the old paris of the great revolution of madame roland quoi gabriel said they could have watery beer but were not obliged to drink it they sat a long time they talked a great deal and the more they said the more the unsaid came up presently nash found occasion to throw out i go about my business like any good citizen that's all and what is your business the spectacle of the world nick laughed out and what do you do with that what does any one do with spectacles i look at it i see 
you're full of contradictions and inconsistencies nick however objected you described yourself to me half an hour ago as an apostle of beauty where's the inconsistency i do it in the broad light of day whatever i do that's virtually what i meant if i look at the spectacle of the world i look in preference at what's charming in it sometimes i've to go far to find it very likely but that's just what i do i go far as far as my means permit me last year i heard of such a delightful little spot a place where a wild fig tree grows in the south wall the outer side of an old spanish city i was told it was a deliciously brown corner the sun making it warm in winter as soon as i could i went there and what did you do i lay on the first green grass i liked it it's that sort of things all you accomplish you're not encouraging i accomplish my happiness it seems to me that's something i have feelings i have sensations let me tell you that's not so common it's rare to have them and if you chance to have them it's rare not to be ashamed of them i go after them when i judge they won't hurt anyone you're lucky to have money for your travelling expenses said nick no doubt no doubt but i do it very cheap i take my stand on my nature on my fortunate character i'm not ashamed of it i don't think it's so horrible my character but we've so befogged and befouled the whole question of liberty of spontaneity of good humour and inclination and enjoyment that there's nothing that makes people stare so as to see one natural you're always thinking too much of people they say i think too little gabriel smiled well i've agreed to stand for harsh said nick with a roundabout transition it's you then who are lucky to have money i haven't nick explained my expenses are to be paid then you too must think of people nick made no answer to this but after a moment said i wish very much you had more to show for it to show for what your little system the aesthetic life nash hesitated tolerantly gaily as he often did with an air of being embarrassed to choose between several answers any one of which would be so right oh having something to show's such a poor business it's a kind of confession of failure yes you're more affected than anything else said nick impatiently no my dear boy i'm more good-natured don't i prove it i'm rather disappointed to find you not more accessible to esoteric doctrine but there is i confess another plane of intelligence honourable and very honourable in its way from which it may legitimately appear important to have something to show if you must confine yourself to that plane i won't refuse you my sympathy after all that's what i have to show but the degree of my sympathy must of course depend on the nature of the demonstration you wish to make you know it very well you've guessed it nick returned looking before him in a conscious modest way which would have been called sheepish had he been a few years younger ah oh, you've broken the scent with telling me you're going back to the house of commons said nash no wonder you don't make it out my situation's certainly absurd enough what i really hanker for is to be a painter and of portraits on the whole i think that's the abject crude ridiculous fact in this out-of-the-way corner at the dead of night in lowered tones i venture to disclose it to you isn't that the ascetic life do you know how to paint asked nash not in the least no element of burlesque is therefore wanting in my to my position that makes no difference i'm so glad so glad i don't know how so glad of it all yes that only makes it better you're a delightful case and i like delightful cases we must see it through i rejoice i met you again do you think i can do anything nick inquired paint good pictures how can i tell without seeing some of your work doesn't it come back to me that at oxford you used to sketch very prettily but that's the last thing that matters what does matter then nick asked with eyes on his companion to be on the right side on the side of the fine there'll be precious little of the fine if i produce nothing but daubs ah you cling to the old false measure of success i must cure you of that 
they'll be the beauty of having been disinterested and independent of taking the world in the free brave personal way i shall nevertheless paint decently if i can nick presently said i'm almost sorry it will make your case less clear your example less grand my example will be grand enough with the fight i shall have to make the fight with whom with myself first of all i'm awfully against it ah but you'll have me on the other side nash smiled well you'll have more than a handful to meet everything every one that belongs to me that touches me near or far my family my blood my heredity my traditions my promises my circumstances my prejudices my little past such as it is, is my great future such as it has been supposed it may be i see i see it's splendid nash exclaimed and mrs dallow into the bargain he added yes mrs dallow if you like are you in love with her not in the least well she is with you so i understood don't say that said nick dormer with sudden sternness ah you are you are his companion pronounced judging apparently from this accent i don't know what i am heaven help me nick broke out tossing his hat down on his little tin table with vehemence i'm a freak of nature and a sport of the mocking gods why should they go out of their way to worry me why should they do everything so inconsequent so improbable so preposterous it's the vulgarest practical joke there has never been anything of the sort among us we're all philistines to the core with about as much aesthetic sense as that hat it's excellent soil i don't complain of it but not a soil to grow that flower from where the devil then has the seed been dropped i look back from generation to generation i scour our annals without finding the least little sketching grandmother any sign of a building or versifying or collecting or even tulip raising ancestor they were all as blind as bats and none the less happy for that i'm a wanton variation an unaccountable monster my dear father rest his soul went through life without a suspicion that there's anything in it that can't be boiled into blue books and became in that conviction a very distinguished person he brought me up in the same simplicity and in the hope of the same eminence it would have been better if i had remained so i think it's partly your fault that i haven't nick went on at oxford you were very bad company for me my evil genius you opened my eyes you communicated the poison since then little by little it has been working within me vaguely covertly insensibly at first but during the last year or two with violence pertinacity cruelty i've resorted to every antidote in life but it's no use i'm stricken c'est venu tout entier à sa poids attaché putting venus for art it tears me to pieces as i may say i see i follow you said nash who had listened to this recital with radiant interest and curiosity and that's why you are going to stand precisely it's an antidote and at present you're another another that's why i jumped at you a bigger dose of you may disagree with me to that extent that i shall either die or get better i shall control the dilution said nash poor fellow if you're elected he added poor fellow either way you don't know the atmosphere in which i live the horror the scandal my apostasy would provoke the injury and suffering it would inflict i believe it would really kill my mother she thinks my father's watching me from the skies jolly to make him jump nash suggested he'd jump indeed come straight down on top of me and then the grotesqueness of it to begin all of a sudden at my age it's perfect indeed it's too lovely a case nash raved think how it sounds a paragraph in the london papers mr nicholas dormer m p for harsh and son of the late right honourable and so forth and so forth is about to give up his seat and withdraw from public life in order to devote himself to the practice of portrait painting and with the more commendable perseverance by reason of all the dreadful time he has lost orders in view of this respectfully solicited the nineteenth century's a sweeter time than i thought said nash it's the portrait then that haunts your dreams i wish you could see you must of course come immediately to my place in london 
perfidious wretch you're capable of having talent which of course will spoil everything gabriel wailed no i'm too old and was too early perverted it's too late to go through the mill you make me young don't miss your election at your peril think of the edification the edification of your throwing it all up the next moment that would be pleasant for mr carteret nick brooded mr carteret a dear old family friend who will wish to pay my agent's bill serve him right for such depraved tastes you do me good said nick as he rose and turned away don't call me useless then ah but not in the way you mean it's only if i don't get in that i shall perhaps console myself with the brush nick returned with humorous edifying elegance while they retraced their steps for the sake of all the muses then don't stand for you will get in very likely and at any rate i've promised you've promised mrs dallow it's her place she'll put me in nick said baleful woman but i'll pull you out cried gabriel nash end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Tragic Muse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragic Muse by Henry James. Chapter Ten. For several days, Peter Sheringham had business in hand which left him neither time nor freedom of mind to occupy himself actively with the ladies of the hotel de la garonne there were moments when they brushed across his memory but their passage was rapid and not lighted with complacent attention for he shrank from bringing to the proof the question of whether miriam would be an interest or only a bore she had left him after their second meeting with a quickened sympathy but in the course of a few hours that flame had burned dim like most other men he was a mixture of impulse and reflection but was peculiar in this that thinking things over almost always made him think less conveniently he found illusions necessary so that in order to keep an adequate number going he often forbade himself any excess of that exercise mrs ruth and her daughter were there and could certainly be trusted to make themselves felt he was conscious of their anxiety and their calculations as of a frequent oppression and knew that whatever results might ensue he should have to do the costly thing for them an idea of tenacity of worrying feminine duration associated itself with their presence he would have assented with a silent nod to the proposition enunciated by gabriel nash that he was saddled with them remedies hovered before him but these figured also at the same time as complications ranging vaguely from the expenditure of money to the discovery that he was in love this latter accident would be particularly tedious he had a full perception of the arts by which the girl's mother might succeed in making it so it wouldn't be a compensation for trouble but a trouble which in itself would require compensations would that balm spring from the spectacle of the young lady's genius the genius would have to be very great to justify a rising young diplomatist in making a fool of himself with the excuse of pressing work he put off miss ruth from day to day and from day to day he expected to hear her knock at his door it would be time enough when they ran him to earth again and he was unable to see how after all he could serve them even then he had proposed impetuously a course of the theatres but that would be a considerable personal effort now that the summer was about to begin a free bid for bad air stale pieces and tired actors when however more than a week had elapsed without a reminder of his neglected promise it came over him that he must himself in honour give a sign there was a delicacy in such unexpected and such difficult discretion 
he was touched by being let alone the flurry of work at the embassy was over and he had time to ask himself what in especial he should do he wanted something definite to suggest before communicating with the hotel de la garonne as a consequence of this speculation he went back to madame Carré to ask her to reconsider her stern judgment and give the young english lady to oblige him a dozen lessons of the sort she knew so well how to give he was aware that this request scarcely stood on its feet for in the first place madame Carré never reconsidered when once she had got her impression and in the second never wasted herself on subjects whom nature had not formed to do her honour he knew his asking her to strain a point to please him would give her a false idea say that for that matter she had it already of his relations actual or prospective with the girl but he decided he needn't care for this since miriam herself probably wouldn't care what he had mainly in mind was to say to the old actress that she had been mistaken the jeune anglaise wasn't such a guru this would take some courage but it would also add to the amusement of the visit he found her at home but as soon as he had expressed his conviction she began oh your jeune anglaise i know a great deal more about her than you she has been back to see me twice she doesn't go the longest way round she charges me like a grenadier and asks me to give her guess a little what private recitations all to herself if she doesn't succeed it won't be for want of knowing how to thump at doors the other day when i came in she was waiting for me she had been there two hours my private recitations have you an idea what people pay for them between artists you know there are easier conditions sherringham laughed how do i know if she's an artist she won't open her mouth to me what she wants is to make me say things to her she does make me i don't know how and she sits there gaping at me with her big eyes they look like open pockets i dare say she'll profit by it said sheringham i dare say you will her face is stupid while she watches me and when she has tired me out she simply walks away however as she comes back madame Carré paused a moment listened and then cried didn't i tell you sheringham heard a parley of voices in the little antechamber and the next moment the door was pushed open and miriam ruth bounded into the room she was flushed and breathless without a smile very direct will you hear me to-day i know four things she immediately broke out then seeing sheringham she added in the same brisk earnest tone as if the matter were of the highest importance oh how do you do i'm very glad you're here she said nothing else to him than this appealed to him in no way made no allusion to his having neglected her but addressed herself to madame Carré as if he had not been there making no excuses and using no flattery taking rather a tone of equal authority all as if the famous artist had an obvious duty toward her this was another variation peter thought it differed from each of the attitudes in which he had previously seen her it came over him suddenly that so far from there being any question of her having the histrionic nature she simply had it in such perfection that she was always acting that her existence was a series of parts assumed for the moment each changed for the next before the perpetual mirror of some curiosity or admiration or wonder some spectatorship that she perceived or imagined in the people about her interested as he had ever been in the profession of which she was potentially an ornament this idea startled him by its novelty and even lent on the spot a formidable a really appalling character to miriam ruth it struck him abruptly 
that a woman whose only being was to make believe to make believe she had any and every being you might like and that it would serve a purpose and produce a certain effect and whose identity resided in the continuity of her personations so that she had no moral privacy as he phrased it to himself but lived in a high wind of exhibition of figuration such a woman was a kind of monster in whom necessity there would be nothing to be fond of because there would be nothing to take hold of he felt for a moment how simple he had been not to have achieved before this analysis of the actress the girl's very face made it vivid to him now the discovery that she positively had no countenance of her own but only the countenance of the occasion a sequence a variety capable possibly of becoming immense of representative movements she was always trying them practicing them for her amusement or profit jumping from one to the other and extending her range and this would doubtless be her occupation more and more as she acquired ease and confidence the expression that came nearest belonging to her as it were was the one that came nearest being a blank an air of inanity when she forgot herself in some act of sincere attention then her eye was heavy and her mouth betrayed a commonness though it was perhaps just as such a moment that the fine line of her head told most she had looked slightly bet even when sherringham on their first meeting at madame carre's said to nick dormer that she was the image of the tragic muse now at any rate he seemed to see that she might do what she liked with her face it was an elastic substance an element of gutta percha like the flexibility of the gymnast the lady at the music hall who is shot from the mouth of a cannon he winced a little at this coarser view of the actress he had somehow always looked more poetically at this priestess of art yet what was she the priestess when one came to think of it but a female gymnast a mountebank at higher wages she didn't literally hang by her heels from a trapeze and hold a fat man in her teeth but she made the same use of her tongue of her eyes of the imitative trick that her muscular sister made of leg and jaw it was an odd circumstance that miss ruth's face seemed to him to-day a finer instrument than old madame carre's it was doubtless that the girl's was fresh and strong and had a future in it while poor madame carre's was worn and weary and had only a past the old woman said something half in jest half in real resentment about the brutality of youth while miriam went to a mirror and quickly took off her hat patting and arranging her hair as a preliminary to making herself heard sherringham saw with surprise and amusement that the keen frenchwoman who had in her long life exhausted every adroitness was in a manner helpless and coerced obliging all in spite of herself her young friend had taken but a few days and a couple of visits to become a successful force she had imposed herself and madame carre while she laughed yet looked terrible too with such high artifices of eye and gesture was reduced to the last line of defence that of pronouncing her coarse and clumsy saying she might knock her down but that this proved nothing she spoke jestingly enough not to offend but her manner betrayed the irritation of an intelligent woman who at an advanced age found herself for the first time failing to understand what she didn't understand was the kind of social product thus presented to her by gabriel nash and this suggested to sherringham that the jeune anglaise was perhaps indeed rare a new type as madame carre must have seen innumerable varieties he saw the girl was perfectly prepared to be abused and that her indifference to what might be thought of her discretion was a proof of life health and spirit the insolence of conscious resources when she had given herself a touch at the glass she turned round with a rapid écoutez maintenant and stood leaning a moment slightly lowered and inclined backward her hands behind her and supporting her on the console before the mirror 
she waited an instant turning her eyes from one of her companions to the other as to take possession of them an eminently conscious intentional proceeding which made sherringham ask himself what had become of her former terror and if that and her tears had all been a comedy after which abruptly straightening herself she began to repeat a short french poem an ingenious thing of the day that she had induced madame Carré to say over to her she had learned it practised it rehearsed it to her mother and had now been childishly eager to show what she could do with it what she mainly did was to reproduce with a crude fidelity but in extraordinary detail the intonations the personal quavers and cadences of her model how bad you make me seem to myself and if i were you how much better i should say it was madame Carré's first criticism miriam allowed her however little time to develop it for she broke out at the shortest intervals with the several other specimens of verse to which the old actress had handed her the key they were all fine lyrics of tender or ironic intention by contemporary poets but depending for effect on taste and art a mastery of the rare shade and the right touch in the interpreter miriam had gobbled them up and she gave them forth in the same way as the first with close rude audacious mimicry there was a moment for sherringham when it might have been feared their hostess would see in the performance a design burlesque of her manner her airs and graces her celebrated simpers and grimaces so extravagant did it all cause these refinements to appear when it was over the old woman said should you like now to hear how you do and without waiting for an answer phrased and trilled the last of the pieces from beginning to end exactly as her visitor had done making this imitation of an imitation the drollest thing conceivable if she had suffered from the sound of the girl's echo it was a perfect revenge miriam had dropped on a sofa exhausted and she stared at first flushed and wild then she frankly gave way to pleasure to interest and large laughter she said afterwards to defend herself that the verses in question and indeed all those she had recited were of the most difficult sort you had to do them they didn't do themselves they were things in which the gros morons were of no avail ah my poor child your means are all gros moyens you appear to have no others madame Carré replied you do what you can but there are people like that it's the way they're made they can never come nearer to fine truth to the just indication shades don't exist for them they don't see certain differences it was to show you a difference that i repeated that thing as you repeat it as you represent my doing it if you're struck with the two little the two ways have in common so much the better but you seem to me terribly to alourdir everything you touch peter read into this judgment a deep irritation miriam clearly set the teeth of her instructress on edge she acted on her nerves was made up of roughnesses and thicknesses unknown hitherto to her fine free-playing fingertips this exasperation however was a degree of flattery it was neither indifference nor simple contempt it acknowledged a mystifying reality in the jeune anglaise and even a shade of importance the latter remarked serenely enough that the things she wanted most to do were just those that were not for the gros moyen the vulgar obvious dodges the starts and shouts that any one could think of and that the gros public liked she wanted to do what was most difficult and to plunge into it from the first and she explained as if it were a discovery of her own that there were two kinds of scenes and speeches those to which acted themselves of which the treatment was plain the only way so that you had just to take it and those open to interpretation with which you had to fight every step rendering arranging doing the thing according to your idea 
some of the most effective passages and the most celebrated and admired like the frenzy of juliet with her potion were of the former sort but it was the others she liked best madame carre received this revelation good-naturedly enough considering its want of freshness and only laughed at the young lady for looking so nobly patronizing while she gave it her laughter appeared partly addressed to the good faith with which miriam described herself as preponderantly interested in the subtler problems of her art sheringham was charmed with the girl's pluck if it was pluck and not mere density the stout patience with which she submitted for a purpose to the old woman's rough usage he wanted to take her away to give her a friendly caution to advise her not to become a bore not to expose herself but she held up her beautiful head as to show how little she cared at present for any exposure and that it was half coarseness madame Corre was so far right and, and half fortitude she had no intention of coming away so long as there was anything to be picked up she sat and still she sat challenging her hostess with every sort of question some reasonable some ingenious some strangely futile and some highly indiscreet but all with the effect that contrary to peter's expectation their distinguished friend warmed to the work of answering and explaining became interested was content to keep her and to talk yes she took her ease she relieved herself with the rare cynicism of the artist all the crudity the irony and intensity of a discussion of esoteric things of personal mysteries of methods and secrets it was the oddest hour our young man had ever spent even in the course of investigations which had often led him into the cuisine the distillery or back shop or the of the admired profession he got up several times to come away then he remained partly in order not to leave miriam alone with her terrible initiatress partly because he was both amused and edified and partly because madame Carre held him by the appeal of her sharp confidential old eyes addressing her talk to himself with miriam but a pretext and subject a vile illustration she undressed this young lady as it were from head to foot turned her inside out weighed and measured and sounded her it was all for sheringham a new revelation of the point to which in her profession and nation an intelligence of the business a ferocious analysis had been carried and a special vocabulary developed what struck him above all was the way she knew her grounds and reasons so that everything was sharp and clear in her mind and lay under her hand if she had rare perceptions she had traced them to their source she could give an account of what she did she knew perfectly why could explain it defend it amplify it fight for it all of which was an intellectual joy to her allowing her a chance to abound and insist and discriminate there was a kind of cruelty or at least of harshness in it all to poor peter's shy english sense that sense which can never really reconcile itself to any question of method and form and has extraneous sentiments to square to pacify with compromises and superficialities the general plea for innocence in everything and often the flagrant proof of it in theory there was nothing he valued more than just such a logical passion as madame carre's but it was apt in fact when he found himself at close quarters with it to appear an ado about nothing if the old woman was hard it was not that many of her present conclusions about the jeune anglaise were not indulgent but that she had a vision of the great manner of right and wrong of the just and the false so high and religious that the individual was nothing before it a prompt and easy sacrifice it made our friend uncomfortable as he had been made uncomfortable by certain feuilleton reviews of the theatres in the paris newspapers which he was committed to thinking important but of which when they were very good he was rather ashamed when they were very good that is when they were very thorough they were very personal 
as was inevitable in dealing with the most personal of the arts they went into details they put the dots on the eyes they discussed impartially the qualities of appearance the physical gifts of the poor aspirant finding them in some cases reprehensibly inadequate peter could never rid himself of a dislike to these pronouncements in the case of the actresses especially they struck him as brutal and offensive unmanly as launched by an ensconced mustachioed critic over a cigar at the same time he was aware of the dilemma he hated it it made him blush still more in which his objection lodged him if one was right in caring for the actor's art one ought to have been interested in every honest judgment of it which given the peculiar conditions would be useful in proportion as it should be free if the criticism that recognized frankly these conditions seemed an inferior or an unholy thing then what was to be said for the art itself what an implication if the criticism was tolerable only so long as it was worthless so long as it remained vague and timid this was a knot peter had never straightened out he contented himself with feeling that there was no reason a theatrical critic shouldn't be a gentleman and at the same time that he often dubbed it an odious trade which no gentleman could possibly follow the best of the fraternity so conspicuous in paris were those who didn't follow it those who while pretending to write about the stage wrote about everything else it was as if madame carre in pursuance of her inflamed sense that the art was everything and the individual nothing save as he happened to serve it had said well if she will have it she shall she shall know what she's in for what i went through battered and broken in as we all have been all who are worthy who have had the honour she shall know the real point of view it was as if she were still beset with mrs ruth's twaddle and muddle her hypocrisy her idiotic scruples something she felt all need to belabour to trample on miriam took it all as a bath a baptism with shuddering joy and gleeful splashes staring wondering sometimes blushing and failing to follow but not shrinking nor wounded laughing when convicted at her own expense and feeling evidently that this at last was the high cold air of art an initiation a discipline that nothing could undo sheringham said he would see her home he wanted to talk to her and she must walk away with him and it's understood then she may come back he added to madame carre it's my affair of course you'll take an interest in her for a month or two she'll sit at your feet the old actress had an admirable shrug oh i'll knock her about she seems stout enough End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Tragic Muse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragic Muse by Henry James. Chapter Eleven. When they had descended to the street, Miriam mentioned to Peter that she was thirsty dying to drink something upon which he asked her if she should have an objection to going with him to a cafe objection i've spent my life in cafes they're warm in winter and you get your lamplight for nothing she explained mamma and i have sat in them for hours many a time with a consummation of three sous to save fire and candles at home we've lived in places we couldn't sit in if you want to know where there was only really room if we were in bed mamma's money's sent out from england and sometimes it used not to come once it didn't come for months for months and months i don't know how we lived there wasn't any to come and there wasn't any to get home that isn't amusing when you're away in a foreign town without any friends mamma used to borrow but people wouldn't always lend you needn't be afraid she won't borrow of you we're rather better now something has been done in england i don't understand what it's only five pence a year but it has been settled it comes regularly 
it used to come only when we had written and begged and waited but it made no difference mamma was always up to her ears in books they served her for food and drink when she had nothing to eat she began a novel in ten volumes the old-fashioned ones they lasted longest she knows every cabinet de lecture in every town the little cheap shabby ones i mean in the back streets where they have odd volumes and only ask a sou and the books are so old that they smell like close rooms she takes them to the cafes the little cheap shabby cafes too and she reads there all the evening that's very well for her but it doesn't feed me i don't like a diet of dirty old novels i sit there beside her with nothing to do not even a stocking to mend she doesn't think that come il faut i don't know what the people take me for however we've never been spoken to any one can see mamma's a great lady as for me i dare say i might be anything dreadful if you're going to be an actress you must get used to being looked at there were people in england who used to ask us to stay some of them were our cousins or mamma says they were i've never been very clear about our cousins and i don't think they were at all clear about us some of them are dead the others don't ask us any more you should hear mamma on the subject of our visits in england it's very convenient when your cousins are dead that explains everything mamma has delightful phrases my family is almost extinct then your family may have been anything you like ours of course was magnificent we did stay in a place once where there was a deer park and also private theatricals i played in them i was only fifteen years old but i was very big and i thought i was in heaven i'll go anywhere you like you needn't be afraid we've been in places i've learned a great deal that way sitting beside mamma and watching people their faces their types their movements there's a great deal goes on in cafes people come to them to talk things over their private affairs their complications they have important meetings oh i've observed scenes between men and women very quiet terribly quiet but awful pathetic tragic once i saw a woman do something that i'm going to do some day when i'm great if i can get the situation i'll tell you what it is some time i'll do it for you oh it is the book of life so miriam discoursed familiarly disconnectedly as the pair went their way down the rue de constantinople and she continued to abound in anecdote and remark after they were seated face to face at a little marble table in an establishment peter had selected carefully and where he had caused her at her request to be accommodated with sirop d'orja i know what it will come to madame carre will want to keep me this was one of the felicities she presently threw off to keep you for the french stage she won't want to let you have me she said things of that kind astounding in self-complacency the assumption of quick success she was in earnest evidently prepared to work but her imagination flew over preliminaries and probations took no account of the steps in the process especially the first tiresome ones the hard test of honesty he had done nothing for her as yet given no substantial pledge of interest yet she was already talking as if his protection were assured and jealous certainly however she seemed to belong to him very much indeed as she sat facing him at the paris cafe in her youth her beauty and her talkative confidence this degree of possession was highly agreeable to him and he asked nothing more than to make it last and go further the impulse to draw her out was irresistible to encourage her to show herself all the way for if he was really destined to take her career in hand he counted on some good equivalent such for instance as that she should at least amuse him it's very singular i know nothing like it he said your equal mastery of two languages say of half a dozen miriam smiled oh i don't believe in the others to the same degree i don't imagine that with all your deference to your undeniable facility you'd be judged fit to address a german or an italian audience in their own tongue but you might a french perfectly and they're the most particular of all for their idioms supersensitive 
and they're incapable of enduring the baragunage of foreigners to which we listen with such complacency in fact your french is better than your english it's more conventional there are little queernesses and impurities in your english as if you had lived abroad too much ah oh, you must work that i'll work it with you i like the way you speak you must speak beautifully you must do something for the standard for the standard well there isn't any after all peter had a drop it has gone to the dogs oh i'll bring it back i know what you mean no one knows no one cares the sense is gone it isn't in the public he continued ventilating a grievance he was rarely able to forget the vision of which now suddenly made a mission full of possible sanctity for his companion purity of speech on our stage doesn't exist every one speaks as he likes and audiences never notice it's the last thing they think of the place is given up to abominable dialects and individual tricks any vulgarity flourishes and on top of it all the americans with every conceivable crudity come in to make confusion worse confounded and when one laments it people stare they don't know what one means do you mean the grand manner certain pompous pronunciations the style of the kembles i mean any style that is a style that's a system a consistency an art that contributes a positive beauty to utterance when i pay ten shillings to hear you speak i want you to know how que diable say that to people and they're mostly lost in stupor only a few the very intelligent exclaim then you want actors to be affected and do you asked miriam full of interest my poor child what else under the sun should they be isn't their whole art the affectation par excellence the public won't stand that to-day so one hears it said if that be true it simply means that the theatre as i care for it that it is as a personal art is at an end never 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 the girl cried in a voice that made a dozen people look round i sometimes think it that the personal art is at an end and that henceforth we shall have only the arts capable no doubt of immense development in their way indeed they've already reached it of the stage carpenter and the costumer in london the drama is already smothered in scenery the interpretation scrambles off as it can to get the old personal impression which used to be everything you must go to the poor countries and most of all to italy oh i've had it it's very personal said miriam knowingly you've seen the nudity of the stage the poor painted tattered screen behind and before that void the histrionic figure doing everything it knows how in complete possession the personality is in our english personality and it may not always carry us with it but the direction's right and it has the superiority that it's a human exhibition not a mechanical one i can act just like an italian miriam eagerly proclaimed i'd rather you acted like an englishwoman if an englishwoman would only act oh i'll show you but you're not english said peter sociably his arms on the table i beg your pardon you should hear mamma about our race you're a jewess i'm sure of that he went on she jumped at this as he was destined to see later she would ever jump at anything that might make her more interesting or striking even at things that grotesquely contradicted or excluded each other that's always possible if one's clever i'm very willing because i want to be the english rachel then you must leave madame carre as soon as you've got from her what she can give oh you needn't fear you shan't lose me the girl replied with charming gross fatuity my name's jewish she went on but it was that of my grandmother my father's mother she was a baroness in germany that is she was the daughter of a baron peter accepted this statement with reservations but he replied put all that together and it makes you very sufficiently of rachel's tribe i don't care I, if i'm of her tribe artistically i'm of the family of the artists je me fiche of any other i'm in the same style as that woman i know it you speak as if you had seen her he said amused at the way she talked of that woman 
Oh, I know all about her. I know all about all the great actors. But that won't prevent me from speaking divine English. You must learn lots of verse. You must repeat it to me, Sheringham went on. You must break yourself in till you can say anything. You must learn passages of Milton, passages of Wordsworth. Did they write plays? Oh, it isn't only a matter of plays. You can't speak a part properly till you can speak everything else, anything that comes up, especially in proportion as it's difficult. That gives you authority. Oh, yes, I'm going in for authority. There's more chance in English, the girl added in the next breath. There are not so many others, the terrible competition. There are so many here. Not that I'm afraid, she chattered on. But we've got America, and they haven't. America's a great place. You talk like a theatrical agent. They're lucky not to have it as we have it. Some of them do go, and it ruins them. Why, it fills their pockets, Miriam cried. Yes, but see what they pay. It's the death of an actor to play to big populations that don't understand his language. It's nothing then but the gros moyen. All his delicacy perishes. However, they'll understand you. Perhaps I shall be too affected, she said. You won't be more so than Garrick or Mrs. Siddons or John Kemble or Edmund Keen. They understood Edmund Keen. All reflection is affectation and all acting's reflection. I don't know. Mine's instinct, Miriam contended. My dear young lady, you talk of yours, but don't be offended if I tell you that yours doesn't exist. Some day it will, if the thing comes off. Madame Carré's does, because she has reflected. The talent, the desire, the energy are an instinct, but by the time these things become a performance, they're an instinct put in its place. Madame Carré is very philosophic. I shall never be like her. Of course you won't. You'll be original. But you'll have your own ideas. I dare say I shall have a good many of yours. And she smiled at him across the table. They sat a moment looking at each other. Don't go in for coquetry, Peter then said. It's a waste of time. Well, that's civil, the girl cried. Oh, I don't mean for me. I mean for yourself. I want you to be such good faith. I'm bound to give you stiff advice. You don't strike me as flirtatious and that sort of thing. And it's much in your favor. In my favor? It does save time. Perhaps it saves too much. Don't you think the artist ought to have passions? Peter had a pause. He thought an examination of this issue premature. Flirtations are not passions, he replied. No, you're simple. At least I suspect you are. For, of course, with a woman, one would be clever to know. She asked why he pronounced her simple, but he judged it best and more consonant with fair play to defer even a treatment of this branch of the question, so that to change the subject, he said, Be sure you don't betray me to your friend Mr. Nash. Betray you? Do you mean about your recommending affectation? Dear me, no. He recommends it himself. That is, he practices it, and on a scale. But he makes one hate it. He proves what I mean, said Sheringham, that the great comedian's the one who raises it to a science. If we paid ten shillings to listen to Mr. Nash, we should think him very fine, but we want to know what it's supposed to be. It's too odious, the way he talks about us, Miriam cried assentingly. About us? Us poor actors? It's the competition he dislikes, Peter laughed. However, he's very good-natured. He lent Mamma thirty pounds, the girl added honestly. Our young man, at this information, was not able to repress a certain small twinge noted by his companion, and of which she appeared to mistake the meaning. Of course he'll get it back, she went on, while he looked at her in silence a little. Fortune had not supplied him profusely with money, but his emotion was caused by no foresight of his probably having also to put his hand in his pocket for Mrs. Ruth. It was simply the instinctive recoil of a fastidious nature from the idea of familiar intimacy with people who lived from hand to mouth, together with a sense that this intimacy 
would have to be defined if it was to go much further. He would wish to know what it was supposed to be, like Nash's histrionics. Miriam, after a moment, mistook his thought still more completely, and in doing so flashed a portent of the way it was in her to strike from time to time a note exasperatingly, almost consciously vulgar, which one would hate for the reason, along with others, that by that time one would be in love with her. Well, then he won't, if you don't believe it, she easily laughed. He was saying to himself that the only possible form was that they should borrow only from him. You're a funny man. I make you blush, she persisted. I must reply with the two coqueur, though I've not that effect on you. I don't understand, said the girl. You're an extraordinary young lady. You mean I'm horrid. Well, I dare say I am, but I'm better when you know me. He made no direct rejoinder to this, but after a moment went on. Your mother must repay that money. I'll give it to her. You had better give it him, cried Miriam. If once mamma has it, she interrupted herself, and with another in a softer tone, one of her professional transitions, remarked, I suppose you've never known any one that was poor. I'm poor myself, that is, I'm very far from rich, but why receive favors? And here he in turn checked himself with the sense that he was indeed taking a great deal on his back, if he pretended already, he had not seen the pair three times, to regulate their intercourse with the rest of the world. But the girl instantly carried out his thought, and more than his thought. Favors from Mr. Nash? Oh, he doesn't count. The way she dropped these words, they would have been admirable on the stage, made him reply with prompt ease, what I meant just now was that you're not to tell him, after all my swagger, that I consider that you and I are really required to save our theater. Oh, if we can save it, he shall know it. She added that she must positively get home. Her mother would be in a state she had really scarce ever been out alone. He mightn't think it, but so it was. Her mother's ideas, those awfully proper ones, were not all talk. She did keep her. Sheringham accepted this. He had an adequate and indeed an analytic vision of Mrs. Ruth's conservatism, but he observed at the same time that his companion made no motion to rise. He made none either. He only said, We're very frivolous the way we chatter. What you want to do to get your foot in the stirrup is supremely difficult. There's everything to overcome. You've neither an engagement nor the prospect of an engagement. Oh, you'll get me one. Her manner presented this as so certain that it wasn't worth dilating on. So instead of dilating, she inquired abruptly a second time, Why do you think I'm so simple? I don't, then. Didn't I tell you just now that you were extraordinary? That's the term, moreover, that you applied to yourself when you came to see me, when you said a girl had to be a kind of monster to wish to go on the stage. It remains the right term, and your simplicity doesn't mitigate it. What's rare in you is that you have, as I suspect at least, no nature of your own. Miriam listened to this as if preparing to argue with it or not, only as it should strike her as a sufficiently brave picture, but as yet naturally she failed to understand. You're always at concert pitch or on your horse. There are no intervals. It's the absence of intervals, of a fond or background that I don't comprehend. You're an embroidery without a canvas. Yes, perhaps, the girl replied, her head on one side as if she were looking at the pattern of this rarity. But I'm very honest. You can't be everything, both a consummate actress and a flower of the field. You've got to choose. She looked at him a moment. I'm glad you think I'm so wonderful. Your feigning may be honest in the sense that your only feeling is your feigned one, Peter pursued. That's what I mean by the absence of a ground or of intervals. It's a kind of thing that's a labyrinth. I know what I am, she said sententiously. But her companion continued following his own train. Were you really so frightened the first day you went to Madame Carré's? She stared, then with a flush threw back her head. Do you think I was pretending? I think you always are. However, your vanity, if you had any, would be natural. I've plenty of that. I'm not a bit ashamed to own it. 
You'd be capable of trying to do the human peacock, but excuse the audacity and the crudity of my speculations. It only proves my interest. What is it that you know you are? Why, an artist. Isn't that a canvas? Yes, an intellectual, but not a moral. Ah, uh, it's everything. And I'm a good girl, too. Won't that do? It remains to be seen, Sheringham laughed. A creature who's absolutely all an artist? I'm curious to see that. Surely it has been seen in lots of painters, lots of musicians. Yes, but those arts are not personal like yours. I mean, not so much so. There's something left for, what shall I call it, for character. She stared again with her tragic light. And do you think I haven't a character? As she hesitated, she pushed back her chair, rising rapidly. He looked up at her an instant. She seemed so plastic, and then rising too, answered, Delightful being, you've a hundred. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Tragic Muse This is a LibriVox recording. LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragic Muse by Henry James, Chapter 12 The summer arrived, and the dense air of the Paris theatres became, in fact, a still more complicated mixture. Yet the occasions were not few on which Sheringham, having placed a box near the stage, most often a stuffy, dusky baignoir, at the disposal of Mrs. Ruth and her daughter, found time just to look in, as he said, to spend a part of the evening with them and point the moral of the performance. The pieces, the successes of the winter, had entered the automatic phase. They went on by the force of the impetus acquired, deriving little fresh life from the interpretation, and in ordinary conditions their strong points, as rendered by the actors, would have been as wearisome to this student as an importunate repetition of a good story. But it was not long before he became aware that the conditions couldn't be taken for ordinary. There was a new infusion in his consciousness, an element in his life which altered the relations of things. He was not easy till he had found the right name for it, a name the more satisfactory that it was simple, comprehensive, and plausible. A new distraction, in the French sense, was what he flattered himself he had discovered. He could recognize that as freely as possible, without being obliged to classify the agreeable resource as a new entanglement. He was neither too much nor too little diverted. He had all his usual attention to give to his work. He had only an employment for his odd hours, which without being imperative, had over various others the advantage of a certain continuity. And yet, I hasten to add, he was not so well pleased with it, but that among his friends he maintained for the present a rich reserve about it. He had no irresistible impulse to describe generally how he had disinterred a strange handsome girl whom he was bringing up for the theatre. She had been seen by several of his associates at his rooms, but was not soon to be seen there again. His reserve might by the ill-natured have been termed dissimulation, inasmuch as when asked by the ladies of the embassy what had become of the young person who had amused them that day so cleverly, he gave out that her whereabouts was uncertain and her destiny probably obscure. He let it be supposed, in a word, that his benevolence had scarcely survived an accidental, a charitable occasion. As he went about his customary business, and perhaps even put a little more conscience into the transaction of it, there was nothing to suggest to others that he was engaged in a private speculation of an absorbing kind. It was perhaps his weakness that he carried the apprehension of ridicule too far, but his excuse may have dwelt in his holding it unpardonable for a man publicly enrolled in the service of his country to be markedly ridiculous. It was, of course, not out of all order that such functionaries, their private situation permitting, should enjoy a personal acquaintance 
with stars of the dramatic the lyric or even the choreographic stage high diplomatists had indeed not rarely and not invisibly cultivated this privilege without its proving the sepulchre of their reputation that a gentleman who was not a fool should consent a little to become one for the sake of a celebrated actress or singer cela c'était vous though it was not perhaps to be recommended it was not a tendency that was encouraged at headquarters where even the most rising young men were not incited to believe they could never fall still it might pass if kept in its place and there were ancient worthies yet in the profession though not those whom the tradition had helped to go furthest who held that something of the sort was a graceful ornament of the diplomatic character sherringham was aware he was very rising but miriam ruth was not yet a celebrated actress she was only a young artist in conscientious process of formation and encumbered with a mother still more conscientious than herself she was a jeune anglaise a lady with all very earnest about artistic about remunerative problems he had accepted the office of a formative influence and that was precisely what might provoke derision he was a ministering angel his patience and good nature really entitled him to the epithet and his rewards would doubtless some day define themselves but meanwhile other promotions were in precarious prospect for the failure of which these would not even in their abundance be a compensation he kept an unembarrassed eye on downing street and while it may frankly be said for him that he was neither a pedant nor a prig he remembered that the last impression he ought to wish to produce there was that of a futile aestheticism he felt the case sufficiently important however when he sat behind miriam at the play and looked over her shoulder at the stage her observation being so keen and her comments so unexpected in their vivacity that his curiosity was refreshed and his attention stretched beyond its wont if the exhibition before the footlights had now lost much of its annual brilliancy the fashion in which she followed it was perhaps exhibition enough the attendance of the little party was moreover in most cases at the theatre francais and it has been sufficiently indicated that our friend though the child of a sceptical age and the votary of a cynical science was still candid enough to take the serious the religious view of that establishment the view of m sarcet and of the unregenerate provincial mind in the trade i follow we see things too much in the hard light of reason of calculation he once remarked to his young charge but it's good for the mind to keep up a superstition or two it leaves a margin like having a second horse to your broom for night work the arts the amusements the aesthetic part of life are night work if i might say so without suggesting that they're illicit at any rate you want your second horse your superstition that stays at home when the sun's high to go your rounds with the francais is my second horse miriam's appetite for this interest showed him vividly enough how rarely in the past it had been within her reach and she pleased him at first by liking everything seeing almost no differences and taking her deep draught undiluted she leaned on the edge of the box with bright veracity tasting to the core yet relishing the surface watching each movement of each actor attending to the way each thing was said or done as if it were the most important thing and emitting from time to time applausive or restrictive sounds it was a charming show of the critical spirit in ecstasy sherringham had his wonder about it as a part of the attraction exerted by this young lady was that she caused him to have his wonder about everything she did was it in fact a conscious show a line taken for effect so that at the comedie her own display should be the most successful of all that question danced attendance on the liberal intercourse of these young people and fortunately as yet did little to embitter sherringham's share of it 
his general sense that she was personating had its especial moments of suspense and perplexity and added variety and even occasionally a degree of excitement to their commerce at the theatre for the most part she was really flushed with eagerness and with the spectators who turned an admiring eye into the dim compartment of which she pervaded the front she might have passed for a romantic or at least an insatiable young woman from the country mrs ruth took a more general view but attended immensely to the story in respect to which she manifested a patient good faith which had its surprises and its comicalities for her daughter's patron she found no play too tedious no entre-actes too long no banois too hot no tissue of incidents too complicated no situation too unnatural and no sentiments too sublime she gave him the measure of her power to sit and sit an accomplishment to which she owed in the struggle for existence such superiority as she might be said to have achieved she could outsit everybody and everything looking as if she had acquired the practice in repeated years of small frugality combined with large leisure periods when she had nothing but hours and days and years to spend and had learned to calculate in any situation how long she could stay staying was so often a saving a saving of candles of fire and even as it sometimes implied a scheme for stray refection of food peter saw soon enough how bravely her shreds and patches of gentility and equanimity hung together with the aid of whatever casual pins and other makeshifts as if he had been addicted to studying the human mixture in its different combinations would have found in her an interesting compendium of some of the infatuations that survive a hard discipline he made indeed without difficulty the reflection that her life might have taught her something of the real at the same time that he could scarce help thinking it clever of her to have so persistently declined the lesson she appeared to have put it by with a deprecating ladylike smile a plea of being too soft and bland for experience she took the refined sentimental tender view of the universe beginning with her own history and feelings she believed in everything high and pure disinterested and orthodox and even at the hotel de la garonne was unconscious of the shabby or the ugly side of the world she never despaired otherwise what would have been the use of being a neville nugent only not to have been one that would have been discouraging she delighted in novels poems perversions misrepresentations and evasions and had a capacity for smooth superfluous falsification which made our young man think her sometimes an amusing and sometimes a tedious inventor but she wasn't dangerous even if you believed her she wasn't even a warning if you didn't it was harsh to call her a hypocrite since you never could have resolved her back into her character there being no reverse at all to her blazonry she built in the air and was not less amiable than she pretended only that was a pretension too she moved altogether in a world of elegant fable and fancy and sherringham had to live there with her for miriam's sake live there in sociable vulgar assent and despite his feeling it rather a low neighbourhood he was at a loss how to take what she said she talked sweetly and discursively of so many things till he simply noted that he could only take it always for untrue when miriam laughed at her he was rather disagreeably affected dear mamma's fine stories was a sufficiently cynical reference to the immemorial infirmity of a parent but when the girl backed her up as he phrased it to himself he liked that even less mrs ruth was very fond of a moral and had never lost her taste for edification she delighted in a beautiful character and was gratified to find so many more than she had supposed represented in the contemporary french drama she never failed to direct miriam's attention to them and to remind her that there is nothing in life so grand as a sublime act above all when sublimely explained peter made much of the difference between the mother and the daughter thinking it singularly marked 
the way one took everything for the sense or behaved as if she did caring only for the plot and the romance the triumph or defeat of virtue and the moral comfort of it all and the way the other was alive but to the manner and the art of it the intensity of truth to appearances mrs ruth abounded in impressive evocations and yet he saw no link between her facile genius and that of which miriam gave symptoms the poor lady never could have been accused of successful deceit whereas the triumph of fraud was exactly what her clever child achieved she made even the true seem fictive while miriam's effort was to make the fictive true sheringham thought it an odd unpromising stock that of the neville nugents for a dramatic talent to have sprung from till he reflected that the evolution was after all natural the figurative impulse in the mother had become conscious and therefore higher through finding an aim which was beauty in the daughter likely enough the hebraic mr ruth was with his love of old pots and christian altar cloths had supplied in the girl's composition the aesthetic element the sense of colour and form in their visits to the theatre there was nothing mrs ruth more insisted on than the unprofitableness of deceit as shown by the most distinguished authors the folly and degradation the corrosive effect on the spirit of tortuous ways their companion soon gave up the futile task of piecing together her incongruous references to her early life and her family in england he renounced even the doctrine that there was a residuum of truth in her claim of great relationships since existent or not he cared equally little for her ramifications the principle of this indifference was at bottom a certain desire to disconnect and isolate miriam for it was disagreeable not to be independent in dealing with her and he could be fully so only if she herself were the early weeks of that summer they went on indeed into august were destined to establish themselves in his memory as a season of pleasant things the ambassador went away and peter had to wait for his holiday which he did during the hot days contentedly enough waited in spacious halls in a vast dim bird-haunted garden the official world and most other worlds withdrew from paris and the place de la concorde a larger whiter desert than ever became by a reversal of custom explorable with safety the champs-elysees were dusty and rural with little creaking booths and exhibitions that made a noise like grasshoppers the arc de triomphe threw its cool thick shadow for a mile the palais de l'industrie glittered in the light of the long days the cabmen in their red waistcoats dozed inside their boxes while sheringham permitted himself a pot hat and rarely met a friend thus was miriam as islanded as the chained andromeda and thus was it possible to deal with her even perseus like in deep detachment the theatres on the boulevard closed for the most part but the great temple of the rue de richelieu with an aesthetic responsibility continued imperturbably to dispense examples of style madame carre was going to vichy but had not yet taken flight which was a great advantage for miriam who could now solicit her attention with the consciousness that she had no engagements en ville i make her listen to me i make her tell me said the ardent girl who was always climbing the slope of the rue de constantinople on the shady side where of july mornings a smell of violets came from the moist flower stands of fat white-capped bouquetillere in the angles of doorways miriam liked the paris of the summer mornings the clever freshness of all the little trades and the open-air life the cries the talk from door to door which reminded her of the south where in the multiplicity of her habitations she had lived and most of all the great amusement or nearly of her walk the enviable baskets of the laundress piled up with frilled and fluted whiteness the certain luxury she felt while she passed with quick prevision of her own dawn of glory the greatest amusement perhaps was to recognize the pretty sentiment of earliness the particular congruity with the hour in the studied selected dress of the little 
tripping women who were taking the day for important advantages while it was tender at any rate she mostly brought with her from her passage through town good humour enough with the penny bunch of violets she always stuck in the front of her dress for whatever awaited her at madame carre's she declared to her friend that her dear mistress was terribly severe giving her the most difficult the most exhausting exercises showing a kind of rage for breaking her in so much the better sherringham duly answered but he asked no questions and was glad to let the preceptress and the pupil fight it out together he wanted for the moment to know as little as possible about their ways together he had been overdosed with that knowledge while attending at their second interview he would send madame carre her money she was really most obliging and in the meantime was certain miriam could take care of herself sometimes he remarked to her that she needn't always talk shop to him there were times when he was mortally tired of shop of hers moreover he frankly admitted that he was tired of his own so that the restriction was not brutal when she replied staring why i thought you considered it as such a beautiful interesting art he had no rejoinder more philosophic than well i do but there are moments when i'm quite sick of it all the same at other times he put it oh yes the results the finished thing the dish perfectly seasoned and served not the mess of preparation at least not always not the experiments that spoil the material i suppose you to feel just these questions of study of the artistic education as you called it to me so fascinating the girl persisted she was sometimes so flatly lucid well after all i'm not an actor myself he could but impatiently sigh you might be one if you were serious she would imperturbably say to this her friend replied that mr gabriel nash ought to hear this which made her promise with a certain grimness that she would settle him and his theories some day not to seem too inconsistent for it was cruel to bewilder her when he had taken her up to enlighten peter repeated over that for a man like himself the interest of the whole thing depended on its being considered in a large liberal way and with an intelligence that lifted it out of the question of the little tricks of the trade gave it beauty and elevation but she hereupon let him know that madame carre held there were no little tricks that everything had its importance as a means to a great end and that if you were not willing to try to approfondir the reason why in a given situation you should scratch your nose with your left hand rather than with your right you were not worthy to tread any stage that respected itself that's very well but if i must go into details read me a little shelley groaned the young man in the spirit of a high raffiné you're worse than madame carre you don't know what to invent between you you'll kill me the girl declared i think there's a secret league between you to spoil my voice or at least to weaken my souffle before i get it but a la guerre come a la guerre how can i read shelley however when i don't understand him that's just what i want to make you do it's a part of your general training you may do without that of course without culture and taste and perception but in that case you'll be nothing but a vulgar cabotin and nothing will be of any consequence he had a theory that the great lyric poets he induced her to read and recite as well long passages of wordsworth and swinburne would teach her many of the secrets of the large utterance the mysteries of rhythm the communicableness of style the latent music of the language and the art of composing copious speeches and of retaining her stores of free breath he held in perfect sincerity that there was a general sense of things things of the mind which would be of the highest importance to her and to which it was by good fortune just in his power to contribute she would do better in proportion as she had more knowledge even knowledge that might superficially show but a remote connection with her business the actor's talent was essentially a gift a thing by itself implanted instinctive accidental equally unconnected with intellect and with virtue sherringham was completely of that opinion but it struck him as no bêtise to believe at the same time that intellect leaving virtue for the moment out of the question might be brought into fruitful relation with it 
it would be a bigger thing if a better mind were projected upon it projected without sacrificing the mind so he lent his young friend books she never read she was on almost irreconcilable terms with the printed page save for spouting it and in the long summer days when he had leisure took her to the louvre to admire the great works of painting and sculpture here as on all occasions he was struck with the queer jumble of her taste her mixture of intelligence and puerility he saw she never read what he gave her though she sometimes would shamelessly have liked him to suppose so but in the presence of famous pictures and statues she had remarkable flashes of perception she felt these things she liked them though it was always because she had an idea she could use them the belief was often presumptuous but it showed what an eye she had to her business i could look just like that if i tried that's the dress i mean to wear when i do portia such were the observations apt to drop from her under the suggestion of antique marbles or when she stood before a titian or a bronzino when she uttered them and many others besides the effect was sometimes irritating to her adviser who had to bethink himself a little that she was no more egotistical than the histrionic conscience required he wondered if there were necessarily something vulgar in the histrionic conscience something condemned only to feel the tricky personal question wasn't it better to be perfectly stupid than to have only one eye open and wear forever in the great face of the world the expression of a knowing wink at the theatre on the numerous july evenings when the comedie francaise exhibited the repertory by the aid of exponents determined the more sparse and provincial audience should have a taste of the tradition her appreciation was tremendously technical and showed it was not for nothing she was now in and out of madame carre's innermost counsels but there were moments when even her very acuteness seemed to him to drag the matter down to see it in a small and superficial sense what he flattered himself he was trying to do for her and through her for the stage of his time since she was the instrument and incontestably a fine one that had come to his hand was precisely to lift it up make it rare keep it in the region of distinction and breadth however she was doubtless right and he was wrong he eventually reasoned you could afford to be vague only if you hadn't a responsibility he had fine ideas but she was to act them out that is to apply them and not he and application was of necessity a vulgarization a smaller thing than theory if she should some day put forth the great art it wasn't purely fanciful to forecast for her the matter would doubtless be by that fact sufficiently transfigured and it wouldn't signify that some of the onward steps should have been lame this was clear to him on several occasions when she recited or motioned or even merely looked something for him better than usual then she quite carried him away making him wish to ask no more questions but only let her disembroil herself in her own strong fashion in these hours she gave him forcibly if fitfully that impression of beauty which was to be her justification it was too soon for any general estimate of her progress madame carre had at last given her a fine understanding as well as a sore personal and almost physical sense of how bad she was she had therefore begun on a new basis had returned to the alphabet and the drill it was a phase of awkwardness the splashing of a young swimmer but buoyancy would certainly come out of it for the present there was mainly no great alteration of the fact that when she did things according to her own idea they were not as yet and seriously judged worth the devil as madame carre said and when she did them according to that of her instructress were too apt to be a gross parody of that lady's intention none the less she gave glimpses and her glimpses made him feel not only that she was not a fool this was small relief but that he himself was not he made her stick to her english and read shakespeare aloud to him mrs ruth had recognized the importance of apartments in which they should be able to receive so beneficent a visitor and was now mistress of a small salon 
with a balcony and a rickety flower stand to say nothing of a view of many roofs and chimneys a very uneven wax floor an empire clock an armoire a glace highly convenient for miriam's posturings and several cupboard doors covered over allowing for treacherous gaps with the faded magenta paper of the wall the thing had been easily done for sherringham had said oh we must have a sitting-room for our studies you know and i'll settle it with the landlady mrs ruth had liked his we indeed she liked everything about him and he saw in this way that she heaved with no violence under pecuniary obligations so long as they were distinctly understood to be temporary that he should have his money back with interest as soon as miriam was launched was a comfort so deeply implied that it only added to intimacy the window stood open on the little balcony and when the sun had left it peter and miriam could linger there leaning on the rail and talking above the great hum of paris with nothing but the neighbouring tiles and tall tubes to take account of mrs ruth in limp garments much ungirdled was on the sofa with a novel making good her frequent assertion that she could put up with any life that would yield her these two conveniences there were romantic works peter had never read and as to which he had vaguely wondered to what class they were addressed the earlier productions of monsieur eugene zou the once fashionable compositions of madame sophie gay with which mrs ruth was familiar and which she was ready to enjoy once more if she could get nothing fresher she had always a greasy volume tucked under her while her nose was bent upon the pages in hand she scarcely looked up even when miriam lifted her voice to show their benefactor what she could do these tragic or pathetic notes all went out of the window and mingled with the undecipherable concert of paris so that no neighbour was disturbed by them the girl shrieked and wailed when the occasion required it mrs ruth only turned her page showing in this way a great aesthetic as well as a great personal trust she rather annoyed their visitor by the serenity of her confidence for a reason he fully understood only later save when miriam caught an effect or a tone so well that she made him in the pleasure of it forget her parents contiguity he continued to object to the girl's english with its foreign patches that might pass in prose but were offensive in the recitation of verse and he wanted to know why she couldn't speak like her mother he had justly to acknowledge the charm of mrs ruth's voice and tone which gave a richness even to the foolish things she said they were of an excellent insular tradition full both of natural and of cultivated sweetness and they puzzled him when other indications seemed to betray her to refer her to more common air they were like the reverberation of some far-off tutored circle the connection between the development of miriam's genius and the necessity of an occasional excursion to the country the charming country that lies in so many directions beyond the parisian banlieue would not have been immediately apparent to a superficial observer but a day and then another at versailles a day at fontainebleau and a trip particularly harmonious and happy to rambouillet took their places in our young man's plan as a part of the indirect but contributive culture an agency in the formation of taste intimations of the grand manner for instance would proceed in abundance from the symmetrical palace and gardens of louis the fourteenth peter adored versailles and wandered there more than once with the ladies of the hotel de la garonne they chose quiet hours when the fountains were dry and mrs ruth took an armful of novels and sat on a bench in the park flanked by clipped hedges and old statues while her young companion strolled away walked to the trianon explored the long straight vistas of the woods rambouillet was vague and vivid and sweet they felt that they found a hundred wise voices there and indeed there was an old white chateau which contained nothing but ghostly sounds they found at any rate a long luncheon and in the landscape the very spirit of silvery summer and of the french pictorial brush i have said that in these days sherringham wondered about many things and by the time his leave of absence came this practice had produced a particular speculation 
he was surprised that he shouldn't be in love with miriam ruth and considered at moments of leisure the causes of his exemption he had felt from the first that she was a nature and each time she met his eyes it seemed to come to him straighter that her beauty was rare you had to get the good view of her face but when you did so it was a splendid mobile mask and the wearer of this high ornament had frankness and courage and variety no end of the unusual and the unexpected she had qualities that seldom went together impulses and shynesses audacities and lapses something coarse popular and strong all intermingled with disdains and languors and nerves and then above all she was there was accessible almost belonged to him he reflected ingenuously that he owed his escape to a peculiar cause to the fact that they had together a positive outside object objective as it were was all their communion not personal and selfish but a matter of art and business and discussion discussion had saved him and would save him further for they would always have something to quarrel about sherringham who was not a diplomatist for nothing who had his reasons for steering straight and wished neither to deprive the british public of a rising star nor to exchange his actual situation for that of a yoked impresario blessed the beneficence the salubrity the pure exorcism of art at the same time rather inconsistently and feeling that he had a completer vision than before of that oddest of animals the artist who happens to have been born a woman he felt warned against a serious connection he made a great point of the serious with so slippery and ticklish a creature the two ladies had only to stay in paris save their candle ends and as madame carre had enjoined practice their scales there were apparently no autumn visits to english country houses in prospect for mrs ruth peter parted with them on the understanding that in london he would look as thoroughly as possible into the question of an engagement the day before he began his holiday he went to see madame carre who said to him vous devriez bien nous la laisser she has something then she has most things she'll go far it's the first time in my life of my beginning with a mistake but don't tell her so i don't flatter her she'll be too puffed up is she very conceited sherringham asked mauvais sujet said madame carre it was on the journey to london that he indulged in some of those questionings of his state that i have mentioned but i must add that by the time he reached charing cross he smoked a cigar deferred till after the channel in a compartment by himself it had suddenly come over him that they were futile now that he had left the girl a subversive unpremeditated heartbeat told him it made him hold his breath a minute in the carriage that he had after all not escaped he was in love with her he had been in love with her from the first hour end of chapter twelve